My dad and I were never close. I wasn't close to anyone from his side of the family, but his two younger brothers set off every internal alarm I had. Uncle One turned out to be molesting his stepdaughter, who he raised since she was an infant. Uncle Two, who this post is about, I'll call him D. I have several siblings, and we have many cousins living in our small town. They all think D is the best, lots of fun to be around. I never warmed up to him. I didn't trust him, and he had a creepy vibe. I kept my distance, and my mom never made me hug or have physical contact with anyone that I was leery of. D lived next door to my grandma, and seemed to be always down with some kind of illness. I was staying with my grandma for the day, and she was making food for D because he was sick. She fixes him a plate and tells me to take it over. I'm not happy about it, but I know better than to disobey, so I take the food next door. I walk in the door and he yells out and says to bring it back there. I walk into his bedroom and set the plate next to his wardrobe by the foot of his bed. D says he can't reach it there and to put it on the nightstand next to his bed. I take it and set it on the nightstand, and D grabs my wrist. I panic and pull away, trying to get loose from him. He's pulling me towards him, and I brace my foot against the nightstand and resist while saying let me go. He says, I just want to talk to you, and I just say let me go. He finally lets me go. I bolted out of the house and said nothing to my grandma. Later that evening, I tell my cousin, and she said I'm stupid and doesn't know why I'm the only kid that doesn't like him, and he just wanted to talk to me. That I should feel terrible about thinking that he was trying to pull me into his bed. What a terrible thing to say. I didn't mention this to anyone else and began to question if I was wrong and reacted badly. I felt guilty for a long time, but still stayed away from him. As I've gotten older and looking back, I think my reaction was correct. What adult tries to get a kid to warm up to them by grabbing them and pulling them towards their bed? What adult continues to do this when they can see the child is terrified? You get a child to warm up to you by terrifying them? No, adults with good intention don't do these things. We were obedient children. If he would have said, wait, I want to talk to you, I would have obeyed. D passed several years ago and there were rumors about inappropriate behavior with young girls, but nothing more than rumors. I still believe I read the situation right. I honestly don't know where to begin or deal with this entire situation. To keep it short, I've been touched in my sleep by him for four times now and throughout them all, my mother hasn't really done anything about it but yell at him through text. She sent me a screenshot, but that was it. It's a little infuriating since he would manipulate her into thinking that he was just putting a blanket over me. To which I reply, who the hell is he to put one on me? And you're just going to ignore the fact that he went into my room. He also guilt tripped her saying, we can't do much if that's what she thinks, because you know, I'm not the one to do that. Let her be. Just pretend to be mad at me when she comes home. My mom acted poorly. It was too obvious. Mind you, I've gone through past situations with family members, grandfather and cousin. I can't exactly leave home since I'm honestly not prepared to live alone yet, and I'm still saving up. No matter how much I barricade my room, he'd get inside. I had to hide and change my toothbrush because it was always used. I had to wear a bra even when I went to sleep. I'm seriously reaching my limit. I woke up to the sound of a kiss close to me. I thought to myself, my mom was at home because she was at work by 6 a.m. I continued to pretend to be sleeping and I heard him whisper, I love you, close to my face. I've never been so creeped out to the point that I trembled. The next day, my mother was away again. I bought so many locks and yet he was still able to get in. I woke up, continued to pretend to be sleeping, and jolted my eyes open to see him sitting there watching my face up close. He scrambled to the door. 
That's when I knew I had to do something, and I'm not safe anymore. I sleep with a weapon on me every night now. I never told my mom about these recent behaviors because I know she won't believe me, sadly, or do anything serious about it. So if it ever happens again, I'm going to have to muster up all my courage to stand up for myself and confront him. I'm a 23-year-old female. I have a cousin, 27 male, who was adopted into the family when he was 12. My uncle and aunt already had four kids, all of them in their 20s and 30s, so I'm not sure why both of them, in their early 60s, wanted to adopt a 12-year-old. I never had a problem with this cousin growing up, as he and I were the youngest grandkids, so we bonded a lot. I didn't see him often, we were living three hours away from my grandparents, then my aunt and uncle living about an hour away. Over the years, I started noticing pretty odd behavior, like messing with dead birds, and just sudden mood changes when talking to him. Then one day, years later, my dad got a call from my grandmother, and she was freaking out. Apparently, my cousin got arrested, and with it being a small town, it was all over the paper. My cousin was arrested for peeping in underage girls' restrooms, planning cameras in locker rooms, bathrooms, CP, and assaulting a minor. I was only 13 at the time, so I had no understanding about what that meant. He was charged as an adult and served only a little bit at a time. After all of this, I never referred to him as my cousin. In the following year after that, I was in a room alone at my grandparents and he came in and cornered me and tried to hug me before I left and repeatedly told him that he was not supposed to be alone with me since I was a minor. I screamed when he wouldn't stop and luckily my dad found us. Once I was older my dad told me something that was deeply disturbing. Before he was put into the foster system as a child he was repeatedly raped by his own mother. My uncle revealed to my father that they put him in therapy one day, the therapist asked him, If you were to meet your mom again, what would you do? He said, I would rape her like she used to do to me, but I would kill her first. Needless to say, I am not in contact with that cousin anymore. This happened when I was 17 and still in my senior year of high school. This is not as creepy as some stories on here, but I wanted to share my experience. My boyfriend at the time texted me saying he had been hanging out at his friend's house who lived pretty close to me. He asked me if I wanted to hang out with him for a bit, so I agreed. He picked me up around 8 p.m. and drove the couple miles away from my house to a mobile home park. He parked in front of a pretty large sized mobile home. I felt uneasy because this mobile home park wasn't in the safest neighborhood. This place itself looked a little run down, just like the rest of the homes here. We entered through the right side door, up the small stairs, in a carport. Directly in front of you when you first walk in, there's a kitchen and dining room. If you look towards the left, there's a living room that's located in the front of the home. If you look towards the right, there were doors to the bedrooms and bathroom. This was probably the biggest mobile home I've ever been in. It was a little messy and the sinks were full of dishes, kitchen table piled up with junk, beer bottles everywhere. The living room had a coffee table full of weed, pipes, bongs, pill bottles. Just a bit of backstory, my boyfriend at the time had a bit of a drug problem that later on became worse. Before you judge me, I wasn't aware of the severity at the time. I think he occasionally partied and had experimented, which is sadly really common in the town I grew up in. Little did I know, he was doing a lot more than I knew behind my back. So this problem he had led me to meeting a lot of his friends who also were into the same stuff. I was introduced to his friend who was sitting on the living room couch. I don't remember his name, but we'll just call him Jake. Jake seemed friendly. He was about our age. I learned quickly that he lived with his aunt and uncle, who I was also introduced to. His aunt wasn't social at all, 
She was in the kitchen, then left to the bedroom and closed the door. There is something strange about Jake's uncle. Something seemed off to me. But he was overly friendly to me, so I brushed it off. He was probably in his 50s, thin, kind of tall like 5'10", and had blondish gray hair that was receding. Jake's uncle started packing a bowl for everyone. He sprinkled a white substance on top. I sat down on the couch while they all passed the pipe around. I declined. Weed was still illegal at this time, and I've never been a social smoker. I remember his uncle asking me why I wasn't smoking. I really forget how this part was brought up, but Jake's uncle overheard my boyfriend and I talking about cats. He looked over at me and said, Oh, you like cats? Want to see mine? Being the cat lover I am, I got excited. Ah, oh, you got a cat? He was like, Yeah, you want to see her? Now I assumed that he was going to bring her out. So I said, Sure. He got up and led me down the hall, motioning me to follow him. Come on, this way. I looked at my boyfriend puzzled and asked if he wanted to come with me, but he didn't feel like getting up. I really didn't want to come off as being rude if I didn't follow, so I got up and followed him down the hall to the very last door located at the end of the hallway. He opened the door for me and I walked into the bedroom. I noticed a shotgun next to the bed leaning against the wall. I got the vibe that this was possibly Jake's uncle's room. Jake seemed too young to own a gun, and this room didn't look like his style. It looked like a guest bedroom, or a room for someone older. I wonder why his aunt went inside the other room. I'm not sure what's going on in their personal life. Maybe they slept in separate beds. It could have definitely been a possibility. Anyway, right next to the bed was a beautiful white long hair cat on her scratching post inside the room. I went over to say hi and pet her. Jake's uncle walked in and I heard the door close quietly behind him, almost as if he wanted to be discreet that he was closing it. I jumped up and looked over at the door and then at him. He must have noticed how scared I looked because he said, this is so the cat won't get out. He came and kneeled down next to me and started petting the cat. My gut feeling told me that something wasn't right. I felt sick to my stomach. I went backwards towards the door and he yelled, No, the cat's going to get out. But I didn't care. I just ignored him. That's when I realized that it was actually locked and not just closed. I unlocked it and swung it open. The cat did indeed run out, so he wasn't making that up. Regardless, I just met this man, so why would he lock a 17-year-old girl alone with him in a room? Why couldn't he ask my boyfriend to come with us too? The room was located at the far end, opposite side of the living room, where no one could really hear us. I went back to the living room so fast and asked my boyfriend if he could take me home, which I would never do, considering he wasn't sober, but I was desperate. He was hesitant, but I asked, right now? I lied to him and said that my dad wanted me home right now, pretending to look at a text on my phone. When we were back in my car, I was so relieved to be out of there. I started telling my boyfriend how Jake's uncle closed us in the room together and I felt really uncomfortable. He told me that I was overthinking the situation and that the uncle was a good person, so I thought maybe I was overthinking it, but it never changed how uncomfortable I felt about it. Please always trust your gut feelings regardless of what anyone else has to say about it. I never saw Jake or his uncle again. I never wanted to go back there. Over 10 years later, I still get creeped out when I think about it. When I was about 7 or 8, my three cousins, Chris, male, 8, Kate, female, 11, and Jen, female, 6, got a stepdad. Everyone was super excited because, because my aunt had been a single mom for years and her job at the 7-Eleven across the street from her low-income apartment complex wasn't quite cutting it. Uncle T, their new stepdad, was cool, well-liked, and made good money. He moved in with them, and I would go over every now and again, spending a week or two at a time. 
Uncle T was hardly there because he worked so much, but when he was, he gave me really bad vibes. I had grown up in an abusive household and had, and still have, pretty good creep dar. And while Uncle T did nothing out of the ordinary, I always felt sick around him and didn't make much eye contact with him. Maybe not creepy, but he used to come behind me when I sat on the couch watching TV and put his tongue on my nose, which I thought was gross at the time, but not necessarily weird because I wasn't sure of what the boundaries for an adult and child interaction should be for that young of age. And not having an uncle before, I thought it might be normal uncle stuff. But looking back at it, I maybe spoke one sentence to him before the interaction and now realize how weird and inappropriate it was. Even though I got a creepy vibe, I was always jealous of my two cousins because Uncle T was always spoiling them and their friends. Taking them to the mall, buying them things, taking them to the movies, giving them cash, etc. But I never seemed to stick around at my cousin's place long enough to partake in this. Knowing what I know now, I'm glad I wasn't lucky enough to receive any of the gifts from that disgusting man. After about a year of my aunt being married to Uncle T, my cousin Kate confided in one of my brothers, her age, that Uncle T was abusing her and Jen. Kate said that he would make her give him BJs and would make her invite her friends to sleep over. Kate was instructed to make her friends go into his room and do sexual things to them telling them that he would kill them or their families if they told. My six-year-old cousin, Jen, recounted being raped, saying, I thought I was going to die. It eventually came out that he was also sexually abusing two of his biological sons and was put away for a long time. I'm glad that they got out of that situation. But what makes me sad is the fact that my aunt remarried another man that would hack Jen's phone making it to where all the messages she got or sent went to his phone as well. He would pretend to be guys she knew at school and would sext her with these guys, getting pictures of her and everything when she was 14. When my aunt found out, he said it was to protect her and it was dismissed. My poor cousins have endured so much real trauma from these creeps and their lives reflect that trauma. This isn't too creepy, but it creeps me the fuck out. I'm a 21-year-old female, and my uncle is much older than me, early 40s. He's the youngest out of my dad's siblings. He saw me from birth up till I was nine. He was okay with me as a kid and never did anything creepy to me as far as I could remember. However, when my parents were together, my mother always warned me not to get too close to my uncle. When I was nine, I moved away with my mother to a completely different city up north, and she told me things about him and my grandfather. It made me feel gross hearing them. However, I can't lie, I did doubt her, as she had the tendency to exaggerate every story she told. Little did I know how right she was. When I became 18, my dad's family and I met up in the city at that time. It was great. I saw my cousin, who was a year older than me, and we all caught up in what I missed. I interacted with my uncle again too, and was friendly with him, just like everyone else in my family. Though, I regret it now because he saw my fun side, and I guess that motivated him to interact with me. He looked much older, and grew a large gut, and became almost bald. It had surprised me because he looked like your average TikTok star when he was younger. That meeting was okay, however, he began acting strangely with me afterwards. He'd always managed to find a way to touch me, such as putting his finger under my neck or chin to turn my face suddenly towards him, like a cheesy rom-con or something. It was not in the private area, but he was always touchy. This for me was a yellow flag, as our culture is strict, and men don't touch women at all, even in a friendly manner. None of my other male relatives have behaved like this in the past, except for my grandfather. So he made me feel weird, and I had forgotten all of what my mother had told me about them. One time, a particular incident occurred when I was at my cousin's house, and he was there too. My memory is hazy, but I remember he whispered a question about why I'm so shy, and he was so close to my neck when he said it. 
I could feel his hot breath on my neck, which made me have cold sweat. He wouldn't leave me alone and kept asking me questions, forcing me to interact. Another thing in my culture is women are told to be hospitable and will not cause a scene as it's extremely shameful and the woman would be blamed even for legitimate reasons. He would always do childish expressions at me whenever I would accidentally make eye contact with him and I noticed he was always staring right at me. The conversations he had would try to include me in some way and he would always ask me questions about it though I tried to make myself look busy. I think once after he breathed on me, I caught him looking through my purse when I was away from it and he noticed and quickly tried to act like he was doing nothing suspicious. Near the end of the day, I was on the sofa looking behind it while petting my cousin's cat. My uncle was leaving and wanted to say goodbye. I didn't think much of it as he usually would say goodbye. However, he grabbed me by my wrist and pulled me towards him. It felt pretty violating as I was practically cornered due to the positioning of the sofa. He said some things that I can't remember as it was overpowered by my feelings of disgust that I had towards him and panic. What he was doing to me was not allowed in our culture. Men did not grab women by the wrist, not even husbands were their wives. I tried pulling back but he grabbed me harder and it felt like he was filling my wrist even more. It freaked me out and afterwards he let me go and left. I turned around and saw that my dad had partially seen the ordeal. When I got home, I told him everything that was happening. My dad said good thing that I came to him and that he would talk to my grandmother about it so she can straighten him up. However, sadly nothing like that happened. My dad instead always kept a distance between me and my uncle. He wouldn't let my uncle into my house if he knew I was in tops that weren't completely modest and told me not to open the door to him if I was home alone or just with my brother. My uncle was still creepy sometimes. He was recording a video of my little cousin's birthday like everyone else, but he spent some uncomfortable amount of time just filming me and I was obviously uncomfortable. My dad did call me towards him and kept me under watch while my uncle was near. Once my uncle had come over and knocked like a wild man for us to open the door so he could deliver us some food our grandmother had made. It was late and did the same thing to our cousins. My dad has told him that we wouldn't open the door for him if we were home alone, but my uncle wasn't happy with that. The weird thing is he just had a baby. Mysteriously, his wife has never met us or interacted with us. Our grandmother had made. I also don't know why he chases after me specifically. He doesn't act like this to my other cousin and I'm not a looker. I wish I had listened to my mother from the get-go and just steered clear from him since day one of meeting him. I really hope someday I can get away from him. I think he's really creepy. I sadly don't think he will ever get what he deserves due to my misogynistic culture. I'm a 19 year old female. I have had this friend, 19 male, who I've known for many years, but was never close to. Recently, coming back from uni for summer, I went back home to stay with my parents. There isn't much to do in my hometown except for hang out with friends, smoke, and drink. So that's exactly what I did. While hanging out with my friends, I ran into the guy. I'll call him Saf for the purpose of the story. Saf has always seemed like a chill guy. Typical 19 year old man who studies business, living off of daddy's money since he comes from a wealthy family. As soon as we reconnected, we developed a closer friendship. He started hosting at his house and my friends and I would go. When we smoke, he frequently brought up his fantasies of killing and eating someone. Of course, all of us being high would just laugh it off and consider it to be shock humor. However, he would never laugh while making these jokes. We all agreed that it was pretty creepy, but we chalked it up to him being really high. That is until I started hanging out with him alone. We have a pretty small friend group that hangs out nearly every day. Saf and I would stay up pretty late after everyone's left, usually until the sun comes up which is how we got so close because it would just be us at the end of the night and he would drive me home. On one of those nights, we were with a group of friends and decided that we would take edibles. For context, we were at Saf's house. Three hours into it when we were all pretty gone, 
Sass starts going on a tangent about how it would feel to pluck someone's eyeballs out. He starts going into detail and my other friend asked him to stop talking about it because it was making him uncomfortable. He always did this but this time he really wanted to detail, explaining imagery, etc. Someone quickly changed the subject and the night went on. About an hour later my friends and I decided to take a look in the fridge for munchies. As we look in the fridge for shit to eat, I feel someone put their arm around my neck and I feel something quite heavy putting pressure on it, and I look down. I realize Saf is holding a knife to my neck and holding my other friend with his other free hand. What are you guys doing? He asked. Keep in mind, we are all very high, so I start laughing it off and going along with what I thought was a joke. As my friend and I answer him, I realize he still hasn't pulled the knife away from my neck, and that he, in fact, is holding it closer to the point where I started to cough. Thankfully, the knife was quite dull, but it was still a massive kitchen knife. As soon as I realized he isn't letting go, I let out a scream, nothing too loud or alarming. I was hoping he would also assume I was joking. He then lets go and walks away. The night goes on and we quickly forget about what happened. Saf offers to drive my friend and I home at the end of the night when everyone's left. My friend and I don't have a car or money, so we accept. On the drive home, stopped at a red light he made my friend get out and check if the car was damaged because he had seen something bump it while driving. Neither my friend or I saw this, but my friend got out of the car anyway and checks, and as he tries to open the door to get back in, Saf locks it. The light has now turned green and thank god it's only 5am because there were only two or three other cars around, but they all started beeping and swerving as to not hit the car or my friend. My friend and I are yelling at him to open the door. He drives a couple inches forward, putting the tires on my friend's foot. He then unlocks the door and watches my friend yell at him for being trapped under the tire. I look over to Saf and I see him hysterically laughing and putting the car in reverse for my friend to get in. Once we get back on the road, he starts driving crazy, which isn't unusual for him, but he was a lot more reckless that morning. Now, before you all judge me for staying friends with such a weird and dangerous man, keep in mind it had never happened this bad before. He just said really weird shit every now and then, but honestly thought it was more of an intrusive thought thing. I struggle with mental health and have the most vile and weird intrusive thoughts, so I thought that's what it was and as for the night I have mentioned, we're really high on edibles. So although I was very weirded out, I thought he must have been super high and so was I, so I convinced myself I was overreacting. Then one night we go to a party together. We get back into the car for the after party, but on the way, I realize it has been cancelled. Saf then asked me if I want to go back to his house, eat something, watch a movie and smoke. It was still early in the night, so I agreed, knowing that I wouldn't be asleep for a while. We pull up, he tells me to make myself comfortable, and he's going to cook us some pasta. So I sit down, turn on the movie and wait. He comes back out with the pasta, and I eat almost all of it. And a few minutes into the movie, I started to feel very ill. I mentioned this to Saf, and he says it's probably because I drank, but I only drank very little at the party, which was around three hours ago at this point. I haven't thrown up or felt nauseous from alcohol in years. As the time goes on, I keep feeling worse and practically beg him to take me home. He refuses because he is in his house. This is the first time he's declined taking me home. At this point, I had a really bad feeling along with a sickness and my body decided I have to get out of there. I thankfully had some money with me, so I ordered a cab and went home. On the way home in the cab, I started vomiting out of the window because of how much pain my stomach was in. I get home and I collapse, but I'm unable to fall asleep because of the pain I'm in. Then I start thinking about all the times he mentioned the desire to kill someone and eat them. He's always talked about how he would eat the girl's thigh because he believes it would be the juiciest. How he would only eat a girl and not a boy. Since this day I've kept my distance but I've been fighting myself internally asking did I just get poisoned or did I just drink too much? Is he a psychopath or just a little weird? I truly don't know so people any advice is appreciated. As I've mentioned I've been friends with him for years and developed a close relationship. I do love him as a friend just not enough to be eaten. I have this friend, I'll just use the first letter, R. 
who I believe has been stalking me for the past two weeks, if not longer. I'll give some background info, then get into the problem I'm in. We went back in 2014, in high school. He was always quiet, but a nice and easygoing guy. We grew very close, and I saw him as a brother. We didn't have a smooth childhood. He saw his parents argue a lot, often for years. His mom even cheated on his dad, and he saw the effect it had on him and the whole family. But you wouldn't suspect anything out of the ordinary, just meeting him at first. Around 2016, he started to become a little bit paranoid and would seem a bit pessimistic at first. He never had many friends, neither did I for that matter. We had two other friends together that we saw often, and they were the only ones he trusted. I saw him have a very strange panic attack where he ran out of the restaurant that we were at and he ran into a nearby park and yelled at people. I called his dad to come get him and he got into the car and gave him a pill. Apparently, this had been the second time this had happened to him recently. Fast forward to June 2021. In between the last episode attack to now, R seemed normal as could be, but I noticed he was a bit off and has been since then. He met a girl in college months before that he says he fell madly deeply in love with, but she rejected him when he asked her out on a date and blocked him on everything right after graduation. It took a massive toll on his emotional and mental state. He had another episode where he ran outside of his house and actually provoked someone and they punched him in his face in self-defense. His parents took him to the hospital during that summer and he was officially diagnosed with schizophrenia. So from late 2021 until now. I've noticed he's quieter, still cracks jokes and can have a decent conversation with him and still seems like he's a nice guy. But there's some stuff recently that I truly think is alarming and that's why I'm making this post. So I'll cut to the chase. For the last six weeks we've hung out three times. This was actually after a hiatus where we didn't see each other since February this year because I started working more hours and went to the night shift. Each of those hangouts, I noticed that he looks at me in a really strange way, like he's horny and imagining me naked or imagining himself hurting me. We're both male, heterosexual, saying this to preface for what I'm going to mention in a bit. He also mentions how he's still in love with a girl from school, but proceeds to call her a slut, whore, and wants to rape and kill her right after. He has said this numerous times and even mentions going to the elementary school that she works at. He sent me a picture of the school on Google Maps with an arrow pointed at it and firework emojis last week. He has admitted that he has parked outside of her home and sitting there for hours, about five times back in 2021. For the past week, he has been insisting on hanging out several times a day. And when I was at Chili's with my parents on Saturday, he sent me a message saying, Chili's. He was able to see me since I'm on Snap Map on Snapchat, since I use the app often to talk to other friends. When I went to the mall right after, he said, You're going to the mall again? You were there yesterday. Which is true. I went to the mall once more with my mom, and then with both my parents the day later, to get some stuff since one of our favorite stores is closing, and we wanted to check out the good deals. On the drive home that day, he messaged me saying, You didn't work today? We should have hung out. I replied, Maybe Wednesday. So the day after, on Sunday, he again insisted on seeing me, but I went to go play soccer instead with my other friends, and then went to do laundry afterwards. When I was at the laundromat, he sent me a soccer ball emoji, and then a laundry emoji, indicating he saw me on Snap Map. Here's the thing, he keeps mentioning where I am, and it's always within 10 minutes of me being on my phone. He's actually done this for the last two years, but never this frequently. It used to be twice a month, and I brush it off, but now I'm noticing something actually concerning. He's also been calling me boyfriend, and sending me heart emojis the past week. When I told him I might see him this week, which I won't. But I said that I would, just to make him not mad, because I'm actually fearful of him hurting me, or others. He said, You think I can wait that long to see my boyfriend? This past Sunday, I didn't reply to him for four hours, and he kept asking me if I was mad, 
and then said he wants me to reply no longer than a minute after he texts me each time. I have a feeling he's constantly on his phone looking for when I'm active on social media and I really don't know why. He also admitted to me a month ago that he makes fake profiles to be able to gain access to the other girl's Instagram and look at her pictures and he says he masturbates to them. He even uses a nudity app to take her clothes off, he said. All of this is concerning. He currently doesn't have a job and hasn't had one for the last two years. I'm the only friend he talks to or sees and I feel he's developed a compulsion or fixation or dependence or a mix of all three on me. As I mentioned, he said he wants to rape and kill the girl that used to be in the class and he knows where she lives and he knows where she works. I have not mentioned my thoughts on this to him, again, out of fear. He currently takes medicine daily and he said that he's been seeing a new therapist for just a month now, but I don't know if any of those things are even working. I am asking for advice on how to approach this and what to do. My concern is if I tell anyone, like the police or the girl, he will retaliate by hurting me or my family, as he knows where I live. Any help is appreciated. Okay, so essentially he asked me why I'm not on Snap Map anymore, and I got a bit ticked off and confronted him in a nice and civil way. And he pretty much said all that stuff were jokes and that he doesn't want to harm anyone, but I don't buy it. I feel like he's in denial. Any help? These events happened over several months in 2016 when me and my sister, then 16 and 14, first moved into our recent apartment complex with our mother. Admittedly, we were still into the hoverboard craze then and would ride them around. This is how we met Savannah. She was our age and lived in our building. She asked to hang out and we were happy to hopefully make a new friend so we said yes. We hung out outside of the complex in a little park area. It got dark and we started making up ghost stories. Turns out she likes creepy paranormal stuff like we did. As we were walking home, the light in one of the apartment hallways flickered and I jolted and said, it's a spirit trying to communicate with us. Savannah made up a flash once for yes, twice for no system to communicate with the spirit and we messed around a bit. We thought it was all harmless fun. The next day she runs over to us excited. She informs us the spirit we had met last night told her its name was Corinne and that it meant light so it all made perfect sense now. We asked her how she knew and she said she went back later that night alone to talk to it. This is the first time it occurred to us that she might have really believed in this stuff. Our aunt had given us an old Ouija board as a joke the year before and we thought Savannah might like it. Savannah lit up and said she wanted to talk to Corinne so we huddled in the hallway connecting the apartments and put our two hands on the board. We kept getting some random letters that didn't make sense but soon Savannah's questions were more directed to her. We felt her moving it and called her out. She got mad and said that she'll prove it. She took her hand off of it and it no longer moved. She huffed and insisted it wasn't her. Over the next few weeks we did mostly normal stuff with her. She kept talking about the ghost and the Ouija boards until we broke down and played again. This time we were introduced to a new ghost, Evan. We knew that Savannah was moving the planchette but were curious about the story she was making up so we let her follow through. Evan was a ghost or a demon rather about our age who wanted free from a greater demon controlling him. The greater demon's name? Corinne. Savannah's parents called her inside and conveniently Evan had to go too. He told us to protect ourselves against Corinne, especially Savannah. Savannah said how cute that was for him to offer. A few days go by normally, but then Savannah is back to tell us that she has a boyfriend. We are happy for her until she tells us his name is Evan. We're wondering what the hell she's talking about, and she explains that while sleeping over at another friend's house, something had tugged off her shorts while sleeping. She woke up and heard Evan's voice. Then he visited her in her dreams and asked her on a date or something like that. She said yes. Of course, we knew she made up Evan, so we were kind of like, what is wrong with you? And we don't talk about the demon stuff anymore. Now, Savannah is extremely possessive over her friends. When she would see us with someone else, she texts us nonstop about why we hadn't invited her. We try to keep our distance, but she lived on the same ground floor 
and literally watched out her window waiting for us to come outside. She latched onto us. We didn't know much about her home life, but she always seemed troubled. She had scars on her wrist and talked about running away from home. Her parents seemed alright, if rather strict and religious. We still hung out with her because we were worried, but we're starting to feel weird about it. Worst, she randomly showed up holding her hands out, saying Evan is holding her hand. She looked at random things and would laugh when no one was talking because Evan had told her a joke. One time, she managed to feel her cheek where it was supposedly warm from Evan's kiss. It was not warm. One day, my sister and I were bored from her talking to Evan on the Ouija board. She was still controlling the whole thing and wanted some fun. I texted my mom to call from a private number and play some creepy sounds. Looking back, this was one of the dumbest things I did, but at the time, it was just for fun. My mom made the call and I put it on speaker. Savannah is living for it, especially when my mom played the track from a scary movie about a ghost. My mom took it a step further and threw a banana off the third story balcony for us to see. Savannah said it was a sign that Corinne was winning. We had no idea of the fire this would lighten her. We were all about to tell her that it was a prank, but again, her mom called her inside. She found us the next day and I came clean about the prank. She laughed and said, there was no way that we could have done all that. I said, no, my mom literally did all that. When Savannah had told her friend about it, who told her that yellow objects were a sign of the devil and seeing them meant the devil was haunting you. This was all she talked about for a while, but since nothing else happened, she gradually forgot. Things went back to normal for a while until Autumn moved in. Autumn and Savannah connected instantly because of their history with depression. Autumn was a few years younger than us, but had hell of a lot more of a past. This included a significant time spent in psychiatric facilities and violence towards her classmates and family. Autumn claimed that she heard demons talk to her at night, and just like that, the ghost stuff started again. Savannah felt threatened by Autumn and felt the need to one-up her with ghost stuff. She told her that Evan was her ghost brother that looked out for her. I was like, hold on, you claimed that he was your boyfriend. Savannah giggled and said, that's gross, he's my brother. Her story had completely switched. Now she was dating another demon named Jacob and they were engaged. She even showed us the ring to prove it. The next week or so was literally a match between them to see who was the darkest and most involved in the spirit world or whatever. They compared scars on their wrist and bragged about cutting themselves and doing little things like sneaking out at night. In a move to one-up Autumn, Savannah drew a giant pentagram in the parking lot with chalk. Her parents found out and she backed out and blamed it on Autumn. The next day, people came and repaved the parking lot. The pentagram is now buried under there forever, literally. Savannah moved on to saying that her friend had found Jacob's body and was going to put his spirit back inside it. Savannah continued to take advice from this friend who fueled everything she did. Savannah now said the friend was teaching her witchcraft. We mostly avoided her at this point, but she'd ask us to do things like make holy water with her and try to summon her a familiar. From that point on, she insisted that she was a fire witch and walking around wearing all black with Halloween makeup on her face. She and Autumn frequently snuck out together and occasionally we see the cop cars at our house. My sister and I were avoiding them both, but now we get fiery texts from both of them if we hung out with other people, especially our guy friends. Once, they saw us get home and stood in the parking lot pretending to be possessed. Autumn also cut off all her hair and claimed that she tried to kill our teacher. My sister and I knew it was bullshit, or at least we hoped, but Savannah took it seriously. She'd go around telling her neighbors the terrible crime she committed or wanted to commit. She even told us when she first saw us outside on our hoverboards, she wished for them to blow up. One day, we again saw the police come to her door, and the officers had jackets that said that they were from the juvenile justice department. Her mom pulled me, my sister, and our mom to explain what was going on. Apparently, two years before, they discovered Savannah talking with this man online. Her messages to him were hiring him to come kill her parents. After making threats of killing them a few days before, we were able to confirm the story after pestating for them and finding the court papers about it. We had known that she was always on probation, but she'd always tell us different stories as to why. Savannah continued to beg us to hang out with her after that, 
even inviting herself to spend the night. We avoided her at all costs, but she'd follow us everywhere. It kind of died down when Autumn moved out, and Savannah moved with her family shortly after. Since then, she started doing service hours at a horse stable and graduated from high school. I really hope she's gotten happier and more stable. Autumn messaged my sister a few months ago, asking to call her mom to confirm she was with us. She wasn't. And we later saw her with a 19-year-old dude. She's 14. My mom's sister and I have moved as well. There are too many incidents in those apartments. Our new place is so quiet and peaceful. But to Savannah and Autumn, let's not meet again. I've been sitting alone at home all day due to a storm, and I think I finally feel ready to speak about my experience with a girl I met in college. No one has ever heard the full story, and I'm ready to tell most of it here. I'm a 23-year-old female, but at the time I was 19, going on 20 at the time of meeting this girl. I was also in an unstable and codependent relationship at the time, and was utterly depressed, naive, and craving a sense of validation of my thoughts and feelings that no one around me at the time was willing to give me, so I was the perfect candidate to inflate and dote upon the literal god complex ego of this one girl. To begin, I was in an acting one-on-one -on -one class my first semester of college and swore to myself that I wouldn't make friends in the two years I was set to be there. This was a community college. I was to go in, get good grades, and leave. It wasn't until the third day, a week and a half since the semester started, and this girl walks in, and you could feel the air in the room grow thin. Her presence was both alluring and yet annoying at the same time. Charisma seemed to ooze out of her pores and shine like a halo from her hair. For more context, I am from the US, and when this girl began to speak with a British accent, everyone was confused yet intrigued. Apparently, she had just gotten back from a trip to England with her father. Apparently, she was originally from there. That was when my first instinct rang clear. If she had enough money to be flying to and from England, why is she doing an acting 101 class at a community college? I decided to keep my curiosity to myself until the next class when she asked me questions that I unfortunately no longer remember. However, I do remember my initial disgust with her demeanor. She seemed too bubbly, too poised. Something was just off. After that brief encounter, I felt that was all I'd ever hear from her. However, slowly, she would make remarks to me during class, and eventually, I started striking conversations as well. Then one day, after class, she mentions to me how expensive and annoying it was to wait for an Uber every time class ends. I remember offering her a ride as an alternative, but she would dramatically decline, saying things like how her parents would get angry with her for burdening me with the task of driving her around. I understood and felt pity for her after that. In that moment, I thought that she was in a household where her parents were overbearing and slightly abusive, so I decided I would try to befriend her outside of class. She seemed nice enough. I also had this pain in my heart to help her for some reason, and that was exactly what she wanted. So over time, we grew closer. I would offer her rides home. I would insist and say that I'm her friend now and that friends help each other out. She seemed to enjoy these gestures. She'd compliment me and they'd go on to say how tough her life was without a license. Eventually she agreed and I took her home. It was honestly very nice to have someone to talk about class with outside of class. Soon enough, after driving her home for the past few classes, she invited me in for tea. I thought it was adorable having afternoon tea and gossiping with a friend. She was British after all. We both eventually opened up about ourselves and spoke on things besides class. She told me she was my age. She graduated the same year as me and also took a gap year. She said throughout school she traveled to and from England and I found it so fascinating. She was adopted from a third world country and brought to England and then moved to her current town when she was six. She told me about past relationships. I opened up about mine. She always seemed to be the same as me, like she was trying to emulate me in some way. It was so subtle. It was difficult to notice at first. 
I told her about the apprehension I felt in my current relationship. She sympathized and told me a story about how her ex hurt her even worse. I would always take note of things she said because I was not only her friend, but we seemed to share the same experiences. However, hers were always more severe than mine. In hindsight, I know why that is. But at the time, I just thought how unlucky this girl was, and I felt so bad for her past. Soon it became a tradition to drink tea at her house after class, but I had to be out before mom got home, and if I were there to meet her mother, it would be bad. One day, her mom got home early and was surprised, yet delighted to see me. She introduced herself and I did the same, all while my friend sat and sulked in anger. Her mother seemed delightful and I was surprised by how welcoming she was. She offered me food and gave me some crackers to take home. I eventually confronted my friend asking why she would pay her mom to be that way. She said she was just kinder to guests than her. I was confused but I fully understood. I have a mother who is very similar to that so I shook it off. One day in class we get our midterm assignment. We were to prepare a nonverbal monologue in front of the class. We each got our assigned stage directions and are asked to prepare it in two weeks. One of the stage directions was a girl comes home crying after being sexually assaulted. Another girl in our class received this one, but was uncomfortable doing it, and rightfully so. A boy in the class criticized her for not wanting to do it, and she ran out of the classroom. My friend and I followed her. The three of us opened up about our past assaults, and we eventually calmed the classmate down. Time passes after the class, and a few classes later, when I was walking my friend in my car, she all of a sudden runs away from me. I follow her, and I'm laughing at her. She had fallen gracefully on the ground, and was on the grass on her knees. I asked her what she was doing. I asked her why she was being a weirdo. What she did was, related to our conversation, she looks up at me with some strange kind of fear in her eyes and says that she just saw her assault her just then on campus. I was shaken at this point because I don't remember seeing anyone walk anywhere near us. She said he walked by and stared at her evilly. I was confused and said she must have imagined it, but she was adamant. I was also even more confused because she had told me she had filed a restraining order against him. How could he be allowed on campus? If he really wanted to go to the same school, there were two campuses in two different towns, so surely he could have gone to the other campus. I was asked all these questions and was met with a little answer. Obviously, she said she wanted to talk to her mother and handle it accordingly. It took two weeks to hear anything about it. I wanted her to bring it up, but she never did. So eventually I asked her, and she gave me a story about how she went to the dean's office after class and fixed things. I remember being confused because I had driven her home after all our classes were over. She said that they went after I left, but that couldn't have been because the school offices close around 5 and we would always leave at 5. Many of my questions were met with strange excuses, but I remember just letting it go. This was a sore subject after all, and I didn't want to upset her any more than she already was. Weeks passed and my friend and I Eventually, he became inseparable. We seemed to know a lot of the ins and outs of each other. We even hosted a Friendsgiving together at her house with some of the people from our acting class. Then the end of the summer semester came, and I could feel a rift grow between us. I was confused and hurting. She said she wasn't going for a degree and was just there to take acting classes. I remember being confused. I thought she was a theater major like me. She had said she was, but I guess she might have changed her mind. She said she would be auditioning for the London Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York City early the next year, and she was probably going to get it and would never see me again. I remember feeling confused. Why didn't she tell me this sooner? Why did she even get close to me during the semester? Then I thought how it was probably my fault that I pushed her to be my friend but I just felt so bad for her. It was like she was asking for a friend without telling me. Eventually, I convinced her that it would be good for her to go to class with me again next semester. Partly because I wanted to selfishly keep her close, and the other part because I knew, from what she told me, 
that if she never got into the academy, she would probably end her life. I feared for my friend so much, I wanted to push her to be in class with me because she had somehow made me think that I was helping her not kill herself. So she signed up for class and decided to audition with me for the spring musical, but she wasn't going with me because she auditioned alone and couldn't talk to anyone before she sang, which I guess was understandable. Soon her audition for the academy rolls around and I managed to come with her and her parents for the weekend. New York City is about an afternoon's train ride away and her parents were kind enough to pay for my ticket. How I managed to be invited was by her telling me how scared and terrified she was to be with her parents on this trip. So I offered to come to be a buffer between her and her parents' evil ways. I was met with polite no's and eventually just like all my other kind offers, I was then met with a yes. Besides, I love New York City, and when I learned I didn't have to pay, I was even more excited. Now for those of you who have made it this far, I want you to understand if you haven't already. It wasn't like I was begging this girl to let me do anything for her. She'd answer me in a way that made things seem like I had to insist. Like, if I didn't ask anything, she would be hurt and it would be my fault, or in simpler words, I was manipulated into doing things for her, but it never felt like that, because I meant it. I was much more generous to friends I had met at the time then. So, I arrived in Grand Central Station and was met with my friend and her mother. We walked to the hotel and everything seems normal. We go to sleep and I wake up, and to be honest, all I remember about this trip was how scared I was about the new virus going around. It was January 2020. Her parents seemed to be such angels. I remember going to shops with them and they were talking about how my friend would like this and how they wanted to make this for my friend and how we should go here after my friend was out of the audition. All their parents talked about was my friend. I was floored. I remember her telling me to stay in the room all day to ignore her parents but I didn't want to. I now see why. Eventually, we made our way to the New York Public Library. I remember going to the top floor, taking pictures of the painted ceiling, standing for a minute, and then her parents find me and said that they have to go meet my friend now. She was in need of some cherry colored chapstick and some water. They told me to stay, that they would meet me later to explore the city. I said, absolutely not. I was not walking around alone in this massive city, no way, so I went with them. I witnessed their panic as they tried to hurry to her audition and find water and the right chapstick in time. All while my friend was texting them exactly what she wants and tells them to hurry. We walked for about 20 minutes to this building. 20 minutes. My parents won't even come downstairs to tell me something, let alone that far to bring me water and chapstick. They decided that it would take too much time to get the cherry colored chapstick and that my friend would just have to get the plain one from her mom's purse. We got to the building and met her in the lobby. She goes to her parents to see that they have no cherry chapstick and not the right water. She's furious. She gets mad and just storms into the audition room, never saying thank you. After that, we just sit in the Panera Bread and wait for another 20 minutes. Eventually, she gets out of her audition and meets us inside. She then was adamant on alienating me from her parents and only wanted to talk to me about her audition. She tells me the story and I can't help but to think that she's lying about it all. It all just seemed bizarre, but I don't remember the details. I just remember after the story I told her about my day with her parents and she was very upset with me spending all my time with them. She scolded me and asked what we talked about over and over again for the rest of the trip. We went to sleep and left the next day. I remember feeling very weirded out with my friend after that trip. She seemed to be a lot more abrasive with me afterwards and adamant on me not speaking with her parents. Eventually I learned that her name that she had told me wasn't her actual legal name. Eventually I saw that her high school diploma was from 2019 and not 2018. I asked her about it and she said that she had got a misprint. The misprint turned in her graduating late because she was in a mental hospital a lot. She went to mental health programs, but also traveled back and forth to England, but also went to school two days a week her senior year. 
She said that she had to do her senior year twice, that she only lived in England when she was a child. She actually lived in England most of her life. Nothing was adding up. All the stories she would eventually tell never made sense together. I remember half jokingly asking her to write a timeline of her life because things never added up. Still, despite all the inconsistencies, I still kept her as a friend. The lives were just far enough apart from each other to feel like maybe I was the one that was wrong. The cognitive dissonance was growing in my mind, and this was just the beginning. Now, before I met my friend, I had begun practicing the Wiccan religion. I was a solitary Wiccan who lived by the reed. I was actively practicing altruism as a form of devotion to the Wiccan moon goddess and the horned god. My friend, coincidentally, was also a practicing Wiccan. We had done full moon rituals together, and she seemed to know a lot more than I did, so eventually I followed her lead when it came to rituals. They started out tame, making candle manifestation wishes outside, sitting under the moonlight, meditating together. We'd make our wishes out loud, thus getting to know each other's deepest desires. We were very emotionally vulnerable in these moments together. And after our rituals, we tried all kinds of divination and other spiritual practices. We were like our own little coven. One full moon, just before I had to leave, I asked my friend to do a tarot reading for me on my love life. I had recently had a fight with my then boyfriend and wanted to see what she saw. My friend seemed to have all the answers about my life when it came to divination, and I was trusting her enough to hear her out. She started pulling cards and read the descriptions. Every single card she pulled was a bad one. It said we would end in failure, hardship, despair, that I had to leave him ASAP. I remember wanting to, but not knowing how. I left that night crying over how horrible that card reading went. To jump back into the timeline, after we started our second semester classes, I remember opening up to some of my classmates that my friend and I were witches. I did it in a way to offer spells for help but my friend was mad for me outing us. She never wanted them knowing what we did. I was confused. I wanted to help others and invite them into our little world that I love so much, but my friends seemed to see it differently. So I respected her boundary and never brought up us practicing again to others outside of my personal life. Eventually, as I know all you have guessed, the pandemic started in March of 2020. Classes were moved to online and so was our friendship. We'd FaceTime almost every day and watch movies while on call. Now, at college, the musical had been cast before lockdown, and I unfortunately didn't get in, but my friend did. She met all of the other theater majors and started talking to them in their Discord chat during that pandemic. I was never brought into that circle by her until the summer of 2020, and during that time, and even before lockdown, my friend would try to date the boys in the department and even grew an obsession with two of them. She told the first one, who I'm actually dating now, that she was friends with his favorite Broadway star and that she would have them meet. He never believed her. After he turned her down, she became angry and started a rumor that he was actually gay. After that, she moved on to another guy who had a girlfriend at the time. She was even more obsessed with him. She enjoyed the chase. The fact that he was her friend and stayed up late and spoke to her all night made her so happy. He had opened up to me and said that she was never the only one he spoke to and that he was just a night out because of his job and she was the only one up that late to talk to. During the course of the two months during lockdown and when people began to feel a little more comfortable, my friend and I had talked about her maybe moving into my house. Now, I have a large room in my parents' basement, and my friend had begun to scare me with her talks of her parents are awful to her when she's home with just them. I have yet to mention that she has an older brother with a form of autism, among other issues. She would talk about how mean he was to her. She consistently called me, saying that she was going to kill herself. I was terrified and decided to open up my home to her. This was the worst but best mistake I've ever made. Worse because of the escalation of our friendship getting worse, but the best because it really made me realize how awful and manipulative she truly was. She moved in and everything was great. It was nice to be with someone who I considered to be my best friend. It was like a never-ending sleepover. 
I had a spare bed in my room at the time and she would use that for a while until she brought over her mattress and eventually moved all her things in. Everything she had, however, reeked. Everything smelled like B.O. And when she lived here, she never showered. She stayed here about five days a week and two days at her house. She refused to even shower and never changed her clothes. She'd just sit on one side of the room and rot for days, only getting up to use the bathroom and pick up DoorDash. She'd eat on my side of the room and leave her mess for me to pick up. Eventually, I bought a large trash barrel for us to use and she would fill it up almost daily. I tried to do moon rituals with her and she would refuse to practice with me. I'd ask for a tarot reading and she would refuse. However, her prophecies didn't stop, they just got worse. Instead of getting tarot readings, I get dream recalls. She'd tell me all these amazing dreams she had. They were said to be prophetic dreams brought to her by the goddess Aphrodite, whom she claimed to work with and worship while I was outside doing my moon rituals. She'd tell me I'd be a famous actress and I'd get a K-pop star. I'd see the world and be an amazing celebrity. Obviously, I didn't believe her at first, but she'd tell me her stories in such a way that it'd give me hope hoped that my hard work would actually pay off. She had the guidance of Aphrodite on her side delivering these messages. I wanted to believe her so bad that I shoved all logic aside and clung on the future of reality that she was feeding me. I was no longer in a sad and crumbling relationship. I would be cast in shows. I'd be happy one day. And that's all I truly wanted. Soon, during the summer, my friend would have another friend over. We'd all hang out. But this new girl was more my friend's friend than mine. Eventually, my friend began to actively try to keep us from seeing each other. But it never really worked because eventually me and the other girl became close. We would even work together in my room while my friend socked in the corner, eyes closed, listening to music and ignoring us every time we invited her to join us. Also around that time. Now, this is not my story to tell despite being anonymous. I just don't feel comfortable sharing the exact details of the boy's encounter with my friend. But what happened was later told to me by this boy. And it was on a night that I was out at my then boyfriend's house. This incident happened in my bedroom however. And the details still haunt me to this day. Though rest assured nothing too horrible escalated. But if it wasn't for some sort of intervening that I can't remember the details of. I don't know what my friend would have truly done to him. I remember after that night despite not knowing what had happened. My friend grew even more malicious towards me. She began to sow the seeds of fear of the Greek gods into me, saying that they were angry with me and that's why I was having bad days. That's why my boyfriend and I were always fighting. I was doing things wrong and it was driving me wild that I didn't know what it was exactly. All I knew was something was upsetting the powers above me by just existing and that was why my life was currently a mess. So one night, one desperate and hollow night, I asked my friend again about my future and what I was doing wrong. She looked at me and said, Do you want it for me or Aphrodite? I looked at her and said, Aphrodite. My friend enters a meditative state and then looks to me in an evil, sadistic way. Her demeanor had changed entirely. I have never seen and I have yet to see anything quite like it. I was told that the reason I was having such horrible days was because I had to break up with my boyfriend. I had to do it sooner or nothing else in my life would ever become true. No fame, no success, no happiness. If I didn't do it by the next full moon, that my life would be stagnant, that I would amount to nothing. It was so convincing. I could still feel the primal fear I felt right then and there. My friend took the bracelet that I had been wearing that was from my boyfriend and held it. She told me, still through the persona of Aphrodite, that I was being held down by this bracelet. That in order to rid myself of my boyfriend once and for all, I had to get rid of it. Soon. I was tasked to toss it in the lake an hour away from me and to do it only with my friend. But I had to break up with my boyfriend first before ridding myself from the cursed bracelet. I was stunned. I didn't know what to feel. My friend left the so-called trance, not recalling a thing. I told her about the encounter, how scared I was, the fear of being smited, of disobeying an ancient deity. She told me that I never had to do it. I think it was because she was scared of what she had done to me. Maybe she thought she went too far. Or maybe it was just all a part of an act to get me to do what she wanted. I'm not entirely sure, but I was adamant on leaving my then boyfriend. 
I had worked up the courage and did it a few days later, but everything still fell off. A few days after that, we drove with another friend of mine up to the lake. I invited that friend because I was scared to just go with my manipulative friend, and I remember her being angry with me for inviting this other girl, but I didn't care. I knew something was off and I knew there could be more people, and I'm so glad I did because I'm not sure what would have happened to me. We were entirely off the grid when we got there. The GPS stopped working 15 minutes before arriving at the lake, and we got lost trying to leave. It was truly a surreal experience. Never felt fully safe the entire trip, and my evil friend was all too calm. After that, my friend moved out of the house. I remember we got into a fight. It was a night that she got mad at me for missing my ex. She had wanted me to cuddle her, and I wasn't comfortable with it. So, she went to her side of the room and sulked, waiting for me to beg her to come back. But I never did. We just went to sleep. The next day, I went to go speak to my ex about our breakup. Finalize things. Give things back. I came home and my friend was pretending to sleep. She was laying in the dark, smiling. I told her to cut the shit and talk to me. I explained where I was and she said she knew that my mom told her, which was actually true. We talked about how she's not getting better. She was cutting herself. She wasn't eating and she was laying around all day. She made excuses when I tried to help her change her habits. I was worried, but every time I voiced concern, I was met with excuses and blame for being concerned. So a few days later, she called me and told me that she'll never change and that I had to live with her the way she was. At the time, she adopted having a diagnosis with antisocial personality disorder and claimed to have always had it. I didn't believe her because she only started saying this after she had watched a Netflix K-drama with a woman with the same diagnosis. I finally started to piece together all the lies she told me. I also found out a little before our fight that she was actually a year younger than me after I saw her ID. She explained that the reason that was was because her parents changed her birth date after she was adopted because they wanted a younger baby. She accused her parents of committing forgery. I wanted to take action but she never did because it was a lie. Her chosen name was also a lie. She told me many stories for the reason why she wanted a different name after I found out her given name. Her accent was fake. She had never lived in England. I believe she had made up that trip she went on right before classes. I finally saw that everything was a lie. When she moved out, she left all her things at my house. So my sister and I packed up her stuff and brought it to her house. She told me that she wasn't home and couldn't help us that she had to get adult diapers for a dying grandma, who was always dying. She also said that I wasn't allowed to bring her things inside and to leave them in the mudroom. After we packed up everything into her mudroom, my friend walks out from her backyard dressed in the finest outfit I had yet to see her in and gets into the car with a boy that she was obsessed with, completely ignoring me and my sister. She never even said thank you. I was furious. I housed this girl. I cooked her meals if she ever ate. I listened to her. I did everything in my power to care for her. All I got was a mess of fuck you and my life in shambles. I tried confronting her on her lie and was met with countless, insistent, and self-deprecative excuses. So I just gave up and never spoke to her again. She blocked me on everything after that. I never spoke to anyone from my college ever again. She's gone from social media as well. All of her accounts have been changed or deactivated. To conclude, I eventually got back together with my boyfriend and recently broke up with him on my own terms. I just wasn't ready to let go at the time. I still practice witchcraft, just not Wicca, and I'm much more educated now than I was three years ago. Like I said, I have a new boyfriend and I'm also best friends with another girl who my evil friend introduced me to. I have my associate's degree in theater arts and I've done a lot of work in one year for my local theater community. I plan to move to New York City in the summer. My life is amazing now, and I have that friend, among others, out of my life. I still at times blame myself for being so naive and so trusting. I blame myself for the hurt I caused and how everything happened. I'm much more guarded now, but also a lot more headstrong. I also haven't made any new friends since, but I'm currently okay with that. 
There are many more lies that she had told me that I eventually figured out were lies, but that's too much to write. And honestly, I don't remember the timeline too clearly at some point, but I wrote on here what I know was right. But anyways, thank you for listening to this. And to my old friend, I hope I never see you again, as long as I live. When I was around 11 or 12, my sister got with a man and everything was fine back then. I got no problems with him. He was really nice to me and all. As I started growing up, he started to make me feel really uncomfortable. When I was 14, he started liking all my pictures on Instagram, unliking them, and then redoing it a bunch of times, day after day. I got so tired, so I blocked him on Instagram and deleted him on Facebook. Didn't want to make a big deal of it because, you know, it's just liking pictures, but I kind of felt weird about it. He's twice my age and has kids with my sister, but kept liking my posts and unliking them. He did it with one of my friends too. After being blocked on Instagram, he started to wow react on my Facebook pictures. Told my grandma to tell me how I looked so pretty on my profile picture, etc. Unreacted to all my pictures and did the same thing a few days later. I found this weird but didn't do anything about it. He wasn't harassing me or whatever. But one day, when I was about 17 or 18, I asked my sister to give me a lift to my job. She didn't come, he did. I was feeling weird the entire time I was alone with him. He started to tell me how beautiful I was, how I was becoming such a beautiful woman. He tried to grab my thigh but my hand was on it, so he just acted as if nothing happened. We arrived to my job about 30 minutes before my shift, so he asked me if I wanted to wait or go inside. Of course, I told him I wanted to go inside since I hadn't eaten anything for breakfast and told him I'll eat something before my shift. He told me something like, yeah, you need to fill this tummy and grabbed it while saying it. I felt like he wanted to touch me the whole ride but didn't see an opportunity. He waited for it and took a chance when he could. He also grabbed my leg one day. I know he hasn't done anything overly wrong, but he's still liking all my pics and I don't feel safe when I'm alone with him. There's something weird with him and I don't know what to do about it. My dad's friend, we'll call him A, and his wife were passing through town, so they stopped at our house to visit. I've always been uncomfortable around A, but it's just getting to the point where I can't stand to be around him. He forced me into multiple hugs during his visit, and they always lasted way too long. He'd also run his hand on my body when he'd pull away and kiss me on the cheek when it was extremely obvious that I was uncomfortable. He sat right beside me on an otherwise empty couch to the point where I was literally squeezed between him and the arm of the couch and he put his hand on my knee and was rubbing it. He kept making comments about how pretty I was, which aren't inherently creepy, but coupled with his other actions, were just weird. I honestly want to tell my dad how uncomfortable A makes me, but I'm afraid he won't take it well or will tell me I'm overreacting. I personally don't think I'm overreacting, but I just want to get an outside perspective. I was still a child when the story happened. My parents were divorcing and my father had been violent. As he was not looking for an apartment himself and was very demanding, he was still living with us during the divorce. One night I had the biggest fear of my life. My mother puts us to bed early, my sister and I. I still had trouble sleeping because I could hear my dad yelling insults at my mom for hours and hours. He didn't understand why she wanted to leave him. It was obvious, but narcissistic perverts usually don't recognize their mistakes. They think they are perfect. That night, it must have been almost midnight and I had just started to doze off when another scream woke me up. This time it was my mother. My sister and I got up running and found my mother crying on the stairs. My father had slapped her so hard that her head banged hard against the wall. She was yelling at him not to touch her. We immediately rushed towards her to surround her and protect her. 
I was nine years old, but I understood. After all, I'd been afraid of my own father. He always hurt us. I was afraid of him, but I refused to leave my mother with him. We took my mother to her room while my older sister prevented my father from coming up. He kept saying that she was hysterical and mad. Above all, do not admit that he was the one causing the problems. My mom struggled to calm down, but told us to get dressed quickly. When my father saw us coming down dressed to go out, he started insulting her again by asking her where she was taking us, as if she had to tell him. Afraid that he would decide to hit one of us, she just told him that she was taking us to McDonald's to clear our heads. She took her coat and puts us in the car before we drove off. She didn't take us over to the fast food business at all. She drove around town, pulling into a parking lot that I didn't even know. From there, she guided us without the car to the city center, up to a police station. It was too much. She had seen the hate in his eyes. He could have beaten her to death if we hadn't arrived. Just as we had gotten to the door of the police station, we saw my father. He was coming out of the parking lot just in front. He had been looking for us. Unfortunately, he had seen us too. We rushed inside, and seeing our panic, a policewoman took us into our office. As she closed the door, we heard my father enter the building yelling insults, asking where my mother was while calling her names, saying that she had nothing against him, that she had no right, that sort of thing. He screamed like that for almost a whole hour. I was in tears in my mother's arms. My older sister was shaking with fear. My other sister was the only one who could speak and tell the officers who stayed with us everything that had happened. After a while, he finally left. The police station suddenly became silent. Another policewoman poked her head through the door and asked if he had been drinking. But no, he never drank. He was naturally like that. The police explained to us that they had told my father to take his things and leave. They made us stay in their premises for a while to make sure he had gone while taking my mother's statement. My mother, however, still wanted to take us to a fast food restaurant before returning home. My sister absolutely wanted to get her cell phone back, which she hadn't taken due to panic. The police were all very assuring. They just asked us to call them urgently if my father came back. Then we were able to drive home. The house was silent. Everything was off. My father's car was no longer there. Relieved, my mother asked my sister to hurry up and pick up her phone while she waited in the car. She took the keys and ran towards the house, but when she opened the door, she let out a cry of terror. My mother, panicked, opened the car door to get out before seeing my father coming up in a fury towards her. She had just enough time to tuck her legs in before she slammed the door on it. She then had the reflexes to lock the doors although still worried about my sister. He was starting to scream again and insult her. He pulled the handles and hit the car. It lasted for 10 minutes before sirens interrupted my father. Two police cars and a van pulled up in front of my house. My sister had ran into her room and called the police on her cell phone. My dad still put the blame on my mom by yelling at her that she dared to call the cops, even though she had been right in front of him this whole time. The police almost jumped out of their vehicles, hands on their clubs. One of them pinned my father against the car and handcuffed him, asking why he was still there, reminding him that they asked him to leave. My dad was no longer being proud, and the only excuse he could find to say was, but I couldn't find my underpants, actually. The police stayed while he finally packed a suitcase. They waited for him to get into his car, which was hidden away, and disappear around the corner before assuring my mother that they would be going on patrol all night. My mom thanked them, and we left our neighborhood to finally go to the promised restaurant. Only, when we arrived in the neighboring street, my father's car, still hidden away, joined us on the road to follow us. What he hadn't foreseen, however, was a police van was following as well. When we arrived at the restaurant, my father finally continued straight on the main road and left town while the police made three turns around McDonald's, raising questions from all the customers. 
When we got back, we were too afraid that he would be waiting for us again, but as promised, the police came on duty all night. Needless to say, we didn't sleep that night and struggled to sleep for several weeks. I've been an insomniac since then, and today, at 28, I cannot sleep without sleeping pills. Now, this happened almost 20 years ago when I was 15 and still living back home with my grandmother and uncle. To provide some context, my grandparents had built a house together with their son, grandparents living on the ground level and their son, my uncle, living upstairs. They pretty much built their house with their bare hands and with the help of family members. So for my uncle, that meant working his 9 to 5 job, then driving to the construction site and working there until late at night. They did this for almost two years and I guess due to the stress of working non-stop, plus an ugly divorce he was going through shortly before finishing the house, he first became weird which I guess turned into some type of psychosis. He stopped going to work because everyone there was watching him. No one was allowed to open windows to let fresh air in because... Someone could break in. All the doors in the house had to be locked because otherwise, gas would enter the rooms and catch fire. Nonsense stuff like that. At the time when I was 15 years old, I had lived with him for a few years. Grandmother and uncle, grandfather had died. And even though my uncle never did anything bad, he was still eerie and I was regularly freaked out by him. For example, he had the habit of silently standing in the pitch dark hallway in the middle of the night for god knows how long. Sometimes, I would watch TV in the living room late at night, thinking everyone was already asleep. When I got tired, I would switch off the TV and open the door in the hallway and scream in terror because he would be standing directly behind the door, in the dark. This happened frequently. He always acted surprised that I got scared because in his mind he was just keeping watch. Something else he did that I absolutely hated. Sometimes, when I was sleeping in my room, he would randomly barge in to check if everything was alright. And when I say barge in, I mean that. He would rush in, almost like he was expecting something bad to be happening to me. Now that you've got the idea of his weird behavior, let me explain that one creepy night. I was laying in my bed, sleeping. Ordinary night. I don't know how late it was. But from my feeling, I would say that I slept a couple hours when I was suddenly woken up. I didn't really know what woke me. There hadn't been a noise or anything, but for some reason I woke up instantly terrified with my heart pounding, eyes wide open. My breathing was so fast and loud, so I tried to keep it down to listen. I stayed like that for a couple minutes until I convinced myself that I had just had a nightmare I couldn't recall. But then I heard something outside my bedroom in the hallway. The bedroom door was closed. It was the distinct creaking of one particular step of the stairway, the third one from the top to be exact. So naturally I thought it was my uncle following his habit of creeping around the house in the middle of the night, but a few seconds after the creaking, I heard super fast steps literally sprinting from the stairs, getting louder and louder until they suddenly came to a halt directly in front of my door. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. I just froze and held my breath, half expecting my uncle to barge in at any second. But nothing. No movement. No steps. No breathing. I thought, but it must be my uncle, and he must be standing right outside my door. Somehow, I was also convinced that it hadn't been him. I knew exactly how his footsteps sounded, since I heard them often enough. Also, the steps were unnaturally fast with a very sudden halt by my door. If a person ran that fast, it would have been impossible to come to such a sudden halt. They would have crashed into the door. Until this day, I cannot explain what happened that night and what those god-awful steps were. A lucid dream, maybe? I don't know. It still freaks me out. My mom was the youngest of seven girls. Her oldest sister is 20 years older than her, and all I knew about her was that she had a history of mental health disorders that she did not treat, 
and that my mom hadn't spoken to her since she was about 10 years old. To be honest, I didn't even know this aunt existed. One day, when my brother and I were about 67 years old, my parents sat us down. They showed us pictures of our aunt and told us that if she tries to talk to us around the neighborhood, to immediately run to the closest house and call them right away. They said that she was dangerous and to treat her as a stranger. My brother and I were so confused because it was my mom's sister, but okay. Fast forward about a year and my family is at my cousin's basketball game. This is the daughter of the aunt in the story. My aunt walked out on the family about 10 years before, so there was no reason to think that we would see her. My brother and I begged my mom to let us go get something from the snack stand. So we went over and stood in line. I felt this tap on my shoulder and turned around. It was my aunt, at least it was the woman that was in the pictures. She said, Hi little baggy of pot, I'm your aunt. I said, Hi, because I didn't want to be rude. She said the same thing to my brother, and he didn't respond. She then said, well, this line is so long, how about I take you guys out for ice cream? I didn't know what to say. This was my aunt. I can't be rude. My brother said, No, we have to go back to our mom now. She said something along the lines of, Your mom said it's okay. You're my niece and nephew. I would never hurt you. Nope, that was it for me. I said, Sorry, we have to go. I then felt a tight grip on my wrist and was being dragged with my brother for the door. I didn't yell. I don't know why. I was a kid and had a piercing scream. I just froze. I then heard, Let him go. Those are my kids. Someone get them. My mom was running full sprint across the court. I had never seen that kind of look in her eyes. People immediately grabbed her and got my brother and I away from her. Apparently, she got charged with attempted kidnapping since my mom decided to press charges. We have restraining orders against her now. I'm 23. Anyway, my cousins took my brother and I to get food, so I don't remember much of the police part besides telling them what happened. I only learned once I was older that the reason why my parents sat my brother and I down was because at the time, my aunt was blackmailing my parents into paying all of her bills phone, rent, medical, etc. She even sent pictures of my house and my brother and I, saying that she would take care of us if the money stopped. Her grabbing us at the basketball game was right when my mom and dad approached her ex-husband about the blackmailing, and he's a lawyer, so they were coming up with some kind of plan. I work as the secretary at my mom's office, and a year ago, I picked up a typical call, but it wasn't typical at all. I said, hi, this is, what can I help you with? Well, hello, it's your aunt again. Is your mom available? No, I'm sorry, can I take a message? Just tell her that I'm a free man now, and I know where she is, and where you all are. Then she hung up. I told my mom. She told me it was okay, and that I shouldn't worry. But I still worry she'll find me, or show up at any moment. Let's hope I never see my aunt again. I am a 27 year old female. At the time this occurred, I was a senior in high school, angsty and steadily into partying. For this story, I'm going to hide her identity solely due to the rules of Reddit. Let's call her Kay. Kay almost cost me my life and I never want to see her again. A little backstory on Kay. She grew up privileged, given anything she ever wanted. Her parents adopted her five cousins, and this is when she started to rebel. Her parents, well off, started to pay less attention to her, so Kay had all the freedom in the world. At the time this incident occurred, Kay was 18, and I had just turned 18. We were headed to a kickback at this guy's house, and nothing more than a little weed was expected. Now I had shared in smoking weed, popping pills here and there. I had just tried ecstasy the summer prior. However, I was planning to stay sober. Kay picked me up and we stopped to buy cigs at a gas station. I bought a fountain drink 
one with a straw and everything. This is crucial for later in the story. We arrived at the apartment and everyone is smoking including Kay, but I declined. She would always say shit about how she never wanted to be high alone. Complained about how I never got as high as her. So I obliged and I cleared the bong off her hit, not even taking a full hit. She asked me for a drink of my soda and I handed it to her. She had it for a good minute. I had my head turned talking to someone at the kickback. When I looked back at Kay, she was messing with my straw. I didn't think much of it and she handed it back to me. Within 30 minutes or so, I started to feel intensely high to the point where I needed to escape from the group. I go out front and smoke a cigarette only to find that I can't stand up. So I laid on the front porch. Then all of these dark thoughts flashed through my mind. I felt so sick like my stomach was being torn open. I couldn't stand up. I had to crawl to the bushes to throw up. I thought to myself, all of this off clearing a bong? So I laid on the porch. The apartment was located on a busy street in the city that I live in. I also thought about running into traffic because I felt like I was dying. So I gave myself two options. I could run into traffic and have a car hit me and end this horrible pain I was in. Or I can get some help. Maybe flag down someone. My mind wasn't in the right state. I knew nobody in the kickback would take me seriously and I knew something was terribly wrong. I thought about calling my mom. I must have dialed her number and hung up like five different times. Finally, I called and told her what happened and that I didn't know why I was so high. No one else was feeling the way I felt. It seemed like an eternity later, Kay came outside looking for me. As I'm puking out my guts in the bushes, she asked me if I wanted to get some food. I asked her if she was fucking serious. She laughed as I puked. What I didn't know is that my mother called my older brother to pick me up since he lived close to where I was. He showed up with a machete, ran inside and threatened people. He didn't know who gave me what. It wasn't until I got home that my brother took a look at one of my eyes and noticed how dilated my pupils were. So they rushed me to the ER, after more puking of course. My memory is a bit fuzzy. I just remember asking my sister-in-law if I was going to die and telling her that I was scared. They ended up sedating me due to the fact that I was yelling and threatening the nurses. Totally out of character for me. They did a talk screen and found MDMA, the drug found in ecstasy, along with other drugs in my system. Now this is all frightening and everything. However, what I found out a few days later shocked me to my core. Kay had been at a house party the next night. Someone there said that she was passing out free ecstasy to four different people. Of those four people, three had seizures and had to be taken to the ER by ambulance. I'm assuming whatever ecstasy she used was a bad batch. Remember when she asked me to have a drink of my soda? I assume this is when she popped a pill inside and it dissolved. She probably crushed it beforehand or something. I have no clue. But at this time of my life, I hadn't done drugs in quite a while, especially not ecstasy. Kay also went on to tell people that I had slipped her the drug and that she had to go to the hospital. She is a pathological liar and has had to go to therapy for a long time for mental disorders. All of this happened because she wanted me to get high like her. I could have committed suicide because I wasn't in the right frame of mind. It still affects me to this day. It sounds cliche, but I have a hard time trusting people with this experience and among other things. I also don't like sharing drinks with friends. I get scared when I go out to a bar or club, fearing the worst. I mean, if my own friend had done this to me, what's stopping a stranger? So I always guard my drink no matter what. So DK, let's not meet ever again. Forgive me if this is a bit scattered. This is a memory I had tried to block out for a long time. I wasn't more than nine years old when my grandmother died. My family is, to sum it up, Irish pot smoking hippies. So it wasn't much of a surprise when there's a keg a few feet down from her jar of ashes at the memorial service. 
I was basically attached to my 19 year old cousin's hip. He was always very kind and didn't mind bringing me around with him. I remember that he wanted to rent fishing gear to keep me entertained. After a while he had to leave so I was back at the deck area with all the adults, most of whom were very intoxicated at this time. My mom's been sober for a while now, but she struggled with alcohol abuse, so it wasn't a big shocker for me when she was sloppy drunk at the table. I told her I was going to play with another cousin of mine. This is where my memory is a little shaky. I tried to block it out after that day happened. He was about 16 or 17 at the time. I remember we walked around and looked at taxidermy at the little weird nature museum that was there. He stared at me a lot. I remember when we were walking towards the woods, there was a biking hiking path. He told me I needed to stay with him. He told me I was exactly the kind of girl some guy would want to fuck because I had more cushion for the pushing. I was young, but I knew what he was saying wasn't right. There was something about him and the way that he tried to hold me close to him. That scared me. We were probably 30 yards into the trail when I realized I needed to get away from him. I pretended to look at something on the ground and let him get a few feet away from me, then I took off. I ran as fast as I could, even though I could hear him yelling at me and chasing me. When I got back, my mom was close to passing out, but I stayed with her and my aunts. They made up some lame lie because they asked why I came running he told them that I saw a snake and it scared me. I'm 16 now and I thought that I was past all of this. Last month, I kept on having recurring nightmares about his face and him chasing me. I told my mom about it for the first time and she held me while I was having a panic attack. I don't know what would have happened, but no matter what anyone says, I know it wouldn't have been good. So this happened a few months ago. I'm a sophomore in college and was traveling down to my hometown over break. I was having some relationship issues with my stepmom, so I didn't want to stay at my dad's house the night I arrived at my hometown. I phoned a friend of mine from high school and asked if I could stay at his place. I knew from social media that he was still in town and I've stayed at his place before, so I knew there would be a place for me to stay if they could allow it. My friend, let's call him Zach, seemed like a pretty normal dude. We weren't best friends or anything, but we had gotten pretty close by the time we graduated. We would occasionally text or hang out if I was in town, catch up, reminisce on times we spent in orchestra or in English class. When I called, he seemed extremely enthusiastic. Zach is normally an upbeat guy, but this time it seemed like he was getting a brand new car. I didn't think about it at the time, and he said I could sleep in his guest room, so I headed over. When I got to his house, he was just as excited as he was on the phone. He was bringing up stuff to do, like get high and watch weird movies or play video games. Zach's parents weren't home, so he really wanted the opportunity to smoke. I was pretty tired from the drive, but since we rarely see each other, I thought a little bit of bonding couldn't hurt. We'd play Smash Bros, smoke some weed, and just chatted for a few hours. It was longer than I wanted, but I was having fun, so whatever, right? By this time, it was getting late, around 2am, and he started asking me some pretty weird questions. Like if I ever wondered what it would be like to kill someone, or if I thought anyone would miss me if I was gone. This, along with some pretty normal questions like, if I had a boyfriend, or how my parents are doing, if I'm making any friends in school, it just gave me a weird feeling. But it didn't hit me until after that Zach could be assessing me for something bad. The weirdness of it all made me just want to go to bed. We stopped the game and both went into the basement where his room and the guest room were. We say goodnight, I go into my room and get ready for bed. I'm having trouble sleeping, just insomnia that I've had for a while. So I stay awake for around an hour until I hear some movement outside my room. The walls were pretty thin, so I could hear his footsteps walking past the door, up the stairs, to the main floor, then back down quickly after. What struck me as odd is that I didn't hear the basement door open, which creaks when it does. 
The lights didn't turn on, so I was confused what Zack was doing. I heard him go back into his room, but I had this odd feeling. Just ever since I met him that night, he seemed a lot different than he's ever been. I decided to look him up on social media and Google to see if there was anything out of the ordinary. Everything seemed normal until I found his Tumblr. His Tumblr was very disturbing. There were graphic drawings of mutilated bodies of humans and animals, links to suspicious looking websites that I didn't dare click, text posts, stories about murdering, cannibalism, necrophilia, and torture. There are photos of guns, knives, and axes, which after looking closely at, were taken from his bedroom. The last post, around a week prior, was a post from the account saying, I wish that I could find someone easy to kill, like a homeless person. I was immediately filled with dread. I knew that he was going to do something. He must have gone upstairs to lock the door. I packed up my things. Luckily, I packed lightly. I opened the small window to the top of the bedroom wall. I started desperately climbing through it, and as I was pulling my leg through, he opened the door. It was dark, but the streetlights illuminated enough for me to see that he was carrying something. It was long and shiny, so probably a knife. He didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. I just turned around, hopped in my car, and drove off as fast as I could to my dad's house. I immediately blocked him everywhere and reported his Tumblr account, not before telling the police. They said they couldn't do anything as the guns were registered under his dad and he hasn't actually done anything yet. Nevertheless, I told my other high school friends not to hang out with Zach. Ever since then, I've been creeped out whenever I meet new people. Just the fact that I knew someone so well could be a person that wanted to hurt me so bad who could kill me. I don't know what you're doing now, Zach. I'm not sure I want to know, but I hope you're getting help. Anyways, let's not meet again. I had a very creepy friend. We'll call him Ben. I believe he might be a dangerous psychopath, or at worst, a serial killer. Ben and I met on Facebook in 2014 and he came to meet me in Romania in the summer of 2015. He seemed a bit odd, but otherwise okay. One strange thing about him is that while he was at my house for a week, he didn't bathe for some odd reason, so he stank. Anyways, I show him around Transylvania. We hang out in a few cities before he leaves. Our friendship continues online, and in 2016, I moved back to Canada in May of that year, I fly over to Vancouver to hang out with him. Now, it's important to know, this guy is a major gun nut. He collects a lot of firearms and claims to have briefly been in the Canadian Army. He also claimed he worked as a mercenary and was in Georgia during the Russian invasion in 2008. He claimed he shot two people there and also suffers from PTSD. I get there and his apartment is filthy. I'm talking trash everywhere. Two cats that made the place stink of cat piss. This guy kept his lights on 24-7 and on his wall was a clock that played a loud tune every hour. His behavior towards me while I was there was somewhat disrespectful, but I just took it as a buddy messing around with me. He said mildly creepy things, but again I brushed it off as him being a prankster. I leave and again our friendship continues online. During this time, his conversations with me become darker and more hostile in a passive-aggressive sort of way. Ben is also a hardcore alcoholic who drinks until he passes out. He does all sorts of antisocial and downright vile things while drunk. Also during this time, 2016-2017 period, he said that two men briefly lived with him for a short time. When I pressed him about what happened to those two men who had lived with him, he changed the subject quickly. After what happened in 2018, when I last met up with Ben, gave me a strong suspicion something bad might have happened to them. So fast forward to 2018, and me and my parents are driving to Vancouver from Calgary. Perfect time to meet up for a day or two with Ben. 
big mistake, and we met up at a bar near his house. We have a few drinks and he goes home for the night. The next day we meet up and his behavior towards me is disrespectful in a passive aggressive way and extremely creepy and he's very subtly disrespecting me to all his co-workers. He's putting me on the spot and trying to make me look stupid to everyone around. He was a supervisor so no one was going to say anything. This man is obviously a psychopath. This is where it gets to the point where I believe my life is in danger. We go back to his place. He's drinking a beer and rolling a joint. A movie is playing and Ben is getting tipsy. He's basically now adopted a speech pattern in our conversation where I feel as though I'm being interrogated or toyed with. He's playing a video game on his computer. I'm watching a movie. By this time I'm feeling very uneasy. My gut instinct is telling me to leave. Generally speaking, you always listen to your gut instinct. That primal thing inside of you that's linked to fight or flight is best to be obeyed. Now as the day progressed and as Ben was becoming drunk, he starts saying very weird things. He was mumbling about, I don't care for anyone but myself. I don't give a shit about people. There's a loaded shotgun beside the table. He looks at his computer screen and starts mumbling about being a madman with a gun. A few minutes later, he turns to me and says, Hey, what if I put some MDMA in your drink? Followed by, Haha, I'm just kidding. The cat and mouse game continues. He's now talking about knowing a guy who is HIV positive and how he's going to get that guy to give him an infected needle to inject himself with HIV so he can live off government benefits for the rest of his life. This guy is fucking unhinged. I'm sitting there in disbelief at how vile this guy really is. I want to leave, but I also don't want him to know that I'm ready to go. It's an awful, vulnerable feeling. He has another beer and turns to me. I'm now feeling very uncomfortable. The talk is now about food. He turns and looks at me straight in the face and asks, So, if it was your last meal, what would you have? He had a stone-faced look mixed with a little bit of malice. I knew I had to flee. My heart was pounding. I needed to make my move. With adrenaline rushing through my body, I tell Ben in a very calm manner that the weed I had is making me feel funny and I need to get a bit of fresh air. I quickly put on my shoes and leave before he has any chance to stop me. He makes me promise I'll be back. I go downstairs into the sunlight. I feel like an animal that just escaped slaughter. The place I'm staying is not too far from Ben's house. I'm wise enough to not have told him where I'm staying exactly. I start walking feeling like I just escaped certain death. The phone rings. Ben is asking me where I am and that he's panicking. I tell him I'm taking a breather. Meanwhile I get to my cousin's house. I somehow manage to get inside. Night has fallen. The guy is calling my phone constantly. When I answer he's trying to get me to meet up with him and go for a ride. The tone of his voice was flat and fake. He says, We just had a bad night. He's desperately trying to get me to go for a ride with him. I block his number. I block him on social media. That was the last time I spoke to that scumbag. In my many online conversations over the years, Ben would drop clues here and there about his past. They did horrible things during his supposed gig as a mercenary. He would go on drunken tirades about bad man having done bad things. Deep down, I think he is a psychopath, a potentially dangerous one at that, and I just hope he never murdered anyone, other than the two people he allegedly shot while in combat duty. Vancouver is a sketchy place full of missing people. I guess we'll never know. When I was seven years old, my mom and father got divorced. This event prompted her to move and follow her career in a different small town, which would pay better, as she was now a single parent. On our long 12-hour drive to the new location, we stopped on the way in this little town, which is very hippie, with lots of art and little shops. My mom said that we were going to meet up with her friend, Paulette. 
I guess they went way back in her college days and recently got in touch after a decade. We end up going to this East Indian restaurant where we would meet for dinner. This slender, somewhat fragile woman walks in. She was very tall, over six feet, big frizzy, curly brown hair with blonde streaks in it. She was Caucasian, wearing a colorful shawl with feather earrings and with very pale blue eyes. She looked like a mosaic tapestry or something. She walks over to the table and gives my mom a big greeting and a big hug, makes her way over to my older brother and shakes his hand. After that, she comes around to my side of the table. I let my hand out to her and she just stood there expressionless with her mouth partly open with a blank gaze just staring at me. It briefly made me uncomfortable and then a flick of a switch, the spark ignites in her face. She makes a huge cat smile, kneels over and hugs me tightly. She goes back to sit with my mom and they catch up while we eat dinner. My mom gets the bill and says to her in the parking lot, you can just follow us. We get in the car and my mom explains to us that she is actually coming over to live with us for a while. She followed us for the next several hours. We get to our new place and unpack our necessities. As we had a moving truck hired for the rest of the stuff, arriving in the morning. There is a bunk bed already set up at this place for me and my brother. It is fairly late into the night, roughly 11pm when we arrived. My brother and I set up sleeping bags. I take the top bunk. My mom says goodnight and I fall asleep pretty quickly. I wake up around 1.30 a.m. I guess the patio deck light got turned on, which was right beside our bedroom. I gazed out the blinders and I could see the back of Paulette's curly hair. She was sitting on the deck, cross-legged, smoking a cigarette. I didn't think much of it and laid back down until I noticed the light from the window gets partially blocked. I look behind me with my head still on the pillow. I see the unmistakable outline of Paulette's shadow facing my window. She was there for a few minutes. I didn't want to lean up, I just pretended to sleep. Her shadow moves and I hear the front door close. The patio light turns off after a few minutes. I reposition myself facing the wall to go back to sleep. As I begin to drift off, the door in my room opens, slowly and I quickly turn my head around. It wasn't my mom, it was Paulette wearing a nightgown. I turn back to face the wall and close my eyes. She gently makes her way to my bunk. I feel her fingers and claw formation start to comb the back of my hair, running her nails on the back of my scalp. I keep my eyes closed tightly, nearly holding my breath, trying not to give a sign that I'm awake. I smell some essential oils like lavender and she starts rubbing oil on the back of my neck and pinching the back of my neck muscles, sometimes holding it and releasing. I began to kind of accept what's happening because it didn't feel all that bad after a while. I actually ended up falling asleep after my initial confusion. I wake up in the morning. My mom is off at work and Paulette is waiting at the table with cereal for me and my brother. She puts some chocolate chips in my bowl and not my brother's. My brother and I make small talk. She was very giggly and seemed to be trying to make us feel comfortable with the new situation. My brother heads back to his room to set up his GameCube after his cereal. I was a slower eater than my brother, so I always was the last at the table. As slowly as I ate, she was sitting there watching my every move. Once I finished, I said, thank you, and grabbed my bowl to bring it to the sink. She places her hand on mine and says, I gave you a neck massage so you wouldn't pee your bed. I know a lot of younger ones pee their bed when they sleep in unfamiliar surroundings. I looked up at her and said, I've never peed my bed before, but thank you. She continued to massage the back of my neck for the next few nights. I ended up telling her that I'm comfortable here and there's no need for you to do this anymore. She reacted to that with a sigh, but acknowledged it. I started elementary school the following week, which meant going to bed earlier, around 8pm. Her and my mom would stay up much later than my brother and I to drink wine. I always waited for them to go to bed before I used the washroom at night to go pee, because my mom would kind of scold me for being up so late on weeknights. 
Once things got quiet around 11, I'd sneak out and tippy-toe to the washroom. This was my ritual for the next few weeks until Paulette started doing the same exact thing at the same time, every time. Every night when I used the washroom, it just so happened that Paulette needed to use it too and she would blaze down the hallway across my room when I opened my door. I'd go back into my room and wait for her. It started happening so frequently that I would just go outside to pee from the back mudroom door. This started to piss me off, no pun intended. I'd open my door as quietly as I could and then sprint to the washroom. This seemed to be effective for a while. One night, I get up slightly later than usual, around midnight. I was a little more careless with the noise because I was half asleep. I open the door and Paulette's door opens instantly. She barges out into the dimly moonlit hallway, completely naked, and starts walking quickly down the hallway. I was already so far down the hallway, I couldn't turn back to my room. I jumped behind my mom's jade plant and squished my knees to my chest and tucked my head down. She whizzes straight by me, so fast I felt the wind push my hair. She stays in the washroom for almost an hour, with the door opened a crack, lights off, in silence. I stayed there beside the washroom, tucked in the corner beside the plant, not making a sound. I hear the washroom door open completely, and she starts pacing up and down the hallway. I kept small behind the plant until she goes back into her room. I brush this off as a complete accident. It was just unfortunate timing. But now, every night going forward, she would literally sprint down the hall, naked, if I made a single noise, creak the floorboard, or open my door. About two months into this, my brother and I were sword fighting with tree branches outside. He ends up clipping my forehead, causing it to bleed pretty bad. Paulette sees it happen. She walks up to my brother for what I thought would be to scold him. But no, she stomp kicks him in the head with her boot, causing him to fall back on his back. He gets up off the ground crying and runs into the house. She grabs me and starts cradling me, rocking me back and forth. She's shaking so much that she's vibrating, repeatedly asking me, are you hurt? In a shaky voice. Anyway, my mom finds out through my brother what happened and decides that she needs to leave. Her final day, she made a point to see me one-on-one -on -one in the driveway before entering her car. She knelt down and said, I hope I could see you in a different life. You remind me so much of my husband. Goodbye. And starts bawling her eyes out, hugging me. I asked my mother who her husband was. I guess he was a Marine who died in Afghanistan a few months prior to her moving in with us. My mom said she would frequently say how much I reminded her of him on a daily basis. My mom hasn't spoke to her since. I never told my mom about the massages or anything to this day as she was already exiled and I felt that it would just cause more drama. My best friend and I grew up in a sleepy wannabe New Jersey Central Florida town and were outcasts. We met in 6th grade when I overheard her talking to another classmate about Bionicles, my 11 year old self's passion. We became fast friends and soon were inseparable. Soon began the gauntlets of sleepovers, birthday parties, and family gatherings. We were practically siblings. She was the first person I came out to as bisexual. As in turn, I was the first person she told about being trans. Her home life was tumultuous, though I can't say mine was any better. We often had a habit of taking refuge at each other's houses. Like I said, we became like siblings. Her father was an alcoholic, strict, and prone to physical discipline. Her sister was a stuck-up girl who soon gravitated towards the hicks and jocks when we entered high school and her mother was a pseudo-vegan hippie love child held over from the 80s. When I was 23, and she was 22 at the time, we had another long night sleepover in order to let her escape yet another fight with her mother. She had recently lost her job at Walmart, and I was going into my first shift at Taco Bell the next day. On the drive home the next morning, she excitedly told me that since she now has her own car, she would be applying to pizza places that were in need for a driver. I was proud, 
It was the first time she had hunted a job on her own, as I'd usually been the one to coax her into applying where I was working. Not that she ever lasted very long. My first day of training goes quite well. My coworkers are friendly and try to get me to talk more. My manager likes to playfully embarrass me by trying to get me to talk hood to the other coworkers. Being a training day, it wasn't a very long shift, but I had been up pretty early in anticipation and this was my first day on a job in a few months. I got home around noon and informed some of my internet friends that my first day went well and around 5 p.m. I start to go to bed, drained from a good day. As I'm preparing to lay in my bed, I get a steam message, her lamenting another fight with her mother, asking if she could come over. Now, I had started to grow a bit weary of their fights on their end. I had began to repair my relationship with my family and a few friends, and I had given her advice many times on how to better approach things. In my infinite wisdom and eagerness to sleep, I left the message unread and drifted off to slumber. Around 8 p.m., I am awakened by her bursting into my room in panic. Having just been ripped from a dream, I am groggy and disoriented. I drag myself into the bathroom to relieve my bladder and come back to my room to find her rocking back and forth on my bed. It is at this time that I notice that she is covered in blood, so I ask her what happened. She informs me that she just saw someone murder her mother with a knife. My mind goes blank. In the deepest part of my mind, alarm bells are ringing. Isn't the rocking back and forth a little bit overdramatic? Why didn't she call the police? But this is my best friend. I've known her for over a decade, and we were the only two people in the world we could count on. I suppress these feelings and go to inform my sister and stepfather. My mother had passed away a year prior, and it was roughly a month to the anniversary of her death. We were all in a dark place, antisocial as always. It was the only way we knew how to handle emotional issues. When I inform my family, they immediately go to the same place I did, though they were far more vocal about it. I offer excuses I know myself were flimsy and return to my room, phone in hand. I convince her to call the police and I can hear the explanation and details over the phone. A man in the black ski mask. When the cops arrive, she swears up and down that it was most likely her father. They send cars over to check the crime scene and take her statement. I ride with her in back of the cop car over to the sheriff's office. It gets to be around 2 a.m. Her sister was brought in, as was her father. I have work the next morning and request to be taken home by an officer. It takes me a while to get to sleep. The next day at work, I'm quiet until my manager asks me what has happened. I inform him, but decide to work the rest of my training shift. When I get home, my sister informs me that she had confessed. Her mom had threatened to kick her out for not being able to find a job and she enraged had taken a kitchen knife and stabbed her repeatedly. My mind froze like a bad computer and I turned my face to the monitor. I was in a discord call at the time and all I could weakly say was, my best friend just confessed to murdering her mother before hanging up and laying down on my bed. Her trial started on the 7th of this month. I don't know the results, though my grandmother tells me that she took a plea deal for life in prison rather than the death penalty. Part of me wants to contest that, to demand that they take the death penalty for ridding this earth of such a peaceful and caring woman. A larger part of me was just glad that she was being punished. Natalie, you are my best friend, my sister, my platonic soulmate, but please, let's never meet again. I'll start with some brief context. I lived with an abusive male partner who didn't value my safety whatsoever. He would get really mad if I didn't leave the door unlocked and we lived in a not so great part of town. He was way older than me. I was barely 18 at the time and he was 26. Neither of us owned a car. He worked at a Waffle House and I was getting sick constantly so keeping a job wasn't easy for me. He liked drugs and alcohol and he traumatized me in regards to both blamed me for his usage, and would assault me while on it. When I finally got the courage to leave for the last time, I did it while he was at work. I begged my mom to help me get my necessities, 
stuff with emotional value and some clothes. Instead, she called the cops. There was a warrant out for his arrest and she got a police escort just in case. As soon as he got out, he immediately started messaging me from different new numbers threatening to murder me and my family if I didn't go home with him. It didn't matter how much I blocked him, he kept at it. I was scared, but I thought for the most part I was safe. After all, he didn't have a car. I was wrong. About a week into this, he and his gun-owning friend showed up. He banged on the door and was screaming. His friend owning a gun is important because he repeatedly said that he and said friend would shoot us. My window was on the second floor facing the street and my stomach dropped when he saw me. I immediately dropped and army crawled to my little brother's room and hid in the closet. His window was facing the backyard. I guess my monkey brain felt safer there. I was the only one home and was scared that if I breathed too loud, he would hear me. I was terrified. I didn't want to call the police because I thought that he would hear that too, so I silently texted my mom. The police arrived about 20 minutes after my mom said that they were on their way. He and his friend were taken into custody after the same friend had gotten him, gotten him out on bond. Friend did have a gun. He didn't. Bottom line, I was able to get a restraining order. I am strictly sober and definitely in therapy after that. This is my first reddit post and it's going to be heavy. It contains mention of physical and mental abuse. So this is a trigger warning for everyone. I'm an 18 year old female. I met my ex male 22 in February of 2020 but didn't end up dating him until I was closer to my 17th birthday because he still lived with his girlfriend. He told me that they were just friends and he didn't like her like that and I didn't find out till later that they were actually still doing things together and meeting him was the biggest mistake of my life. Everything started off great as every relationship goes. I sent pics because he was my boyfriend, so you know. And of course, I let him save them for later use. Another big mistake. I noticed that they were still texting and went through his phone and he was saying that he still loved her and missed her. I was deeply hurt and called him out on it. He apologized and said that it would never happen again. I told him to text her that we were dating, and he did. She was pissed. She stopped paying for the house and helping him pay his car payments. And at this time, he had quit his job at Taco Bell and refused to do his new job Ubering because I need to practice League of Legends because I want to be a pro league streamer. So I worked my ass off and ended up losing my job because the manager didn't let me work without a doctor's note. So I was stuck working his job while he played games. Before I met him, I had 4000 in my savings. He ended up using my card to pay his phone bills, car payments, the apartment, daily weed, fast food, new league accounts, and fucking CSGO knives. He kept losing his accounts due to telling people to off themselves and using F and N slurs, but the worst was yet to happen. I found out that he was using an old tablet to excessively watch porn, set up dating accounts, and have different Instagram accounts. But on these accounts, he was pretending to be a woman. I called him out on this and told him I wanted to leave. He freaks out, jumping around and screaming and crying, saying that he would change, and I trusted him. As time went on, things got worse and I was scared to leave and by the end of this, you'll see why. He had shoved me into the wall and got into my face screaming, You stole my car keys because you don't want me to work, because you're jealous of other girls. Which was stupid because he had thrown his keys at me during a different argument. But one day I went through his iPad and found that he was actively not just sending but selling my pictures from when I was 16 and 17 and he was doing the same with his other ex. I started to try to get my stuff together and put Gorilla Glue in his charging port to get rid of that filth I just saw. When he found out that it no longer charged, he was livid. He started screaming and getting in my face. I tried to go around him and grab my things, but when my back was turned, he pulled me down to the ground, wrestled me until he was able to put me in a chokehold. I was sobbing and just accepting that this was gonna be the end 
but before I blacked out, he let me go, and I started gasping for air and gagging from the excessive coughing. He just stood over me and laughed at me. I tried to crawl away, but he grabbed my leg and started dragging me out of the apartment. I kicked, trying to get him off of me, which just made him pull me like a dog playing tug of war. He eventually dragged me out, keeping my wallet, keys, and all my valuables. So I just sat there begging for my stuff so I could leave and just go home. He came outside and pulled me down the apartment stairs by my leg and I was left with extreme bruising and some cuts. I did end up calling the police, but they did absolutely nothing. Fast forward, he had to move because he had nowhere to stay or live after being evicted from the apartment and I had gotten a new job. One day it was particularly cold and I went to get a shirt out of my car and there he was. He was sitting in my car on his phone. I had left my door unlocked because I work in a good area. I called him a cheater and told him to leave. He got out of the car and was starting to go around the back. So I jumped in and tried to lock the door from the back seat. He ran over and pulled the door open and started trying to pull me out of the car. I started screaming and kicking him. Thankfully, a customer saw this happening and called the police. They arrested him and told me to go home for the night, which they ended up firing me for. Unfortunately, he got bailed out and while he was in jail, he had given out my phone number to other people there. He walked four and a half hours to my house after he was released and he was looking around my backyard when my neighbor saw him and called my dad. My dad got in his truck with his gun and waited for him to come out of the gas station. He eventually did but ran off. He harassed me, saying that he was going to show up to my graduation and ruin everything, and has gotten to the point of making multiple fake accounts on Snapchat, Instagram, and TikTok pretending to be me and his other ex. And as of today, January 1st, 2023, he still pretends to be high school girls selling our pictures and making fake accounts. I'm a 35 year old female, my ex friend, 36 male, let's call him Will. I met him early in middle school through a mutual friend. I always kind of got a feeling that he liked me, but we were never super close and he never made any kind of actions, so I let it go. Fast forward to a few years ago, we bonded over our love of watching professional hockey games. I moved to the city for college and he remained in our hometown four hours away. In the meantime, he married a very nice woman who I've met a few times and even brought her to the city for one of our periodic visits. Sometimes in the summer, we would go to baseball games. One year, we traveled to a neighboring city to go to an on-the-road hockey game. The city was two hours from my house, so we came there. We drove, watched the game, saw the sights, and drove back to my house later that night. He crashed on my couch and left the next morning. Here's where it takes a turn. I let Will know that I could take over driving if he ever got tired. He later told me that there was a couple times where it got dicey out there, but he didn't say anything at the time and drove the whole way. He also tailgated constantly. Needless to say, I felt unsafe in his car. A few days later, I posted a pot of chili I made on Instagram. He told me through three different mediums, Facebook, Insta, and text, that he would love to come over for dinner and could be there ASAP. Keep in mind, it's a four hour drive between our houses. That coupled with the fact that I knew he was having marital problems. His wife had been in a traumatic car accident before they met and she was still struggling with health issues, so sometimes she can't fully engage. And that I've always had a feeling that he liked me made me uncomfortable enough to ask for some space. Surprise, surprise, he didn't respect my boundary I posted on Facebook warning our friends about his behavior and blocked him, told him not to text or contact me again. I have since moved and he has no idea where I live. I made it clear to friends not to tell him and they've all understood and said that they've noticed some erratic behavior from him. Fast forward another few years. Out of the blue, he tags me in a year in review post in which he took a photo of him burning the book I wrote from a brand new username that I never known about, thus I didn't have blocked. I blocked this one and posted another message to my friends who offered a lot of great help and advice. 
Since he hasn't made overt threats or physically stalked me, I can't legally do anything. But joke's on him. He already paid me for the book, and hundreds of the physical copies still live in the world, as well as the master docs on mine and my publisher's computers. For some context, I've been friends with this guy for a little over three years. When I first met him, I thought he was hilarious, kind, intelligent, and overall, a really interesting person. Everyone thought that of him, and they still do. He's loved by his peers and a very well-known member of our community. This is important later. We didn't become best friends till a few months into our friendship. One day we were joking around and we had a general connection with each other. I never had such a good time with someone before. It's one of those moments when you're with someone and you slightly laugh and can't breathe. It was fun. When I first met him, his ex-girlfriend warned me about him. I was pretty close to her, but I still couldn't believe anything she said about him. I just assumed that she was a vengeful ex. She claimed that he went far past her sexual boundaries, was cruel to her at times, and one time attempted to drown her. She said that they went swimming and he put all of his weight on top of her and kept holding her under the water. Once she came up, he would do it again and again. They broke up after that. I ignored this, as I said earlier, chalked it up to her having an extreme dislike for him. One day, he brags to me about how he got away with relentlessly bullying this kid in high school. He tried to talk him into suicide, but the kid would only go as far as to cut himself, so he gave up after getting bored. He thought this was hilarious, and he was laughing while telling me about it. I was very disturbed by this, and I'd never seen him act so cruel before. Another time, we went hiking. This was his idea. The trail we were on was very popular, so there were a lot of people there. This one woman stood out to him, I guess, because he kept commenting on how gorgeous she was. She was with this man, who I guess was her boyfriend or husband, and I just thought how the whole thing was strange. Afterwards, we went out to eat inside of this plaza, and he guided the conversation to the topic of sex. We slowly opened up about what we liked, and it was pretty normal until he brought up his true interests. He said he fantasized about kidnapping, raping, and murdering a girl. He told me in detail how he basically wanted to torture some lady and commit necrophilia along with other fucked up stuff. Once we got done eating, he kept joking about going back to that girl and doing that all to her. He brought it up numerous times throughout the day and it was apparent he wasn't joking. It was more of a suggestion at that point. I distanced myself from him after that and we kind of drifted apart as we had got separate jobs and we didn't see each other much. I went to this party one night and guess who was there? The Creepo. At the beginning, I mentioned how everyone loves him. He is an active member of the community and goes to church. Plus, his new occupation adds to the facade. He started talking to me and he seemed normal per usual. I thought he changed because of how convincing he was. I'm sure you think you could tell, but I'm telling you, this guy could easily fool you. He told me how he joined the local PD. Yep. He's now a cop, and I was shocked by this. He always mentioned wanting to join law enforcement and would never say he had bad intentions. Maybe he was genuine about helping people, or maybe it was just a cover. Who knows, but either way, he shouldn't have that authority. We started talking again, and we hung out a few times. He seemed completely normal and kind, so I assumed that everything was alright, until he mentioned his cousin's death and talked about him so coldly, it doesn't seem to feel sad about it at all. He also spoke of his current girlfriend in a detached manner. During our friendship, he told me how he abused dogs and killed others when he was younger, and recently he bragged about kidnapping a sex worker and scaring her. Anytime I asked about what he meant by scaring her, he became hostile and refused to go into further detail. He'd always loved going into detail, so I'm curious about why he isn't about this all of a sudden. 
On New Year's, we went to a bar and he nearly killed a guy. He literally beat the guy till he was choking on his own blood and didn't stop until I said the poor guy could die. I tried stopping him physically, but he's a lot stronger than I am. He turned around with this blank expression on his face and casually went back into conversation. I reported him to the police anonymously, but I haven't heard anything back from them. I'm convinced he's a psychopath or something along those lines. Update. I contacted the FBI in my state and they said that they were going to look into it. After the conversation, I have high hopes that this will be resolved. It sounded promising. I have more stories about the horrible shit that he's done, if anyone's interested. I've also received a lot of comments asking how I ignored the red flags for so long, and I don't have an answer for that. It was stupid for me to believe everything he said, and I should have listened to my friend, his ex. So when I moved where I live now, I was like 10. One of my first friends I made quickly, and they became my best friend. We did everything together for years. We were never apart. While in middle school, I started staying over at her house a lot since my parents were getting a divorce. So my friend's family had a hot tub in the backyard, and her family always had friends over and would drink and hang out in the backyard. So on those nights, my friend and I weren't allowed downstairs. We had to stay in her room, which was fine with us. My friend always acted strange about it when we would go downstairs to get something to eat or drink and hurry back upstairs. There was a few times I had seen outside and noticed that her dad was all over other women and her mom was all over other men and most of them were completely nude. I just blew it off like whatever. Everyone was different and obviously I learned very fast that they were nudists and swingers. Every weekend they had parties in their backyard I didn't care. Everyone likes to be naked. Well, once we went into high school, we started using the hot tub when no one else was over. And one time, her dad came home from work and she started freaking out, hurrying to get out and telling me to hurry up and wrap up in a towel and act like we weren't in it. So we did, and her dad caught us. He was pissed, but I didn't get why. Well, he told us that we could use it when we wanted to, but we couldn't get in with anything on, not even a bathing suit. I found that weird, but was like, okay, whatever, and asked my friend why we had to be naked in the hot tub. She told me that it will mess with the chlorine and stuff if we wore stuff. Alright, I'm a dumb teenage girl who just wanted to lay in the hot tub. There are so many times that I had seen her dad sitting in the kitchen looking out the window at us at random times. I figured he was just making sure that we weren't being dumb or going to hurt anything. Well, one day we were in a hot tub while no one was home. Her dad got off work early that night and so he came outside completely naked and got in the hot tub with us inches away from me. I freaked out so bad that I went home and didn't go to their house again. I never told my parents or anything as I'm already dealing with a divorce and being upset with my mom wanting my siblings and not me, leaving me with my dad while he was going through a very extreme manic episode. I stayed friends with the girl and she always stayed at my house with me, but things got bad. She told me her brother was touching her and that she didn't like it and her dad was abusive. I witnessed him try to legit bite her thumb off. She ran away and was put into foster care for two years. She told everyone that she had made everything up so that she could go back home with her family instead of living going house to house constantly. She lived with her parents until she graduated and then she moved away across the country. I don't blame her. I still feel bad for everything she went through. But anyway, my ex-friend's weird ass dad. Let's not ever meet again. This wasn't a scary encounter, but it was one of my most frightening moments. When I was five and my brother was nine, my mom, after divorcing my father, got into a relationship with this man named Mike. At first, she didn't tell us that they were dating and just said that he was a good friend of hers, so Mike would come and visit us daily. 
Soon after, we found out that they were dating because my brother caught them making out on the couch and he came to wake me up to show me. After my mom got caught by us, she started tearing up saying that she didn't want us to be mad at her because she found a man after weeks of divorcing my dad. Of course, we tried to understand, but again, we were kids, so we barely had a clue on what was happening. Way too many emotions happening at once for a kid me and my brother's age to understand. After about a month, he started to move in with us, slowly but surely. That's when we started seeing something off about him. He was already in a relationship with another woman and had a daughter with her, but yet he was also seeing my mom at the time. My mom also knew that he was with someone else and had a child. Mike's daughter would sometimes come over every two weeks to spend time with her dad and me since we were friends. She was about a year or so younger than me. Anyways, so Mike over a couple of months started to give up on everything and just depend on my mom to do everything, like quitting his job, getting drunk every night, etc. He was also allergic to cats and we had a cat named Romeo at the time. Romeo wasn't the kind of cat that loved attention, more like he was just interested in sleeping and eating, like most cats. But every time Mike saw Romeo, he yelled at him even if Mike was the one to approach Romeo. When I mean yell at him, I mean full on threaten to shoot the cat just cause of his existence. Mike would also make me and my brother clean up his beer cans all over the table and throw his cigarettes away. Obviously, you could tell that this dude was pretty much drunk 24 seven, which was a red flag, especially when you're living with kids. Sometimes I would hear yelling and screaming at night from him, yelling at my mother. I have an imprinted image in my mind of my mom cowering on the ground with fear and him standing up, leaning over her, screaming. He never hit her or anything, just screaming some fake BS that wasn't even a big deal to be yelling about. Well, after a while, we got tired of his shit and my mom got back together with my dad and we moved out when Mike was out somewhere at a bar around two blocks down. So we packed our stuff and left, which when he came home at some point, there was nothing in the house, but probably silverware and toilet paper because we were nice enough to leave some. Well, after we moved out, my mom noticed his truck always behind her car when we were going somewhere. He even came onto our property at night to peep through my mom's bedroom window to see if my father was home, which most of the time at night he wasn't because he was a nurse who worked the night shift. Sometimes I would even see his car parked in the middle of the road that we lived on and he would walk up to our house and peep through my window as well to see if I was up. I had night terrors as a kid and most nights I would be afraid to go to sleep. We never saw him after we got the police to follow behind us to see if he was following us and arrest him for stalking. He did ruin some stuff for me that I see on a daily basis like storage units. He had one of those and now every time I see them, it just gives me flashbacks of when me and him were in the car and we went to his storage unit. He got his old Wii out and let me borrow it. I do miss him when he was a good person and was nice to us, but I guess people change. I'm 18 and my ex-boyfriend is 23. We did it for three months and then two months ago, I decided we weren't compatible for various reasons. A major one of which was that he didn't respect my religious beliefs. I'm a Christian and the main part he didn't understand was that I wouldn't sleep with him before marriage. Our relationship seemed good, although it was my first relationship, so I didn't have a lot to base it off of, but he seemed like a good person. Our breakup was amicable enough and he wanted to stay friends which pretty much consisted of small talk via texting, meeting up occasionally, etc. More like acquaintances than real friends, I suppose. But the point is, we didn't have a falling out and there weren't any particular red flags before about two weeks ago when we had a bit of an argument. It was a Sunday, so I went to church as usual and to my surprise, he came to meet me afterwards. We set off walking back to my house and he rolled his eyes at me and said something along the lines of, 
I can't believe someone like you would buy into rubbish like that. Honestly, even if he was joking, the fact that he wasn't even making an effort to tolerate my beliefs, but she could have said nothing about them. It bugged me a little, and I told him so. His response? Yeah, well, I'm not going to like it if it's the reason why I haven't stuck my dick in you yet. I wasn't at all prepared for him to say that, and I was just shocked and disgusted that he was being like this after we had tried to have a normal friendship, so I just walked away from him. I couldn't think of anything to say, so I just sped up and walked away. He caught up with me and tried to put his arm around me, telling me to be honest, because he knew I wanted him. I pretty much shoved him off and ran the rest of the way back home. Almost straight afterwards, he texted me an apology, which I ignored for a while, as I was trying to calm down. Then replied to with, fine, just please don't say things like that in the future. And I generally believed that he wouldn't. A little dumb, I know. But he had always seemed so pleasant before. His apology seemed genuine and, I'll confess, I may have had a soft touch where he was concerned, seeing as I cared about him and had regretted breaking up with him a few times since we broke up. Anyway, things settled back down and were normal for about three days. Then he messaged me saying that he still wanted me. Before I could reply, he sent an apology and I reaffirmed that I only wanted to be friends with him now. That's when he decided to flip the crazy switch on me. I received a string of texts telling me that a platonic relationship wasn't going to work. We should be friends with benefits because he had to have sex with me at some point, which was promptly followed by a request to meet up. I thought of the best response to that level of sudden weirdness that caught me off guard was no response at all, which is usually a pretty clear no if everything I had said before hadn't been. He didn't stop, even after an hour of silence from me. In fact, he got creepier. He accused me of teasing him, and then said that we were going to have sex whether I was playing his game or not. At this point, I was pretty panicky because it sounded like he was going to rape me, but I tried to calmly respond in case I was getting things out of hand in my head and reading it wrong, or in case he was generally thinking I was just playing hard to get. So on the off chance it was a misunderstanding, I spelled it out for him, telling him clearly that I was ignoring him because I wasn't interested. His follow-up chilled me to the bone. He accused me of being a bitch because I was mad about Sunday still, then told me that if I didn't go meet him, he was going to come around when you're home alone and get what I want. At this point, I felt like I didn't know him at all anymore, and I couldn't predict if he was being serious or not, so I got scared and decided I should get the police involved. I told him this, in the hope that he would back off now, but he didn't. He seemed to find it funny and told me, By the time they manage to do anything, you'll be mine. At this point, I thought I wasn't safe in my home, and I got out. I packed some emergency things and drove to my parents' house, an address my ex was thankfully unaware of. Once I got there, I showed my father the messages I had been sent and he took me to the police station for moral support and because he was very angry at the time. The police did patrols of my house that night because they were concerned about break-ins after the threats to come get me, but happily no one ever tried to break in. Even so, they took my ex in for questioning in the morning. A police officer handling this got in touch with me much later in that day and told me that they had adequate evidence from me and detaining and questioning him for me to press charges, currently planning to charge him with sexual harassment and threatening behavior. After that, he was released on bail with a condition of not contacting me. I wish I could say that that was the end of it. Two days after the original texts were sent, I worked the breakfast shift at the cafe I worked in and not long after I arrived, some flowers with a card were delivered. The delivery person was clearly given my name, since he asked for me by name. The card was the creepy part, though it was a written to order thing, and probably toned down quite a bit in comparison to what he might have written me personally. It still made my skin crawl. First off, it started by calling me love, referred to the incident as just a falling out, apologized, like that would make me feel better, but then said that I should apologize to him too because we both took it too far. 
then said that I'd be happier if we got together again. It wasn't signed by name, but it isn't too hard to tell who it was. I did report it to the police, but they didn't have much that they could do either, given the lack of proof that it was his. I've also had similar issues with social media, some weird Facebook friend requests that I deleted, thinking it was from him, but nothing serious, thankfully. All I can really say to finish this, or at least hopefully finish this, since I'm praying this is a non-ongoing story, is Creepy X, I've got pepper spray, and I'm staying with my parents, where I can reach my dad's gun, so it's probably in both of our interests not to meet again, until I take you to court that is. Edit. I've added some updates in the comments below, but I've received messages from people who missed the important bits of information. The first thing I have to add is that, following the advice of some of the wonderful people on here, I called the florist that sent me the gift and explained the situation, told me that he didn't give out personal information, whether I had boyfriend troubles or not, so I spoke to the police officer handling my case, who by the way, couldn't have been better, very understanding and professional at the same time. He went into the shop in person. Needless to say, they do give out customer details if a policeman asks. And surprise, surprise, it was my ex. So that counts as bail violation, and he's back in custody for the time being. Another more recent update. Three days after he was taken into custody again, I went back to my usual residence, seeing that he wasn't a threat anymore. I was still nervous though, so I went with my dad. When we got in, it was evident that a lot of mail had been shoved through the letterbox while I was away. Some of it was genuine stuff, but most of it was reams and reams of crumpled up paper, not sent via the mailman, as none of it was in envelopes, and it looked like someone had just shoved it in. There was also a small parcel, gift paper, with no labels, which set off alarm bells, especially when I read some of those letters. They basically read like him going mental on paper. Pages and pages of rambling about how we're meant to be, he can't live without me, I'm being silly, selfish, and stupid for not giving him a second chance. One part sticks in my mind where he swore he wasn't going to let this go no matter what. After that, I was super uncomfortable and not sure why I stayed there. Even though he was in custody and I was pretty much safe, I put off committing to stay or leaving, just hung out with my dad for a while, deliberately not opening the parcel. I wasn't sure if I wanted to know what kind of things he sent me after what I read but eventually I did open it. That's how I decided to go back to my parents' house for a while, just for comfort, because inside that small box wrapped with a couple layers of paper, the paper was another long rambling letter that unnerved me. He went to great lengths to tell me that, although we make mistakes and both of us took it too far, he would love me forever if I apologized to him and stop acting stupid. We can just forget what happened between us and start over again. As husband and wife, his words, not mine. Yes, he seriously proposed to me like that. Yes, the box had an engagement ring in it. It was a pretty ring, but I know I'd never be comfortable wearing it. No, I'm not going to marry him. I'm going to add this to the growing list of evidence I'm showing to the police and the court. Update again. Sadly, I announced that there's a part two. The incident that creeped me out happened on Wednesday. 1st of August, I was leaving work and there's a man sitting on a car's bonnet across the street. The car gave me an odd sense of deja vu that I couldn't place, but I figured, whatever, maybe he's a regular or something and he's just waiting for someone. I kept walking, only to be distracted by someone calling out in a broken accent attempt at my first language. Hey, hey you. I turned around to see what was going on, whether he was talking to me or not. He was standing on the road now, pointing at me, and he beckoned when he saw me look at him, but I stood my ground. I wasn't going to walk out onto the road to have a conversation with someone I didn't even know. So I asked him, Do I know you? In case I just failed to recognize him or something. Obviously, this amused him somehow, because he laughed at me, shaking his head. Now this encounter had gone from a little out of the ordinary to very weird to me, and given the recent events with my ex-boyfriend, I was quite paranoid, so I turned more aggressive and confrontational than I otherwise would have, 
and demanded that he tell me why he stopped me and if we knew each other. No reason, he shrugged. Your name is, right? At that point, I freaked out and just started walking quickly away. I wanted to get away from this odd man who knew my name and wouldn't say what he wanted. As I left, I heard him laugh again. The way he did was weird and unpleasant. Then he yelled, All right, see you next week. At this point, I really didn't want to meet him ever again, but it didn't end there. That is, I didn't see him again, but the car remained across the street, basically not moving at all for two days. Today, I decided to check the plates. I know that may make it seem a little creepy too, but here's my reasoning. I was a little nervous that it might be my ex's. We didn't date for a long time and I only saw his car a few times. All I really remembered about it was that he had personal plates. I was right. So it seems somehow my ex managed to send another creep to harass me while he's in custody, which just adds to the stress of the approaching court date. I'm not sure how he can encourage someone to harass me from custody where he currently is, but I'm not sure what he is and isn't allowed to do from where he is. Maybe I should get in touch with the police again. Update. The police have wheel clamped and taped off the car, then searched it. According to what the officer in charge of my case was able to tell to me, they found several guns, some of which are illegal where I live. My ex, who the car is registered to, does not have a gun registered in the first place, so they could all be illegal unless they are someone else's. The police are apparently looking for the other man by the description I gave them. Nothing else suspicious was found in the car as far as I've been told. Last update. The man I saw with the car came into my workplace today. I wasn't paying attention at first and went over to take his order. He grabbed my arm and asked me to go outside with him. That's when it clicked that this was the same guy. I pulled away from him. Fortunately, he wasn't holding me tightly and I'm strong enough to get out of his grip. Then I hurried in the back in the staff only area and got my boss's attention. I told him what happened and he called the police. The man was gone by the time they arrived, but they found him a little later and took him in for questioning. He's been released with a warning for the firearms in his car weren't his. They were my ex's apparently, which scares me a little more. The man seemed generally bewildered by them. Not sure if he's just a good actor or my ex didn't give him the true story. But from what he told the police, my ex told him that we were together and he persuaded him to help him do a fake kidnap prank to scare me. I am so so glad that the court hearing is coming up. I was shaking and trying not to cry hearing the gory facts from the policeman handling my case over the phone though. I'm not sure how well I'll hold it together in court. Hopefully the conclusion. Today is my court hearing. He was originally charged with harassment and threatening behavior in the light of other things including police investigations and his friend confessing. He will also be charged with possession of legal weapons, planned kidnapping, stalking, and failure to comply with bail. But I can happily say that he's out of my way as I have a restraining order and he has an 8 year prison sentence. This all started when I was 14 when my mom met her new boyfriend who I'll call Ray. I remember the first time he met me and my siblings. He looked at my mom and said, Oh wow, didn't know you had a gang. Which looking back on was a very weird thing for him to say since he had been on a few dates with my mom and she told him exactly how many kids she had. Ray seemed like a normal guy at first. He was in his 40s and had two older sons from his last marriage who sometimes came over for dinner. Things went wrong after he moved in. He would yell a lot and have loud arguments with my mom, throwing things at her. But he would always sweet talk his way around her afterwards. And this is probably why she didn't leave him sooner. But Ray found it difficult to get along with my siblings and me. He would complain about every little thing we did wrong and quickly became very controlling. But whenever we complained about how he was acting towards our mom, he would accuse us of trying to ruin their relationship. 
This worked pretty much every time since it would cause her to get angry and yell at us instead of him. As we got older, he stopped us from seeing friends he didn't like and wouldn't allow our friends to come over unless they had his approval first. I realized he was crazy when he picked me up from school one day, which he never did, and while driving home, he accused my sister of trash talking him behind his back. When I asked him how he knew that, he told me he had proof. When we got home, he showed us a tape recorder and played back a recording of my sister and I complaining about him in our bedrooms at night. I asked him why the fuck he put a recorder in our bedrooms and we had a big argument. I immediately called my mom and told her. I made him remove all the tape recorders from our bedroom, but I'm convinced that he kept hiding them since he would sometimes bring up conversations that my sister and I had while he wasn't around. We were so paranoid that we would whisper and we would never talk about anything private in case he somehow overheard. We were so terrified that he might have also hid cameras as well. We would dress and undress super quickly so if there were cameras he wouldn't be able to see anything. It gets me angry thinking about the fear that we lived in while living there. When I was 16 I got a job at a fast food place and Ray had a big problem with that as well. His reasoning for this was that my boyfriend at the time worked there and he believed that I was just going to mess around with my boyfriend. So his way of checking on me was to come and sit in his car and record me. He did this for a month. He would show me the recordings, after which would lead to even more arguments, ending with 16 year old me begging for a 40 year old man not to stalk me at work. I was pretty much done at this point and moved in with my dad who had just moved back my dad was pissed when I told him about everything that was happening. He wanted to call the police on Ray, but my mom begged him not to. They broke up a few years later over something unrelated, so thankfully I never saw him again. So to preface this, I was young, maybe 18 or 19, and had no idea what we were getting into. So my father owns three businesses and was actively dating his business partner and was providing for her. She also made advances on me, which kind of creeped me out. She would buy us all food at first, and I was grateful. But then, I started becoming nervous as she wanted to be alone with me a lot. My father ended up getting married, not to her, but didn't tell her, and she got really upset at him. She came to my job and demanded to see my father, which I told her he wasn't here. She screamed at me and said that we would soon regret it. Due to the disturbing nature of it, I called the cops and all they did was take my name but not actually look into it. So fast forward, I came home around midnight as I had just came from my second job. Dead tired from school and work, I ate and crashed on my bed. It had to be at least 3 in the morning when I heard my door open. At first, I didn't move because I assumed it was my calico cat, Misty, pawing at my door and she liked to sleep with me. When I groaned her name and she didn't answer, it struck me as strange, but I still wasn't worried until I felt a presence standing over me. I quickly woke up and discovered my father's ex in our house, above me, crazy eyed. She was screaming saying how she would get revenge on my father. I quickly rolled out of bed and passed her and called the authorities. She openly tried to fight my father's wife and tried to stab my dad. The police came and arrested her on the spot. That was the scariest shit I've ever been through and I'm so glad I won't have to see her again. Now I sleep with a blade next to my bed and a taser. Please be careful as you never know who may pay you a late night visit. This happened a few years ago. I was dating this guy, which I'll refer to as John. So John and I had been together for two months or so, and I thought everything was okay. However, three months into our relationship, he started to show up during my class break and when my class ended. To some people, it may be sweet, but to me, it was hella creepy. I didn't give him any details about my class, nor the timetable. Things started to get creepy and he started becoming demanding and possessive as well. 
Soon after, I broke up with him because I couldn't take it anymore. What happened after really scared me. I started receiving gifts in my house letterbox with notes on how I belong with him and only him. I never gave him my address. He even came to wait outside my classes and at public areas for me, but I usually get saved by a friend who knew about the issue. One night, I ended class really late, so I had to go home alone. I guess he was probably stalking me because when I was reaching the elevator, someone grabbed me really, really hard. I got a bruise on my wrist thanks to him. I didn't need to think twice and I knew it was him. He started shouting at me about how I avoided him and called me a slut for hanging out with my guy friends. Honestly, I was terrified. Luckily for me, my brother was on his way back and thank goodness he saw what happened and came running. Thankfully, John ran away and I started crying when my brother came to hug me. I have never felt so grateful in my life before. Thank goodness I have an older brother. I made my brother promise not to tell my parents as I didn't want them to worry about me. After that day, my brother started fetching me back home daily and John never appeared again. Maybe this isn't terrifying to some of you, but it's really traumatizing for me. Even now, the idea of going home alone still terrifies me. So this happened last year, lasting around nine months. I'm from Bermuda and was in Leesburg, Florida for college. I've always had a hard time making friends and since I was new, I had an even harder time. So I used Tinder to find friends or potential partners. I was on Tinder one day after striking out with someone previously. I saw my ex's profile and figured I could do worse. So I swiped and we matched. I'm realizing now that he was a rebound. He told me that he was in an open relationship at the time and about things his boyfriend did to him, so I felt bad for him. During the first two dates, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. I spent a few days over at his parents' house and found out what his home life was like, which made me feel even worse for him. Turns out he'd been homeschooled all his life and his parents were and still are degenerates. One night, we were at his place and he told me he loved me. And it had only been a week at this point. Honestly, that alone should have been a red flag, but I ignored it. Fast forward to when I was in Bermuda for the summer. It was four and a half months of agony. At the time, my ex was overly dependent and problematic. If I said even the slightest thing wrong, normal talking points like things I noticed that were particularly unhealthy, or things that impacted me negatively. I was in for at least an hour of self-pity and depreciation. I was stressed every day. I was pretty much having to walk on eggshells for four and a half months to the point where I nearly dumped him. I should have. It was also during this four-month period that I learned a lot of unsettling things that I wrote off but shouldn't have. He told me he was a necrophile. He joked about being a serial killer but was partially serious, and the list goes on, but those are what I could remember off the top of my head. Unfortunately, rather than dousing these flames, I only fanned them. I got back to Leesburg, and things only got worse from there. The pity and depreciation got worse. My ex even outed me to his dad, who is xenophobic. It was an accident, but I don't care. It was shitty. This also could have ended our relationship. I was taking care of him in such a way that I was essentially his parent. I even had to teach him to look both ways before crossing the street. I didn't know I had a savior complex at the time, and my therapist pointed it out, and that because of the savior complex and my pity for my ex, I was burning myself out catering to him, and that I needed to get out of the relationship ASAP. It took me a while to do it, but... I eventually did. When I broke up with him, I explained how I felt and what my therapist had said. I told him the only thing that would change would be that if we weren't technically in a relationship. But that was it. Nothing else would change. Not even two days after he tried to kill himself while he was on the phone with me. Fast forward to Thanksgiving. 
I was with my current girlfriend, visiting her family and I sent a DM to my ex, asking him a question. I ended up finding out that when he and I met, he wasn't actually in an open relationship and that he had used me to cheat on his boyfriend. I told him I didn't want him in my life anymore and that was that. I wish that was the end of the story but it's not. It was getting towards Christmas and I was doing terribly. I was trying to improve my life but nothing was going right. I lost my other girlfriend at the time, I'm polyamorous, and lost most of my friends. Even my roommate's girlfriend was actively trying to get me kicked out of our apartment. I foolishly let my ex be my friend again because I couldn't take being alone. But he was worse than before. The abuse was subliminal before, but now it was outright. When he was sober he was okay-ish, but when he wasn't, he was abusive. He claimed he loved me, but treated some transphobic girl he met in the psych ward who he knew was using him better than he treated me. When I called him out on it, he threw a fit. A few days later, I was on the phone with him. I ended up having a panic attack and bawling my eyes out. I hadn't cried for four years before that. My current girlfriend was my saving grace and helped me to finally get my ex out of my life for good. So yeah, let's not meet again or you're losing teeth. Just a heads up, this is a long story that involves some violence. I apologize if I'm posting this in the wrong spot, but it has elements of stalking, and I was terrified by this person for some time. I may not leave it up for long as I'm still sort of afraid of him seeing this. So this happened about 10 years ago when I was in college. I was a sophomore, a 19 or 20 year old female, and I was horribly naive. The college I went to was a religious school. This is partly the reason why this problem continued on as long as it did. This school had several rules that students had to follow. The rules important to the story are, no drinking on campus, you could only visit the opposite sex in their room during visitation hours, and during that visitation, the door had to be left open. I was not an unattractive girl and I happened to draw the attention of a guy who shared the same major as I did. This means we had a bunch of classes together. He introduced himself to me as Andy and we began talking. He was very tall, about 6'4", and quite heavy. At one point, he weighed about 300 pounds. He expressed romantic interest in me, but I wasn't attracted to him and told him this whenever he brought it up. He would immediately backtrack and say how happy he was being my friend and that he didn't mind that I didn't care about him romantically. I did get along very well with him though and we hung out, just the two of us frequently. The other people in our class began to expect to see us together and we became fast friends. Andy had a girlfriend when we first met who attended another school. He broke up with her during the summer break between freshman and sophomore year. But unbeknownst to me, the reason for the breakup was that he wanted to start pursuing me more actively. When I came back from summer break, something had changed. Andy became more forward towards me, often making comments about how pretty I was and that I should be with him. I began to become uncomfortable with the attention and told him this so many times. I unfortunately didn't want to lose him as a friend since he was one of my only few friends I hung out with. A lot of those friends I met through him, so if I cut him off, I would have close to no one to talk to. Andy would often swing wildly from charming and sweet to insulting and manipulative. He would offer to take me places and help me out with things, then would say that I owed him so much in return for those things. He would say that we were so close and we should just date since we were already practically together all the time. Alcohol made him the worse. I tried to avoid drinking with him, but it did happen occasionally, either off campus or sneakily while in the dorm room. He sometimes used my past relationships to manipulate me into feeling guilty. As a religious person, I had committed the carnal sin by sleeping with two guys I had previously dated before meeting Andy. 
He brought this up a lot, implying that I was damaged goods because of this. He at one point told me, I'm the best man you could possibly get because of your past. Eventually I caved and told him that I would date him just to see if there was any feelings there whatsoever. This of course made him ecstatic, but it also made him extremely overprotective of me and jealous of any attention I received from anyone of the opposite sex. He would call and text me constantly, and if I didn't pick up the first time, he would call me until I did. He constantly questioned where I was going to be and would follow me there, if possible. I worked for the college as a short order cook at their late night grill and Andy would wait for me to get off of work almost every night. He would sit at one of the tables for hours, just waiting for me to finish my shift. He began to creep me out, but I chalked it up to him being an overprotective boyfriend. We did eventually have sex, but I was still not physically attracted to Andy, and I was essentially waiting for him to finish every time we did the deed. He made me feel like it was a necessary part of a relationship and that, because I slept with all my exes, I needed to sleep with him. Despite this, I did generally enjoy his company and our conversations when he wasn't being possessive. We tried being in a relationship for two months until Christmas break rolled around. When I went home, I had a chance to clear my head and speak to my family about the situation. My mom especially seemed uncomfortable with how frequently Andy contacted me and it got way worse while we were apart. He got a hold of my family members Facebook page and phone numbers and he would call and message them whenever I didn't immediately answer his calls or texts. It got to the point where he would be calling me upwards to 10 times a day and I had hundreds of texts from him. This was a time where you had to pay for a certain number of texts per month and no matter how many times I told him that he was using up all my texts, he would still text message me. I honestly couldn't afford this relationship anymore. After thinking long and hard about it, I called him up. I told him how I felt and thought this relationship wasn't working. I said the cliche phrase, I still want to be friends, and I generally meant it. Andy flipped out. He began calling me and messaging me more and more frequently than before at all hours of the day and night, switching wildly from you broke my heart. Please come back to me. Two, how dare you, you stupid bitch. I deserve way better than you. And then back again. I had no clue what to do. I dreaded returning to school. When the day finally came and I went back to campus, Andy sought me out. He'd freak out on me for no reason, curse at me all the time and call me names, then apologize profusely. His attitudes would change frequently Sometimes the next day, sometimes even the next hour. He still waited for me outside of my work. He still followed me back to my dorm. He still walked with a group of friends to and from class. When they were around, he would pretend to want to be friends, then wait until we were walking alone to start in on me. He would push me or step on the back of my heels when I was walking and mock me. Then when I complained, he would say that he was just joking. I didn't realize it at the time, but he was showing all these warning signs and I was so stupid and naive to pick up on them. I did tell him I thought we needed to spend more time apart and that worked for a short while. Andy eventually seemed to even out and a few weeks later invited me to his dorm room to play video games as a peace offering. When I arrived, he snuck me in the back way so he didn't have to leave the door open. He offered me a drink. This made me nervous, but I was an underage college student, so far be it from me to turn down an alcoholic beverage. Everything seemed to be going alright. We were getting along and joking around, so I got more comfortable. I had another drink, and quickly after this I started to feel exceedingly tired and had trouble standing. I don't know if he was topping off my drink when I wasn't looking, or God forbid he put something in my drink. But there was no way I was leaving that room that night. Andy became very accommodating and arranged for me to crash on his couch. I agreed, but I could tell something wasn't right. So I told him in a drowsy voice while slurring my words, 
that in no uncertain terms would he try anything sexual. He laughed it off but agreed. The last thing I remember is curling up on the couch and falling asleep. I don't need to tell you what happened that night while I was passed out. The next morning when I found out, I was horrified. I yelled at Andy, who laughed it off as something funny and that I brought it on myself by drinking. Then I left. I went to my dorm room across campus, crawled into bed and cried. I skipped classes that day and stayed in my room the whole time. I called out of work. I didn't want to do anything or see anyone. I didn't want to tell anyone what happened then. At some point during the afternoon, Andy tried to sneak into my room. I freaked out, yelling at him to get the fuck out. He apologized and told me that he wanted to drop some things off and that he didn't think I'd be here. He had a hot water bottle and some flowers. How sweet, not. He kind of threw them in my room and shut the door as I yelled at him to leave me alone. A couple months went by. Andy still followed me sometimes, but I told him to back off. He still messaged me, but I mostly ignored him. He followed me off campus on multiple occasions, and I also learned that he had been following me around for quite some time. I began to develop anxiety about seeing him everywhere and went to the campus doctor. I explained parts of the story to him and he gave me some Xanax and antidepressants to help with my paranoia. I tried my best to function, but my grades suffered and so did my friendships. By this point, I had maybe three friends left who didn't think I was a horrible person that led Andy on, then dumped him and broke his heart. Icing on the cake for me was when Andy crashed my birthday party. Apparently, he asked one of my friends if he could help plan it, but she didn't know that we weren't speaking, so she agreed. He showed up to the park where it was being held, drank all the alcohol, then began telling my few friends I still had left how much of a bitch I was. He called me a whore. He told them that I led him on and broke his heart, and the entire evening was ruined. Unfortunately, he was too drunk to drive himself home, so I was nominated to bring him back by driving his car. I mentioned that I didn't want to go by myself, so my friend offered to ride with me to help carry him to his dorm room, but immediately after that, she booked it. She left me alone with him in his dorm room, even though I told her I was extremely uncomfortable being alone with him. She knew some of what happened, but I think she figured I was being dramatic or exaggerating. Immediately after she left, all of a sudden, he wasn't that drunk anymore. He immediately turned hostile and threatening. He told me that if I didn't stay with him, he would hurt himself and pulled out a pair of scissors. He held the blade of the scissors to his wrist and I took a step back. I was at a loss of what to do in this situation, so I simply stated that he shouldn't hurt himself, but I really wanted to leave. I backed up slowly and went to the door, but he jumped up, dropped his scissors, thank god, and grabbed my wrist. He yanked me back from the doorway and twisted my arm behind my back until I cried out. Then he threw me against the wall, face first, slammed the door shut and locked it. Then he picked me up. I'm fairly tall, but he's close to six foot four and big. He tossed me on his bed. I was terrified, but I told him if he didn't let me go, I would scream. He covered my mouth with his hand and told me if I screamed, I would get in trouble for violating visitation. Something that I had already gotten in trouble with once before, and there was a risk of being expelled if I got caught again. He said that he would let me get up if I promised to stay in the room with him. I tried to betray that I was calm and relaxed, but inside I was scared for my life. I thought if I stayed, he would try to assault me again, or worse. I agreed to stay with him, and he let me up off the bed. I sat up, and with all my strength I could muster, I smiled. I said I'd be okay hanging out with him, but I really had to use the restroom. He agreed, but told me not to take long. He said he would be waiting outside the door. The dorm bathroom was actually a shared bathroom between two dorm rooms. In Andy's room, there's a door to the right that led to the bathroom. Then if you walked through the bathroom, there would be another door to the opposite side that led to another dorm room. 
Both bathroom doors could be locked from the inside to prevent someone from one dorm using the bathroom to access the other dorm room. I went into the bathroom and closed Angie's door, then prayed that the guys that lived next to the dorm room were trusted enough to leave the bathroom door unlocked. I walked to the other side and tried the doorknob. Miraculously, it turned and I opened the door into a room of two very surprised guys. I apologized and mumbled. I just needed to get out of there before turning to leave. They both stared at me as I ran out the front door. I left that residence hall and ran all the way across campus to my dorm. All of a sudden, I heard footsteps behind me and heard someone shouting my name. My heart sank. It was Andy. I panicked, but the hall that housed my dorm room was directly ahead of me. I picked up the pace and Andy followed suit. He was gaining on me and it had been ages since I ran. I'm the perfect example of saying, if I'm running, you better run too, because something is chasing me. I could see the entrance of the dorm room. I had my key out and grabbed the door handle of the first set of doors. There were two sets of doors that led into my residence hall. The first one was always unlocked, but the second one you needed a key for. When I got inside of the first doors, Andy caught up to me and grabbed me by my arm. He tried to use his weight advantage to pull me back from the second set of doors and out of the entrance. I fought with everything I had, yelling at him to let me go the whole time. I saw through the dorm room window that people were inside the foyer and if I could just get their attention, I would get one of them to open the door. I finally managed to get close enough to the second set of doors to knock. The instant I knocked on the door, Andy let me go. He then walked away quickly, letting out a few choice curse words fly in my direction before jogging back in the direction he came from. When a guy from inside opened the door, he saw a girl who was out of breath, on the verge of tears. He asked me if I was okay and I said, I think so, then waved him away. I ran to my dorm room and locked the door immediately. The very next day, I contacted my RA about the situation. I showed her some of the messages Andy sent me and explained that he had broken visitation by coming into my dorm room to drop stuff off for me and that he had just chased me across campus. She was immediately concerned and contacted the Dean of Discipline. They instituted a ban on Andy being allowed to enter my dorm and told him to stay away from me and to not contact me anymore. It took him a long time to even begin to comply. I should have gone to the police, but when I met the Dean of Discipline, he strongly encouraged me to keep everything in house. He said, we are a family and we will deal with this internally like a family should. I didn't learn this until years later, but this is the attitude of many colleges when dealing with victims of stalking and assault. Eventually, over the next summer, I told my mother most of the details of what happened and she cried with me. She was extremely supportive and drove me five hours to the police department in town where the college is located so I could file a report. They basically said that since it had been so long since the assault and there wasn't much that they can do but I could try to get a restraining order. I followed their directions and was able to get a restraining order against Andy. He violated the order several times and ended up going back to court. The court put so many restrictions on him that he ended up having to transfer to another college while I finished my degree. When I graduated, I got out of there and never looked back. I returned to my hometown where I moved back in with my family and got a decent job. I've dealt with anxiety, depression, and extreme paranoia since then. And for a while, I was terrified that he would find me again and finish what he started. I got a firearm card and bought a handgun that I keep under my nightstand for protection. I never had to use it outside of practicing at a range, fortunately. I eventually found a fantastic guy who is amazing, sweet, kind, and very understanding of my past. He is also super handsome, I might add. We are now married and I have never been happier and I'm so glad I got out of that situation. Many women aren't as lucky. Andy, let's never meet again because if you try to hurt me, I'll probably be armed.
So, some backstory. I was born in Philadelphia with a Sudanese background. I lived there for 12 years, moved to UAE, and enrolled in a British school. So this takes place in 2017 to 2018, around the first term, and is the start of junior high. I accidentally skipped the morning assembly, national anthem singing, and flag raising, which we do every morning in the schoolyard. I go straight up to the class and pick up my desk. Morning assembly finishes and the other girls come up and introduce themselves, but for some reason, the desk in front of me is empty. School separates classes by gender and year five for religious values. Apparently that year, Aileen's family took a trip to their home country and were coming back a month late. So she arrives to get her desk and plops in front of me. Fast forward about three weeks in the school year and our teacher, who was amazing, asked if we wanted to switch desks. And Aileen goes to her and says I distract her. Understandable. I always try to make conversation and often ramble. She switches desks and life goes on. One day, out of the blue, during PE, Aileen goes, you're like my best friend. I was shocked. After changing desks, I didn't force friendships since I knew she wasn't very fond of me. At this point in the school year, I still wasn't settled in due to the cultural shock. So I did my best to be a good friend to Aileen. This is when all the problems started. I admit, I do too many favors for other people and often see myself being taken advantage of. But Aileen made me a train wreck. One day our science teacher announced the science fair and I decided to join on a solo project and wrote my name down on the board outside of the reception. What I didn't know is that Aileen wrote her name down next to mine and put us in the partners division along with another girl. When the teacher announced the names of the class to make sure they were correct, I heard my name with Aileen's and the other girls. So she just turned around to smile at me while I just sat there dumbfounded. When I confronted her, her response was just, I didn't have anyone to work with and your name was blank so I just put my name down with girl. I couldn't do anything about it so when we had a week left before the fair, me and girl went to Aileen's house after school. Girl couldn't come with me and Aileen after school to her house. So that left me alone with her until 8pm. While waiting for her to finish up on her after school clubs, I was reading and she insisted I play netball with them. But I couldn't since I have a mild form of EDS that affects my arms and hands. So I can't really throw or pull. I'm often excused from PE class and the school nurses are trained to help relocate my joints. But she just grabs my arm and pulls me to come play. At this point, my arm gives out and comes out of my joint and my hands as well. I'm yelling at her to let me go since I'm in intense pain. Thankfully, we were in a field, so the nurse's office was close. She heard me yelling and took me to her office and helped relocate my joint, gave me some ice and pain meds. So I stay resting until Aileen's mum came out to pick me and her up and we went to her house. When we got to the car, Aileen's sisters, one nine and another two, got in with us. I held the youngest one while Aileen let the other play on her iPad. This was fine until the baby started pulling on my fingers. Normally, I would just ask the adult to take her child while I go find a nurse or a doctor, or, in some cases, put my joints in myself. I took first aid after finding out I had EDS. I asked Aileen to put her sister on her lap while I find my pain meds and put my joints back in place. She knew I had EDS since we're required to make statements to the classes slash grade so they know to be gentle. But she just turned to me and I quote, You can wait, she's just a baby, let her be. I ended up switching seats with her at a red light so I could put her in her car seat and put my joints in place. After the nightmare car ride was over, I went to the bathroom to change into some sweatpants and my hoodie. Aileen glanced over at me and threw some leggings at me. 
trying to show off some more. Now, this was in the sixth grade and Aileen had little to no figure or curves. So I was clueless to why she wanted me to dress in tight-fitting clothes. We start out on the poster and I got out my laptop to write out the information. When Aileen decides, with only one week left of the experiment, poster information and idea topic, to start a new one. I was livid. Q. Other girl's arrival, and she suggests that we do two projects. That I and her do the project I planned, and that Aileen can start a new one on her own. Aileen surprisingly agrees and we work. After we finish the work, we decide to order a pizza and get some ice cream. Aileen ordered a double melt pizza, feta cheese stuffed between mozzarella and dough with no sauce. Not very good, 3 out of 10. While the girl and I got halal pepperoni, she proceeded to complain and whine until I bought her another slice, so she would shut up. When we went to get ice cream, I wanted to get strawberry, but she claimed her allergies would flare up if I ate it. I asked her, what would me eating ice cream have to do with her allergies? Where she yelled at me in the middle of the Baskin Robbins, claiming that the girl and I were going against her. Once we got back to the apartment, I called my dad and asked him to pick me up because I was finished with my project and wanted to go home. Finally, my dad arrives and saves me from that hell pit and takes me home where I can finally rest, only to see Aileen texted me, saying that she accidentally threw out her project. Note, this was a 2x4 board, and you can't just accidentally throw it away. I got to school on Thursday to see that she had no other option than to stick with my project, and said she played a prank on me. Skipping to the end of the fair, I finally get some air to breathe with a blissful two-week break from her. During the third term, I saw some clear change in her. She started styling her hair like mine, started adapting my mannerisms, wearing her uniform like mine, even going as far as to wear and buy the same brand names as me. Adidas, Nike, Off-White, Vans, etc. I soon realized she was trying to become me when she started asking my brother about my hygiene brands and what brands I wear at home. I blocked her off everything, made sure to change my style and upgrade, even going as far as dyeing my hair to get her to leave me alone. Eventually she weaned off me and the other girl and left us alone, leaving the school and moving to Abu Dhabi. I've been through some scary experiences, but this was the worst thing I feel I've ever gone through in my life. I used to be a very naive, innocent kind of person. I was a type of optimist who believed that there was a touch of goodness in every heart, a dangerous mindset to be in. I realize now that seeing the world through my rose-colored glasses put a big, flashing red target on my back. Often, when you think of scary stories involving creepy behavior and psychological abuse, you think of an occurrence from a stranger. In my case, it came from my mother-in-law. My husband's mother initially adored me, not for any reason other than thinking that I could be easily controlled. I was meek with a passive personality, so it made sense that I would come across like someone who could be easily influenced. Looking back on it, I cringe at how creepy the situation really was. For the sake of the story, I'll call my mother-in-law by the name of Mrs. Psycho. At the beginning of the relationship with my husband, Mrs. Psycho and I would get along great, or so I thought. She'd take me shopping, give compliments about my hair, and girly stuff like that. As the relationship with my partner grew more serious, she ran and raved to everyone in the neighborhood about how much she adored me and how I was like the daughter she never had. So naturally, I thought things were progressing positively, but certain things were just really off about Mrs. Psycho. I noticed little tidbits of her behavior at parties and neighborhood social gatherings. She'd sulk in the corner and I'd chalk it up as her just being socially awkward or anxious 
but looking back at it now, I noticed that she was always whimpering about something negative going on in her life. How she fell off her bike and hurt her elbow while riding through a construction zone. How one neighbor complained about her parking in front of his house. Losing her job because she didn't get along with the co-worker. The list went on and on. In every story, she portrayed herself as a victim of some unusual circumstances. One huge red flag that my mind didn't understand at the time was a story that she was telling about her other son, my partner's brother. She said some really disturbing things about how he held her, my partner, and his dad hostage in their home, and how he physically punched their father in the face. The way she described the story made it seem like my partner's brother was a bully to the whole family, and my partner didn't seem to think it was quite as severe as she made it sound. Regardless, in all her wild stories and accusations about him, she always scolded her son in ways that I can't imagine ever scolding my own child. What my husband and I didn't fully interpret at the time was the underlying problem, which wasn't necessarily his brother, but the woman who had been the driving force for the insanity behind the behavior. Psychological abuse can trigger emotional responses in very unpredictable and disturbing ways. Mrs. Psycho's behavior became evidently creepy after our engagement. First, she was angry that we didn't tell her immediately when we had gotten engaged. Then she was angry that we changed the wedding date without first asking her for permission. She expressed a desire for my future husband and I to live upstairs in her house and pay her rent. When we told her that we could afford our own home and we wanted to start a family so it wouldn't work out. The infuriation in her eyes was frightening. She would look normal one moment. If you told her something she didn't want to hear, her eyes would turn black. The memory of her eyes still sends me with a frightening chill down my spine. From there, she became increasingly controlling. Mrs. Psycho and her husband, Mr. Psycho, would start showing up to our house every other day or so. I started counting how long they would go without having to see us and the numbers came to a mere three days. There's no privacy, and I felt like I had to close the curtains over our windows every night. I just had this uneasy feeling. I locked the bedroom door as a routine before bed, just to be on the extra safe side. Despite our relationship being pleasant in the beginning, I noticed that I was now feeling like I was treading on eggshells around Mrs. Psycho, or rather landmines. It seemed like anything I said was offensive to her, no matter how innocent. I realized I couldn't talk to her like I used to be able to when me and her son were just dating. I remembered when we would be able to have a nice, in-depth conversation and I had allowed myself to be vulnerable with her. I confided in her about how I had a lot of social anxiety and that her son came into my life during a time that I was suffering from crippling depression. I talked about how he brought a ray of sunshine into my life, thinking that speaking kindly about her son would please her, but she just has this unfeeling glazed look in her face. Hoping to mend my relationship with her, I decided to help her out one day with organizing her antiques. She had this hobby of going to auctions and buying and selling knickknacks, buttons, and stuff like that. She would get very proud of her collection of things that I sort of thought were drunk. But to be polite, I told her I saw beauty in these things, hoping to get back on her good side. There were some creepy dolls in the mix, including this horrifying looking vampire doll with piercing red eyes. She said that she had that doll for years and used to scare her sons with it when they were little kids. She laughed at the memory, and the sound had an eerie satanic vibe to it. As if it wasn't enough to freak me out, she told me the story about how a female co-worker complained about her to HR. To seek revenge on this woman, Miss Psycho wrote a letter that was meant for the co-worker's husband, telling him that she was cheating on him. To remain as anonymous as possible, she told me how she slipped on a pair of black gloves and drove the letter to a faraway location so that the address couldn't be traced. I remember feeling very uneasy about her story wondering how she could get angry enough to drive hours away just to cause emotional harm to another human being. There came a point after hearing this story when I didn't want to be left alone with my partner's mom anymore. 
My partner tried to talk to his parents about how I was feeling like I was walking on eggshells around them, but they flipped the narrative to say that they were the one feeling on eggshells around me. During this time, I painstakingly realized that psychological torture exists in the form of extreme invalidation. Not having your feelings acknowledged can really drive a person crazy. It was then that I felt a little more clued in to what may have happened to Mrs. Psycho's other son. I can't be sure because I never met the guy, but I think he was driven mad by his mother's severe emotional neglect. Now she was pulling the same tricks on me and my partner, gaslighting us into believing that we were just too sensitive. When my husband and I started figuring out that something was off, things got even creepier. His parents started showing up at our house to corner us into submission. What I mean is, they would tell us stories to make them seem like victims so that we would give in to demands of what they wanted at the time. If we denied their request, they'd use psychological manipulation by telling us that we were uncaring or ungrateful. One demonstration of manipulation was when I became pregnant. I explained that the smell of pizza made me extremely sick, but this was ignored. Mrs. Psycho insisted that we go to a pizza restaurant for her birthday. I was confused with why I felt like I couldn't say no. My husband was in the same predicament. Somehow, I think he sensed that something bad would happen to us if we declined. This is also because Mrs. Psycho's husband and her sister had contacted us, telling us that we weren't allowed to say no to her dinner invitations anymore. They explained it like, Say no hurts her feelings, but there was something else there that I can't quite explain. Something hidden beneath the surface that sounded really threatening. I had no idea why, but I just did not feel safe. Then, only two weeks after giving birth to our daughter, I had the creepiest interaction of my life. Mrs. Psycho caught me alone while I was on my front porch. The weather was really nice, so I was rocking back with my baby on one of our outdoor chairs. She came up to the doorstep and assumed a seat in the chair next to me. Then in a quiet, ominous voice, she said, You have to share her, you know. Her black eyes flicked to the infant in my arms. I know what you might be thinking, but this wasn't said in a cute, excited new grandma kind of way. Her voice was cold and possessive, with a certain passive-aggressive intent behind the statement. I naturally clutched my arms around my daughter tighter, feeling a protective instinct take over me. Mrs. Psycho had expressed to me before that she always wanted to have a daughter, but was only ever able to have sons. Maybe I was being influenced by my postpartum hormones or just overall feeling paranoid, but a disturbing thought occurred to me that she might want to get rid of me somehow to have my daughter to herself. I later told my husband about the bizarre interaction with his mom and how I couldn't keep up with the heavy psychological demands of his parents anymore. It was all taking a strange emotional toll on me as well as a strain on our marriage and I still couldn't pinpoint exactly why. Nevertheless, they were causing us a lot of stress which was impacted on me all the more while I was trying to adapt to my new role as a mother. They even restricted me in bizarre ways telling me that I was not allowed to refer to our daughter as my baby. I had previously posted on Facebook about how excited and happy I was to be a new mom. I posted a side-by-side -side picture of me and my daughter with the caption, She has my eyes, which was meant to be lighthearted and innocent. My mother-in-law commented on the post with, My son has something to do with it too. Not only put a damper on my mood, but also felt creepy. Like, why did she have to mention something we already know? It was almost as if my happiness made her more enraged. I felt like I was starting to go crazy. The stress was enough to make me physically sick. At first, my husband hesitated when I told him about my concerns, stating the usual spiel that it was natural for him to say that they were his parents and that he couldn't just drop contact with them. But something in his voice contained fear and it wouldn't take long before he realized how fucked up the situation actually was. The incident that drove him to the point of cutting off his parents happened when they cornered us in our own living room. The minute that we watched their unruly dog while they went on vacation for five days. 
My husband almost caved, but stayed firm when he told them, No, we can't. We have a two-month-old baby to look after. The murderous glare his mom then flashed at me was intense enough to make me crawl out of my skin. You know that look. The look that someone gives you before they're about to attack. It looked like something from the movies. Very primal and hateful. I thought for sure that she was about to lunge at me and wring her hands down my neck, causing me death by strangulation. I was terrified. Mr. and Mrs. Psycho eventually left our house, but they were clearly angry that they weren't able to convince us to conform to their will. My husband and I had a dark, suspicious feeling that something bad was about to happen. First, we received lengthy emails from Mrs. Psycho, mostly insulting me. She said that she thought I was brainwashing her son. She went on to portray herself as a victim. She used the knowledge of my anxiety disorder to make an argument that I was mentally unstable and dangerous. She threatened to post about me on Facebook and make our life a living hell if we didn't apologize for deviating from what she wanted. At the same time, she told me that I was dead to her and listed all my mistakes I have ever made in the past, as well as criticizing my faults. I'd be lying if I said it didn't sting. My husband and I needed some space to recover from our emotional wounds that she had inflicted on us. We remained silent, not wanting to engage with her any further. My husband and I were pretty scared as well, as being hurt, spending most of our days cooped up in our own bedroom, not knowing what to expect. But we stayed strong through the process of separating from the toxic relationship. Mrs. Psycho proceeded to make good on her threats, posting about me publicly on Facebook. She said I was batshit crazy. She even went further, saying that I had borderline personality disorder in all capital letters. This came out of complete nowhere. She knew I had anxiety, but I never mentioned anything about being borderline because I wasn't diagnosed with that at all. It didn't end there though. She also posted a dramatic story of how we had banned her from seeing her grandchild. An active smear campaign against me ensued as Mr. and Mrs. Psycho actually went door to door to everyone's house in my community, posing as good citizens to warn everyone about their extremely dangerous, manipulative, five foot tall daughter-in-law. My neighbors didn't react the way that was expected though. They were more wary of her than me. Instead of ruining my reputation, which was the desired effect, most people in my neighborhood were majorly creeped out by Mrs. Psycho's efforts. They were equally creeped out by Mr. Psycho's willingness to go along with the whole thing. I guess, after years of being beaten down by his wife's abuse, he was just an empty shell of a man, a flying monkey to the proverbial wicked witch. There were a few doctors and therapists in my neighborhood who couldn't officially diagnose her since she wasn't their patient, but they set off the record that they believed Mrs. Psycho may have been projecting, meaning that she was, in a sense, confessing that she was potentially dangerous while pinning it all on me. This along with some stories of Mrs. Psycho's interactions with other people in the neighborhood confirmed that something was disturbingly off with this lady. This information made the situation all the more unsettling when Mr. and Mrs. Psycho showed up to her house for what we suspected would be a confrontation. My husband and I were watching Survivor in the living room with our baby when the doorbell rang. He crept behind the front window to peer behind the curtain to see who it was. I could see fear on his face. It's my parents, he said, and my blood ran cold. I immediately ran with the baby upstairs, pausing only to tell him that it was his choice whether to answer the door or not, since they're his parents, but that me and the baby would be hidden away. As I made my way up the stairs, my husband hovered by the front door, conflicted. He didn't know what to do. Meanwhile, I could hear jostling at the front door, like his parents were trying to force their way inside of our house with a spare key. I thank God to this day that we changed the locks a few days before so they couldn't get in. I proceeded to run upstairs and close the bedroom door behind me, locking me and the baby inside. I held my daughter close, my heart thudding wildly against my chest. 
When there was a knock on the bedroom door, I reacted with a jolt. It scared me shitless. My husband's voice on the other side calmed me down though. He told me that he didn't answer the door. He was trembling when I unlocked the door to let him in. His face was pale. He showed me a text message from his dad saying, Anyone home? Followed by another text from his mother saying, You're a coward, hiding behind your keyboard. I don't know what would have happened if my husband had chosen to open the door, but I shudder to think about it. My husband and I both blocked them after that. Phone numbers, social media accounts, everything. They moved away to another state, thank God. We have since had no contact with his parents for almost two years now, and our daughter is growing in a loving environment, free of toxicity. Sadly, we have had to block some of my husband's other family members because they kept telling us that we should talk to my in-laws, which, by the way, feels a lot like being told, please contact your abuser. For this reason, I sometimes feel like it would almost been better to be physically abused than mentally abused because then there would have been some sort of visible evidence of the harm that had been inflicted. In the meantime, they have so far made no attempts to contact us with an apology or anything. Instead, they reached out with a nasty, Have a shitty anniversary. You two are a match made in hell. Which only further secured our decision to cut contact with them. I'm going to put this in for context that will be useful later down the road. On March 10th, my very good friend committed suicide. I was on site with officers and a few close friends who showed up that day as well. It was really rough for me and many others and still affects me to this day. Now to the story and a quick note, I'm going to skip the sexual parts of the relationship as it was a weird sexual experience for me that generally made me lose sex drive and I don't want to mark this as not safe for work. So back at the end of October, beginning of November, I dated this girl named Tina. She had such a shitty name that fit completely with the shit show of a person she was. This girl was really something. She was your basic white girl, loud, unfunny, and always on TikTok trying to do those dances. Our first date rolled around and went to our high school's football game. And she wouldn't try to meet up with me at the concession stand because she was generally intimidated by me for whatever fucking reason. Then all of a sudden, she basically wanted to be by me for the rest of the football game. She was extremely erratic in behavior that day and that should have been the first red flag for me. Later that night, I was texting her and she pressured me to tell her about what happened with my friend and what it made me feel like. Normally, I'm a pretty open guy, but I just met this girl and didn't know what to think about her yet. But I gave in and I told her. Later that night, she started talking about how nobody would miss her if she was gone. I didn't know how to react as my anxiety kicked in. I kept trying to tell her that people needed her and soon I told her I loved her as a panic response as things ramped up in her behavior. This was the first red flag I noticed, but in reality, it should have been the second, and I wish I stopped talking to her after that football game. But now that I was believing that the girl was suicidal, I was really stuck with her. I played up an act of liking her for a few weeks. My high school's homecoming was coming up, and I asked her to the dance. However, all plans almost ended right there when she ran from home in the middle of the night and had her friend text me about how she was going to kill herself. Shit got real for me. I was so angry as I yelled at her over the phone, asking her to tell me where she was. I told her that I was going to call the cops, but she insisted that I didn't. I was about to go 60 on every single road. She kept telling me that the cliffside that she had been sitting on would be great for jumping off and killing herself with. My rage and fear steered up so much that I started crying and screaming. I went numb. I found her due to the fact that she was describing a woman who she thought was going to kidnap her or some bullshit. In reality, it was just a woman trying to get it out out of the way of her car. So I slammed on the brakes as soon as I saw the woman in the owl and jumped out of my car. 
I had tears in my eyes and rage in my blood, and I begged this woman to help me find her. As soon as I did, I saw her outline near the tree line. I basically had to drag this 5 foot 2 fuck out of this ditch and put it in the back of my car. Immediately she switched from being sad to angry and was calling me insane and kicking the back of my seat like a child. Later that night I was talking with my mom. I was telling her that I wanted to break up with her and that I almost did. But I was completely terrified of the fact that if I did, she may end up dead. She was in my head. I constantly worried about her, and on top of that, her friends came after me as well to stir up more attention and drama, which they ate up like a pack of lions with their newly caught prey. Eventually, I did break up with her, as I found it was the right time and I built up courage enough to do it. I was happy for once, and she was not. I felt powerful and finally in control of my own actions again. I even stood up for myself when she tried to pin me as a sex addict and abuser, which was far from the case and many people can confirm it. I told her how manipulative she was and how shitty her two-faced friends were. I told her how delusional her reality was, which went in tandem with a side conflict I was having with another friend named Griffin. It turned out that she and Griffin had not only been manipulating me and my friend group, but were having an affair with each other while I and Tina were dating. So my friends decided to fully cut these people off and Griffin was gone from our lives, but Tina was not. She continued to send her goons after us and harass us. I was the main target, but my friend Anna took a beating too due to the fact that she was the only other girl in my friend group. I had enough and told the principal about each incident in hopes that she would be removed from school. I told them I wanted her away from me and my friends as the harassment had become worse and worse. It went from just insults over Instagram DMs to filming our conversation and listening in on us using it as blackmail. They even tried to tear apart a relationship I was in with this girl from my history class, Selena. The school didn't do much but tell them to stop and then told me to stop which I have no idea why as I wasn't doing anything in particular. I took that quote unquote advice and stopped. When she would harass us I would just block them but then quarantine happened and things became bad. The harassment picked up again as they knew their school career couldn't be put online anymore and eventually got pictures of Tina and Griffin FaceTiming and sexting over it as she flashed her tits and other things like that. I was disgusted, however things slowed down as the one year of my friend's passing came up. I just hoped that it would be the end of it, as maybe a time of sadness would make them realize something, but it sure as hell didn't. I got a text last night from an unknown number at about 1am telling me I was a disgusting person and looked gross. I kept asking who it was, although I knew deep down who it really was. They were insulting me and I insulted back, showing that I wouldn't take their shit. I asked who it was again and they said, Someone who hates you. And I kept going. I told them that I didn't even know them and that they must be miserable to be texting someone they hate at 1 in the morning. They texted me saying, I know who you are. And I asked, Who am I then? They said my name, spelled perfectly, which is a rare occurrence surprisingly. They went on to say things like, Why did you hit me? You ruined my life. People thought my parents were abusing me. And then immediately switching to how they loved me and wanted me to be their wife. And how was I all of a sudden gay? None of this made sense and I was generally afraid as the erratic behavior was generally scary and concerning with some of the things they said earlier. Soon it turned for the worse. They were telling me that they knew where I lived and they were describing my house in perfect detail. I grabbed a baseball bat and ran down the stairs to look out my window. It was pitch black and my fight or flight instincts kicked in as I stared out the window trying to see any sort of shadow moving in the dark. My phone buzzed. They were in the backyard. I just text calmly but in reality I was in a panic and I ran to the back windows. Still pitch black 
and our dim porch and backyard lights weren't any help. All I knew to do then was call the cops. Two cars showed up to my house and I and my parents stayed up a bit later until they left. I showed them the text and they asked if there was anyone who had threatened me. I just told them about my batshit crazy ex. I got a text about how boring I was and that they were blocking me. Not sure if that was related to the cops showing up, making things lame for them, or because I started texting with no reaction whatsoever. Either way, things went too far. Update. So last night, my friend Anna received a call from Tina. It was very interesting. She talked lewdly about what she did with her boyfriend. My friend's response was sarcastic, saying, Thank you for telling me, as she knew it wasn't true. Later, she received a voicemail telling her to kill herself and called her a fat bitch. My friend Mark and I received calls and texts as well. Nothing harmful, just harassment. But we reported every single thing to the head of our high school. Last update. I received over 20 Instagram calls, over 10 phone calls, and 5 voicemails from my ex. Slowed down my phone so much that I was unable to do anything but let it ring. I wanted to tear my head off. Tomorrow I'm getting the police involved again and pressing charges. The worst 12 hours of my life. Trigger warning, sexual assault, mention of rape, and drug use. I've been meaning to post this here for a while. Wrote my first draft back in April, so it's taken me a long time and lots of therapy for me to be able to think about this experience. I've noticed how many people's stories take place over weeks, months, and even years, so I'm here to tell you mine, 12 hours of my life. I managed to block out a lot of memories surrounding this night. But early this year, I was mugged and my PTSD returned, as did a lot of the missing memories of those 12 hours. This is the first time I'm telling anyone the full story of what happened to me. I haven't told my partner, my therapist, my parents. No one knows the details. If there's anything that should be taken away from my story, it's this. Remember that you don't need to be polite to everyone you meet. The setting. It was October 2018. I was 18, in my first year at a university in a big city in the UK. I had always lived in the countryside before this, so was never very street smart. About a year before I went to uni, I started a relationship with this guy, Jimmy, now my ex. It was my first real relationship and I thought the world of him, but it was not reciprocated in a loving, compassionate way. Jimmy started off as very emotionally abusive and got progressively worse, but that's a whole other story. At this point, Jimmy and I had been together just under a year and had applied to universities in the same city, mostly by coincidence, and we both moved to the same city. I wanted to have a proper student life, so got an accommodation in a student block on the other side of the city from him. Jimmy had been using drugs for quite a while, Initially, starting off just smoking weed, but it progressed rapidly, and by the time we were at uni, he was regularly doing a lot of hard drugs, plus smoking weed multiple times a day. Honestly, I don't think he was ever not high. When we moved to university, we saw each other every couple days. He found a regular drug dealer, Mark, that he's been using continually since we got here in September. Jimmy used to buy from Mark multiple times a week, so on a handful of occasions, I had briefly met him. Mark lived a lot closer to my student accommodation than Jimmy's, so a couple weeks before this all happened, Jimmy started picking up drugs from Mark when he would come over to see me, meaning Mark would often be outside my accommodation. Jimmy asked me a few times if I would pick up the drugs he bought from Mark, but I had always felt weird speaking to Mark on my own, plus I rarely smoked weed, so it felt weird picking up drugs in general. 6 p.m. One day at the end of October, Jimmy had plans to come see me that evening and asked me again if I would pick up some weed from Mark. 
I was in a good mood that day and feeling more confident than usual, so for the first time I agreed to. Jimmy gave me Mark's number and said that Mark would message me when he was on his way. Only about 10 minutes later I got a message from Mark saying that he was nearly outside my apartment and that I needed to go outside, so I did. Outside of my accommodation there was a quieter area with a lot of benches, so I sat there and waited for him. Behind me was only a wall and a small contained area that had all the bins for the building. Out of nowhere I felt someone's hand on my shoulder in a really weird creepy way. I jumped obviously and realized it was Mark who I barely recognized as I only briefly seen him a couple times. I realized now that my back had been turned to the wall and the bin storage so he must have been waiting there. I was immediately off guard because of how he touched my shoulder especially since I didn't know him so I shifted away from him and he sat down next to me. He began to talk to me as if we were buddies asking me a million and one questions about myself like deeply personal questions. The whole time I was deflecting not wanting to give any information so I started asking him questions instead. He began a really deep monologue about himself and his life where he openly told me he had just got out of prison a few months before. It was for arm something, some kind of violent crime. I engaged his ramblings just nodding along but trying to get back to the whole point of just picking up the drugs for my boyfriend. 7 p.m. I have always been able to talk to anyone and was always taught to be nice when someone is talking so I ended up sitting there for around an hour trying to get this conversation back to the reason why I was there, pick up drugs for my boyfriend and go. It was so long it was actually starting to get dark. The guy just kept talking. I knew my boyfriend was going to come over soon so I kept looking on my phone to see if he was on his way but he hadn't replied. Eventually, I told Mark I needed to go back inside as I was meeting up with my boyfriend soon and then going clubbing after with some friends, so I needed to get ready. And could I please pick up the drugs? He then said, Oh, well, I can't give them to you here. There's CCTV everywhere. We can go inside so I can give them to you. I had witnessed him giving my boyfriend drugs in that same spot countless times, so I knew it was bullshit. I didn't want Mark to come back to my apartment so I told him we could do it in the lobby of my building where there was a disabled bathroom and he could just give them to me there. He agreed and followed me inside. We went to the bathroom. It was a large room so I don't have to be too close to him. He locked the doors behind us. He began fondling with something in his pocket. I assumed the drugs but instead he pulled on his trousers fully and started peeing in the toilet. I was hugely freaked out. This guy just presented his dick to me and began peeing, but I rationalized that there was no way he had any sexual motive because he had met me and my boyfriend together, so he knew I was in a relationship. I figured he just really needed to pee. I kept my eyes shut the whole time, and when he flushed, I thought he would finally give me the drugs that I was there to collect. The whole thing had been going on for about an hour and a half at this point. He said, I really want to roll myself a joint, but there's no space in here to do it. Can I come and roll it on your desk, and then I'll give you Jimmy stuff. I asked if he could just give it to me now, and he said no, saying that it would be rude not to invite him in. At this point, I wanted to get ready to go out with my friends that evening, and knew my boyfriend would be coming any minute, so I figured it would be okay, though I didn't want this. It's worth noting that I'm emotionally abused by my boyfriend and knew that he would be mad at me if I didn't collect his drugs or if I annoyed Mark because he was his favorite dealer. I honestly figured Mark was harmless and just assured myself that he was only a bit creepy. It would be fine. 8 p.m. Reluctantly, I took Mark to my apartment, opened the door and let him in. I said he had to roll his joint fast because I had to get ready. Finally, he gave me the drugs my boyfriend wanted, so I felt better at that point. He walked over to my desk, moved all my things to the side and sat down, getting out the things to roll his joint. I cannot roll a joint, but I've seen Jimmy do it countless times, so I know it doesn't take more than a minute or so. Mark keeps trying to talk to me, but at this point my answers are getting shorter and shorter. He rolls his joint so slowly, and I can't even describe it. He then said, well, I can't smoke weed outside, 
so is it cool if I just stay in here and smoke it? It'll only take five minutes to smoke. I said no and told him again that I had to get ready. His reply, it's okay, you can get ready with me here. By this point, I was over it. Messaged my boyfriend again to tell him to hurry up. Mark asked me again and it was my frustration and wanting this guy out of my apartment. I just said, okay sure, but be quick. I then went out of my room into the shared kitchen. I had two flatmates and no one else was in that apartment that night. I grabbed some wine and a glass so that I could have some solitary pre-drinks and returned to my room. I sat for another 15 minutes being increasingly less polite, but he kept talking to me. I drank my first glass of wine fast and decided if Mark was going to take ages, then I would just get ready to go with my friends. I told him that as soon as he finished smoking, he could just leave on his own. So I left him at my desk, took some clothes into the bathroom and jumped into the shower. 9 PM. Maybe a minute or so into my shower, I heard soft footsteps outside the door. And like a scene from a freaking horror movie, I saw the door handle slowly be pushed down. Thank fuck, I remembered to lock the door. All of a sudden, Mark began banging on the door. I turned the shower off and just said, um, hi? Through the door. He shouted through the door, asking me to let him in because he needed to pee again. I obviously said no and just got dried and dressed. Thankfully, I took my clothes into the bathroom. By this point, I figured there was no way he was going to leave my apartment until I did, so I did my makeup as fast as I physically could and messaged my friends that I would be coming to theirs sooner than I had planned. I still hadn't gotten a reply from my boyfriend, so I just told him I was going out early and not to come over. I got ready to go and told Mark I was leaving now and that he needed to come downstairs with me. He was still sat at my desk and just ignored what I was saying. He asked if he could stay in my room while I was out because he was tired and wanted a nap. Finally, I was firm with him and after a lot of convincing, he left. I made sure to order an Uber to my friend's place so that he couldn't try to walk with me. And by the time we got outside, my Uber was nearly there. He stood with me, looking over my shoulder at my phone the whole time. Then the Uber arrived, I got in, and Mark straight up walked around the other side and got in. I was in disbelief and laughed, then told my Uber driver that I don't know who this guy was and that he was not getting in with me. The Uber driver was not as polite as me and told Mark to get out, and he did. 10 PM. I sat there on the way to my friend's house and finally felt calm that I had gotten away from Mark. I called my friend from the Uber and told her what happened. She said that she would come outside of her building to get me with a group of her flatmates. My friend's accommodations were not too far from mine and took longer to get by car than on foot because of the one-way system in the city, but I didn't care at this point. Maybe 10 to 15 minutes later I arrived and my friends came over to my Uber. Then they brought me back to her group of friends. She had quite a few people with her and suddenly I noticed that one of her male flatmates was talking to someone slightly away from the group. I looked over and suddenly realized he was talking to Mark. I guess he was looking at the address when the Uber app was open earlier. I whispered to my friend and she freaked out and went inside with me straight away. I was super freaked out that this guy wouldn't just leave me alone. He refused to leave my side for the last few hours and now had followed me to a friend's house? Honestly, I felt much safer now and met a few creeps in my time so I just decided to get over it by having a nice time with my friends. So we sat in our kitchen having a chat and some drinks. 11 PM. After a while of talking to her, I almost forgot about what happened just an hour ago and was getting increasingly tipsy from the wine. The kitchen door opened and her male flatmate comes inside announcing that he had invited a guy in who had given him free weed. You guessed it, Mark walked in. Mark addressed me by name and walked over, putting his hands around my waist from behind. I get pretty confident when I drink, so I had no problem pushing him off of me and announcing to everyone in a joking way, yeah, this is the guy who has been following me around all evening. I don't know him. Even in this room with all my friend's flatmates, I didn't feel safe. He stayed away from me, looking at me while I was on the other side of the kitchen, 
and I just ignored him. My friend could tell that I was uncomfortable, so he suggested we go to drink in her room. Around 30 minutes after going into her room, the door slams open suddenly. Mark is standing there. He says, Oh, I thought this was the bathroom. Can I use yours? My friend had an ensuite. She tells him to get the fuck out, and he does. I'm honestly just bored of this guy's constant presence at this point, so we decide to go to the club early. Midnight. So we grab our stuff, run past the kitchen door, and outside. My friend orders us an Uber, and we get in and go to the club. After a while, some of her flatmates join us, but Mark does not. Thank God. The people who had been in the kitchen said Mark left shortly after he saw me leave, but there was no sign of him now. I just tried to enjoy my night, but being a poor student, I can't afford any more drinks at the club. As I began to sober up, I realized how shaken up and creeped out the whole evening had made me, and I don't feel safe. After only a couple hours, I decided I just wanted to go home and sleep because this whole experience freaked me the fuck out. I take an Uber back, use my keycard to get into my apartment building, go upstairs and into my apartment. I started getting ready for bed, put some PJs on, and started taking off my makeup. All of a sudden, I heard a loud knock on my door. I had no clue who it was, but since it was still earliest for a Friday night, I thought it was my boyfriend maybe finally deciding to show up. The door didn't have a peephole, so I walked up to the door in my PJs, unlocked it, and planned on opening it a tiny bit to see who it was, and then bam, the door flew open so fast that I was pushed backwards into my apartment, and then shoved into my room, which was directly across from the front door. In my panic, I froze. Then I looked up only to realize Mark was now standing in my apartment. The realization started to sink in. Mark had just forced his way into my room and I was trapped in here with him. He was visibly angry and very high. He locked the door behind him and began rambling about how I was so rude for not inviting him in with my friends, for just ignoring him, for not letting him in the Uber, etc. I was terrified, so I ran over to my bed and grabbed my phone. He walked over from behind me and began grabbing me, touching me as much as he could, so I shouted at him to get off. He saw my phone in my hand and immediately smiled and told me to open the camera. I was so terrified, so I did as he said, and he said he wanted to take a picture of us together. I did as I was told and took a selfie with him while he posed with his arms around me and then kissing my cheek and neck. He then screamed at me to unlock my phone, so I did. He made me open my messages and send Jimmy a selfie of me and Mark sitting next to each other on my bed, so I did. He waited for it to send and then grabbed my phone and put it on my desk. He sat at my desk for the next four to five hours, talking at me continually, saying how I was so rude. I needed someone to teach me manners, how I had to do what he said because he was older than me. How Jimmy wasn't good enough for me, how I was so beautiful, and how he knew I needed to be with him. He told me that his girlfriend knew that he had been at my house that evening, and now she said he can't come home, and that it was all my fault. The whole time I continued bargaining with him, trying to get him to leave, but it didn't work. Occasionally, I would just lay down on my bed, or sit, and not speak. Each time I did, he would get up and wrap his arms around me or try to spoon me, stroke my face, try to kiss me, and even try to take off my clothes and touch me. Every time I fought him off and he would get angry again, go sit at the desk and keep shouting. I knew this guy had previously been in prison for some kind of violent crime, so I did not want to piss him off. I just sat there for hours and quietly sobbed, too scared to try to leave because I would have to walk past him in order to get to the door. I was out of options, I didn't know if I could get out without angering him. I couldn't call the cops because he had my phone. My flatmates weren't in, so my screams meant nothing. While he was sat at my desk, he kept smoking more weed or taking a line of whatever drug, so he was becoming more and more out of it. He was becoming more sleepy as he smoked more weed until I was able to speak between his ramblings. So I gently said I was going to the bathroom. 
I noticed his eyes partially closed and figured I only had one chance. So I took the opportunity and grabbed my phone off the desk as fast as I could. I unlocked the door and ran out of the apartment. The one thing I'll always remember is being in tears, pressing the button for the elevator to come, probably about 50 times, because I was so scared that he was going to come after me. As I got into the elevator, I heard him come out of my apartment, shouting my name, but the elevator doors closed and he just looked at me. I was able to get downstairs and out of the building. I ran around the corner of the building in my PJs and manically dialed the number for the police. I told them what happened and that the guy was in prison until recently. The next thing I knew, there was five police cars showing up. I was in such a state and called my boyfriend to tell him what happened. He was still awake and hadn't came to visit me that night because he was with a girl who was a friend and said that now he didn't want to come be with me because he had some weed on him and didn't need to be near the police. I told him to get to my place now and he reluctantly did. The Aftermath the police had to force entry into my apartment because Mark had locked himself in and barricaded the door. They arrested him and he ended up going to prison for drug charges but not for what he did and tried to do to me. The police said they couldn't prosecute him because I willingly let him into my apartment earlier in the night and he hadn't physically done anything. Sexual assault and attempted rape plus holding me hostage in my own apartment but okay. After I had given my statement to the police, I went back inside to see that after I had escaped, my room was trashed. Mark had thrown things around and smashed things in anger. I'm so glad I got out when I did because I can't imagine what would have happened if I was trapped in the crossfire. I don't know what happened to Mark after that, but I moved out of the apartment a couple months later and away from the city as soon as I could when COVID hit to make Mark sure that he could never find me. I actually stayed in my abusive relationship for another year or so until I realized that I was too good to put up with Jimmy's shit. I had such severe PTSD from the incident that I couldn't go outside for months after, which messed up the whole first year of university. It has taken until now for me to be able to walk around at night and being alone in public is still really difficult. I'm well aware that the ending is very anticlimactic, and I wish I had been able to advocate for myself but I just shut down emotionally afterwards. I can't get into too much details of sexual assault or attempted rape because honestly thinking about it makes me want to throw up. But I realized I was so lucky to be able to fight him off every time because without a doubt he wanted to hurt me. After this all happened, I started volunteering with people in prison for crimes like sexual assault to try to prevent them from reoffending. I think it is my way of advocating for others because I couldn't advocate for myself. If you take one thing away from this, stop being polite. I was raised to be nice to everyone and I realize now that being polite worsened everything. I wish I never would have been polite enough to pick up the drugs for my ex or polite enough to let Mark into my apartment when he begged. So Mark, fuck you and please let's not meet again. This isn't so much one encounter, but it was a terrifying experience. I've never told this story to anyone besides the police, but I've been thinking about it a lot lately and only recently realized how much this whole thing really fucked me up. So here goes. I met this guy at a bar one night. We had a great time, partied all night and eventually ended up back at my apartment. After that night, he basically lived with me instead of the hostel he was staying at. We clicked right away and I enjoyed having him there. We dated for almost three months before the first night he attacked me. It was a night that we celebrated my 30th birthday party, had a blast and passed out around 3 a.m. He had told me that he suffered from PTSD and night terrors. He had woken up many nights freaking out. I was deeply passed out when I was woken up by five quick blows to my head and face. I tried to cover myself not knowing what the hell was going on when I realized my arms were pinned to my side. He was sitting on my chest with his legs on my arms and strangled me before I had any idea where I was. 
I only remember the light fading and going black as he squeezed harder on my neck. When he let go, the blood eventually rushed back to my brain and I remember seeing him walk to the bathroom. At that point, I grabbed my dogs and ran to my car and took off. He must have passed back out. He called me hours later completely confused of where I went. I told him everything he had done and he promised me he didn't mean to do any of that and that he would never do that on purpose and promised to seek help. I agreed to come back on the terms that if he ever scared me again, he'd be gone. Exactly one week later, again in my sleep, I woke up with him on top of me. I slowly pushed him off and pretended to get ready for work. Out of nowhere, he jumped up and sucker punched me in the mouth. I fell onto the bed and he again tried to strangle me. This time I didn't fight it and pretended to pass out. He let me go once he thought I passed out and went into the kitchen. As soon as he left, I grabbed my dogs and booked it to my car again. I jumped into my car and locked it. This time he chased me. This is when I realized this wasn't some PTSD nightmare sleepwalking freakout. He was a psychopath. He was awake and very coherent. He started screaming that he would burn my house down if I didn't come out, trying to break my windows and get into my car. As soon as I got my doors locked, I called the cops. He went back inside. When the cops arrived, I told him that he was crazy and might try to attack them. When they went in, he was quietly awaiting for them and went with them without any resistance. He knew what he did. It wasn't until the trial that I found out that he had a knife under the bed. When he let me go and went to the kitchen thinking I passed out, he went to get a butcher's knife and left it on the bed to chase me out. No one could prove what he was planning, but I'm convinced that he was going to stab me to death. He wasn't charged with anything at the end because the DA pulled some fancy luring maneuvers and tricked him into walking right out into the arms of the ice as soon as he left the courtroom. I have to say that that was satisfying to watch. He was deported and banned from the country. He continues to try to contact me on social media by making new accounts to try to get me to help his appeal and be allowed back. Nope. He still claims that he wasn't awake for any of this. I don't know what to believe, but I know that I feel a fuck lot safer with him on the other side of the globe. I've been having a hard time sleeping since then. I kind of brushed everything off and carried on with my life, as if nothing ever happened. Thinking about it recently, I realized that being attacked in your sleep and coming that close to possibly being a murder victim might cause some long-lasting psychological damage. I am considering seeking help. I think maybe sharing this story for the first time might be a healthy first step. So this story I'm about to tell you just happened recently. But to connect all the pieces correctly, I have to tell you a little backstory as well. So I'm a 26 year old gay man and a few months ago I got a message and a friend request from an ex. This ex was my first when I was 16 and he was 5 years older. Long story short, he dumped me right before Christmas. He claimed he couldn't handle the age gap and completely shut me off. I was devastated and was depressed for 6 months after this happened. I was only 16 at the time, so I haven't heard from him in ages. In the random times I would stalk him on social media, I never found anything. A couple years ago, I did find a Facebook page and saw a few posts of his family members, and it almost looked like he had died. I assumed suicide or something similar, and I actually kind of forgot about the whole thing. Then I received a friend request and a message. Me being the nice person, I decided since I was completely over him, I would engage in conversation and see what happens. Everything was normal for a situation like this, and he explained that he went to jail for a few years. After chatting for a while, while catching up, we stopped talking for a while. Nothing unusual either. Then a few weeks ago, he started messaging me again. This time, something seemed weird. He was talking about relationships and getting very upset over details about my current relationship. I thought this was extremely odd and kind of stopped chatting back. Suddenly, there were posts on social media and mass texts that he needed help. He was getting kicked out of his apartment. But the odd thing was, he was just moving to another apartment. 
After a few more random text messages ranging from I need help, I can't handle life, come hang out on the rooftop, and just condescending updates online, he finally asked why I hadn't responded to any of his help requests and how he thought I was better than that. At this point, I was really annoyed and decided that I would just end this. I told him that I didn't think our friendship would work and I was glad to catch up and wished him the best. No response. I figured he got the message and was just not going to respond. A few days passed and still no response. I deleted his messages and moved on. Two days later, a flower on my porch. I didn't think anything of it and continued on with my everyday life. Then I noticed some other odd things. Around my house, some of the plants were pressed down like someone had stomped them. It was only around my bedroom window and my bathroom. My backyard looks out over a farm and woods, so I never have my curtains closed. Thinking this was odd, I still never connected the two things. I figured that animals must lay down there or something. A couple days later when I came home later in the evening, I noticed the power was off to the house. I noticed a storm headed to us, but it hasn't hit yet, plus we don't normally lose power. I pulled my keys out and opened the front door leaving my car in the driveway instead of the garage. I live in a really safe area, so I didn't even bother locking my car. Inside my house, the curtains were still pulled shut and it was semi-dark. With no power on, the air was starting to get stuffy. I put my stuff down in the kitchen and headed to the basement to check the power box. Walking down the steps, I heard a noise on the other side of the house, but I didn't stop as I have cats and they tend to jump and run around. Everything was on and nothing looked odd about the electrical box. I walked back upstairs and at this point, I saw a figure out of the corner of my eye. I froze, my mind raced, and my only thought was to act natural, as if I didn't see anything. I faked a little sneeze to make up for the sudden freezing. I quickly pulled out my phone and texted my friend, 911, help, and quickly called her. She didn't pick up, damn it. I casually left a voicemail. Uh, hey, I just got home. I have no power. You and Dave said you're still coming over like you said? Just come in. The back door will be open. I tried to sound casual, but off for her. Dave is actually her father's name, and we've never called him by his name unless she was telling stories about his time in the war. She was also not supposed to be coming over that night either. I casually walked to the back door, trying to watch my entire surroundings. I didn't see anything or hear anything. I just started to think that my mom was playing tricks on me. I go to unlock the back door and the screen door is always locked. Both were unlocked. Try not to panic, I just opened the door and let the screen door open. I slowly turned and tried to think of something else I can do that might casually get me out of the house quickly. As I was standing in my kitchen thinking about making a run for my car, I heard a loud bang outside. I jumped and ran to the front door. Nothing. I looked over and saw my car's interior lights on though. Did someone just break into my car? I turned to grab my keys from the kitchen when I saw something move in the living room. I don't know why I said, hello? As soon as I did, I wanted to kick myself. I slowly moved to the kitchen to grab my car keys and run, but they were gone. How were they gone? That's all I remember before I was waking up in my bed all the lights on in my bedroom. It felt like a truck had hit me. My entire body was sore and heavy. My eyes slowly focused on the room and I managed to pull myself into the sitting position. What the hell happened, I thought. I slowly stood up and searched for my phone. It was on the kitchen island. The time was 2.30 AM. I quickly searched through my text messages. Nothing that was odd. Feeling a little less groggy, I checked my doors, windows, and all the rooms. I don't fully know what happened that night, but there was no evidence of someone being in my home. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night and honestly felt a little bit crazy. The following morning, however, was a different story. I had finally fallen asleep sometime after 4, and I woke up around 8am to a text message on my phone. It was a random number and it only said, Last night was fun. We should do it again. 
with initials after it. I just froze. Those were the same as my ex. I immediately text back, what did you do? But I got a message back saying the number was invalid. I never heard anything again or had any weird occurrences again. Hopefully I never do. So the story happened to me the first year of high school. I met a guy called Nathan and we became close very quickly because we were both introverted and shy. So we understood each other and were comfy around each other. I was very emeritive because he was the sweetest and the most respectful boy I've ever met. He always made sure I was okay and not scared with him because I'm a very shy person. We were very close and he was very handsome so everyone thought that we were together and a lot of girls were into him and I thought I was into him too which was not wrong. We were just friends but we started flirting a little bit but we were both young and shy 14 years old. So nothing happened. The next year of high school, he moved to another city and we stopped talking. Not because we stopped liking each other, but just because life made it this way. After one year, we started talking again and we were both very happy and had a lot of fun talking on Snapchat and even started flirting a little bit. He decided to go back to the city where our school was and asked me to hang out with him alone. I was totally okay about him because as I said, he was very respectful and I trusted him deeply. We saw each other two times alone and everything went well. We had a lot of fun and I felt very safe. He asked me to come to his house for a party with me and his friends that I know too, because some of his old friends are mine too. I said okay and went to his city, which was far away from my home. Obviously there was some alcohol and Nathan and I were laughing about it because I get drunk quickly, but I was totally fine with being drunk around him because I knew that he would protect me from any danger. So I started drinking around 10 p.m., but not a lot because I was supposed to come home the following day in my friend's car and I didn't want to vomit in the car. Since I did this, I don't have any memories of the party except the fact that I danced with Nathan and all the stuff which happened in the very beginning of the party before drinking. In the morning I woke up in a room, but I don't remember if it was the place I fell asleep in. I felt very sick, like I'd never been before. And it was very hard for me to move. I was almost paralyzed. I succeeded on standing up and looked out the window just next to me because I heard some noises. I saw the person who was supposed to drive me home leave the house. Trying to scream to catch her attention even though the windows were closed, I was too weak to scream or focus on anything. I fell asleep again because I was very sick and woke up a bit after, but I was still tired and I searched for the phone around me without finding it. It seemed weird because I always kept the phone right next to me. I was still tired and a bit sick, so I laid there and closed my eyes. A few minutes after, I heard Nathan entering the room and touching me, checking if I was okay. I don't know why, but I kept my eyes closed and didn't move. Also, I had my back to him, so he didn't see my face, and I guess he thought I was still asleep. When he left the room, he locked me in, and I started panicking. Why would he lock me in? I didn't focus on that because I trusted him, but I had a weird feeling. I rested for a little and woke up and knocked on the door of the room. Nathan opened it up, and I asked him why he locked me in the room, and why my friends left without me. He said he locked the room because he didn't want anyone to bother me and that I was very drunk and he was worried. So he preferred letting me sleep in even though my friend was leaving. And his aunt was coming in the afternoon and he would ask her to drive me home. After that, I started looking around for my phone but couldn't find it in the mess because of the party. Nathan told me that he would clean the room and we would probably find my phone. But he wanted me to eat first because it was already around 12. So we ate, but I noticed his brother didn't come out to eat too. I didn't say anything because I suppose he was just busy playing video games or just wasn't hungry. Later in the afternoon, Nathan went upstairs to clean the room where the party had taken place and I stayed downstairs watching TV. I was bored and started feeling stressed out on the fact that I lost my phone and that I hadn't seen his brother and his aunt hadn't come here yet. So I started looking in every room, but his brother wasn't here. 
When I wanted to go outside to check if his brother was out there, I saw every door in the window were closed and I started stressing out. Also, I was not hearing any cleaning sounds. Nathan heard the sounds of me trying to open the doors and came downstairs and told me that his parents told him to keep every door closed when he was alone. But he's not the type of guy that would listen carefully to his parents, so I started to doubt him, but I kept calm. While he was checking to make sure everything was closed, I went upstairs quietly and started looking for my phone again. But instead, I found a backpack with not only my phone, one pad of sleeping pills, where two pills were missing, and ropes. You can't imagine how panicked I was. I had just enough time to take my phone before Nathan started coming up the stairs very quickly. He saw that I had my phone and started looking at me in a way that he never did before and tried to grab the phone from me and catch me. I was panicking, but thank God I had the idea of saying, if you try coming close, I'm calling the police. I ran as quickly as I could downstairs and ran into a window. I don't know what I did to be so lucky, but I punched on the window hard to make noises and the postman saw me and understood that I was in danger. I'm very lucky because in my country, postmen usually work in the morning and very rarely in the afternoon, around 4 p.m. Nathan saw that the postman saw me and stared menacing at Nathan to let me go and he did. So I ran as quickly as I could to the postman's car and asked him to drive me to the closest train station and he did. He also asked me if I wanted him to call the police, but I was in a state of shock and invented a story to make him stop worrying. I came to the police a few days later and they told me that I was probably drugged and that's why I was sick and so tired. I won't tell you about what happened next because of privacy, but I'm fine now and Nathan got what he deserved. So I'll just throw this one out there. In the early 2000s, when I was 4 or 5, my parents had just gotten a divorce and my mom started dating this guy. Anyway, my mom started seeing this guy and he would come to our house regularly. Things didn't seem bad at first, but he drank daily. This wasn't something I understood yet at my age. Let's skip to the bad stuff. So this guy wasn't too bad to my sister, who was 2 or 3 at the time, but he took some sadistic interest in hurting me. He arrived at our house almost every day, and the first thing he would do was take off his belt and start beating me with it. This had gotten to the point where I would hide if I knew he was coming. As for why my mother didn't leave him, he threatened to kill us if she did. Now this one incident that's burning to my memory. On a random day, he had found this nice little cardboard box. He picked me up and shoved me inside the box and sat on top of it. My mom was doing the dishes so I assumed she couldn't hear me screaming for her as I peered out the box's handle holes at her back. Before he covered the holes with his hands, I screamed a good few minutes as his asshole just laughed about torturing me. The only reason why he got off the box was I had a small screwdriver in my back pocket that I used to stab him in his ass. This got him to fly off the box and pissed him off because he wasn't having fun anymore. He picked me up again and carried me off to my room where he proceeded to beat me with his belt. Then he left me in my room after taking my lamp and locking my door. I was afraid of the dark, so I cried and screamed some more. I kept crying until he finally left and my mother came in and opened my door. The random beatings would go on until he eventually got into some trouble and ended up in jail. Sometimes I think maybe my mother called the police on him. He called my mom from jail and told her that if she found anyone else, that he would kill her, me, and my younger sister. We ended up moving three cities over, and as far as I know, my mom never heard from him again. This asshole is almost single-handedly responsible for several of my long-term phobias, and as an adult now, I'll kick his ass if I ever saw him again. So psycho asshole, for my sake and yours, let's never meet again. This started a little over two years ago when I dated my ex. We'll call him John. He was abusive and cheated. I had issues at home, so I had to stay with him. It was an on and off relationship for three months. I broke up with him and moved on. I started dating my friend at the time, let's say Billy, still together to this day. 
but John didn't move on. He harassed me, my boyfriend, my friends and family for weeks. He called, texted, and even showed up to our apartment. He went as far to have his mom message me on Instagram. I got a harassment restraining order filed against him. Three days after John received the restraining order, he called me and proceeded to show up at my job. It took two weeks for the police to gather the restraining order paperwork before arresting him. He eventually went to court and pled guilty. For the next year and a half, he continued to message my Billy and my friends and occasionally talked about me. Then out of nowhere, he followed my boyfriend and I into a goodwill. I called the cops and after a couple weeks, there's now a warrant out for his arrest. My neighbor has seen him a few times outside of our apartment complex. He also messaged someone I know and tried to convince him to ask me to join a three-way with him. When he was called out, he claimed that it was a fake account. I am terrified to leave my apartment or go online. He won't leave me alone, even with the restraining order, and he also has a boyfriend. My ex JJ was a creep. I was with him for 19 months. This happened around two months into the relationship as he was just starting to get controlling and it terrified me. It was around 2 a.m. and I was in bed. I have super bad insomnia, so I was listening to YouTube and scrolling through Reddit, not expecting to sleep for at least a couple hours when I heard a tap on my window. I assumed it was my cat, so I called her name because he always meowed when she heard her name. It was silent and then tap, tap, tap. I turned my YouTube down and called out my cat's name again. I heard him meow in the bathroom and panicked. It wasn't her outside my window. So outside my window is the roof of the extension that was built. It slopes up to my window so it can easily be climbed onto via my neighbor's wood shed. At this point, I knew someone was out there, but I was too scared to look. I sent JJ a message about it, but he was asleep so it sent, but it didn't deliver. The tapping kept happening. Roughly every 20 seconds there would be a tap tap tap, and then the silence. It continued for about 45 minutes while I laid in bed just listening. I felt like I was stuck in bed, like if I came out from under the quilt, then they would somehow get me. After about an hour, I realized it stopped completely. I pulled myself out of my bed and went into my kitchen. From there, I could see the roof. I saw a pair of legs dangling over the edge, illuminated by a torch. I decided to give up with my room and I slept on the sofa with my cat that night. At least whoever it was wouldn't know where I was. Next thing I know, I'm waking up to my alarm. I go to turn it off and I notice I have a Snapchat from JJ, which is odd but not unheard of. They're from around 3.30 in the morning, so probably just after I fell asleep. I opened the snaps and my stomach dropped. It was a photo of my bedroom window from the outside, then one of legs dangling in my garden, and then one of me sleeping on the sofa, taking through the kitchen window. I messaged him asking him what the fuck he was doing. I got a reply saying that he came to my house to check on me and chase a guy off from my house. At that point, he had me convinced he could do no wrong, and if I opposed him, I was scared about what might happen, so I just left it at that. From then on, it happened a couple more times, and every time I would just try to ignore it. But with the joy of hindsight, I know I shouldn't have. I should have told someone and broken up with him, but I was too scared of what he might do. I have a lot of stories about JJ. I might write some more. I've been considering putting it into a book somewhere, but I'm not sure. My ex and I broke up about a year ago and it got very messy. I was receiving DMs, texts, and Snapchats from what seemed like everyone from her hometown. I got everything from calling me names to death threats. I ended up having to block 10 people from three different sources of social media, but that's besides the point. 
The worst threat I received was from her recent ex. Oh, you hurt my girl? It's over for you. I know what town you live in. I will find you, and when I do, your parents won't even be able to recognize your body. He also sent me several others, explaining the ways he would torture me. I just ended up blocking him, along with everyone else, and moved on with my life. Well, today, getting close to our one year of breaking up, my ex and I have started talking again and are on okay terms and everything seemed fine. I go about my day and walk over to this popular deli to grab a bite to eat and end up passing a friend of mine along the way. They shouted my name across the street and I head over. We talk for a bit and split ways and I head over to the deli. This is when I was approached by three taller guys. My fucking stomach hit the ground when I saw the guy's face. It was the ex-boyfriend. I knew instantly from having to stare at his profile picture and he brought friends to find me. He quickly grabbed my shoulder and tightly looked me in the eyes. I stared back into his and they seemed full of rage and instantly, I finally found you, he said in the probably the most calm voice as he continued to whisper, you know what I have to do to you now, I'm a man of my word. Every inch of my goddamn body began to crawl. Fight or flight was kicking in, and time felt slow-mo. My brain was running a million miles per hour. Three verse one. Okay, this isn't good, but they can't just kill me in broad daylight. Do they have a car? Oh god, are they gonna kidnap me first? I started to look around for an exit. He then tightened his grip and said, Nobody's gonna save you. This is when I booked it, full pedal to the metal. I knocked his grip off of me and watched the three guys try to grab me, but I was already gone. I ran as fast as I could. Thankfully, I know this area pretty well, so I took off towards the direction of my friend's apartment. They chased, and after screaming full-blown battle cries, I turned a corner, and by the luck of God, someone was exiting my friend's apartment building, which had a lock from the outside gate. I dashed in and slammed the gate behind me. I watched for about five minutes as they searched the nearby area for me, checking behind dumpsters. These guys were serious. I feel lucky to even be telling this event right now. This is one crazy motherfucker I hope to never meet again. So I matched with this girl on Tinder, named Jenna. Jenna and I went on our first date on January 26th. She knew I was out of a long-term relationship and still maintained occasional contact with my ex, Mary. Jenna and I officially started calling each other boyfriend and girlfriend around mid-February. Three days ago, while I was in a shower, she goes through my phone and reads old messages between Mary and I. A few casual ones and a few very affectionate ones before Jenna and I started seeing each other or even met. Jenna packs all her things and is heading out the door when I get out of the shower with my phone. She texts a bunch of people saying things like, I'm an asshole. And, Mary is a manipulative bitch. She hacks into my Facebook and makes a post calling Mary a whole slew of names and blocks several of my friends. She does the same thing with Twitter. I get a hold of a coworker's phone and use it to try to contact her and sign back into my Facebook. Once she realizes I did, she changed my password and my email passwords as well. Eventually, she tells me she wants to talk this out, and we meet at my place. I play along so I can get my phone and passwords back. She gives me my phone and makes me call Mary, telling her that I'm cutting her out of my life. I got a hold of Mary earlier and warned her that something like this might happen. We both have a background in theater. So we had a very convincing argument over speakerphone so Jenna could hear. Jenna gives me my passwords and I immediately change them. I tell her that she should leave and she doesn't understand why I want her out of my life. She goes home very upset about me breaking up with her over this. Jenna starts posting and commenting on Facebook and I block her. I block her on everything and she begins calling me over and over, not saying anything when I answer the phone. I block her number. I start receiving the same calls over and over again from a number in Colorado. I live in Canada. 
Eventually, I go to my phone provider and change my number. I also change the locks on my door in case she took a key. Next day, she makes a Facebook post calling me a piece of shit and she hacks into my alt Twitter account. I tell her if she calls me one more time or posts one more thing about anyone I know, I'm calling the police. So then I get an email that my application for a credit card with a bank I do not use has been approved. I call the bank and tell them what's happening and they froze the account. Several friends told me to call the police and I finally realized enough is enough. The police come and tell me that she has some sort of file with them and that her name isn't Jenna. It's something completely different. They issued a warning of harassment and if she tries to contact me again, I call the police and she'll get arrested. On Monday, I have to call the fraud people and get my accounts frozen and investigated and stuff. I realize this is a lot, but this is actually a pretty bare bones version of the story. Basically, the reason I'm posting this is now that the police got involved and I've had my locks changed and my number changed, I'm starting to feel emotionally damaged of being abused and harassed by someone I was actually starting to care about and I don't know how to deal with it. It's hard to pinpoint when this occurred, but every time I think it's finally over, I'm reminded it's not. Tate was my first ever boyfriend. This story is supposed to focus on things he did after we broke up, so I'll quickly gloss over what happened during our relationship. And yeah, I was really stupid back then, so brace yourself for cringe. Also, prepare for a lot of cursing. This is going to be a long and angry one. We started dating shortly before my 15th birthday. The whole relationship was a mess. He convinced me to steal money from my grandmother and run away with him. He cheated on me multiple times, got me pregnant, birth control failed, and dumped me for another girl, only to come crawling back to me after he coerced me into having an abortion. He also lied a lot, like a lot, but of course, I forgave him over and over again. The whole ordeal lasted 21 months before I finally had it and ended it once and for all. He frequently called me, sometimes in the middle of the night, often drunk or high. In a particular hilarious incident, he called me while getting pounded by another guy to let me know that he was getting pounded by another guy. He would also often pass by my house, sending me messages like, I see your mom still drives the same car. One time, he refused to leave until I came down and told him that I was done with him. I threatened to call the cops, which pissed him off. I eventually just blocked him everywhere I possibly could. And I started dating again three months after our breakup. Her name was Emma. Tate somehow found out who I was dating and sent her fake screenshots of text messages that implied that I still loved him and wanted him back in an attempt to sabotage my new relationship. Lucky for me, Emma had a brain and quickly caught onto the fact that he was bullshitting her. Since I blocked him everywhere, he ended up messaging a friend of mine. He said that he's been stalking me and was threatening to kill her. I called the cops, but they just told me that they couldn't do much as long as it was nothing but messages on the internet. Emma is still alive and well, so it was all empty threats, but it was certainly enough for me to be terrified to leave the house for a few months. Emma and I eventually broke up. Once again, Taysom found out about that and decided to use the opportunity of me being single. Mind you, Emma and I had dated over two years, so Tate and I's breakup was more than two and a half years ago. I also found out later that he had a girlfriend and a son. He turned up on my doorstep at 5 o'clock in the morning. He messaged me from a new profile and demanded me to come downstairs to say goodbye because he was moving to LA. I'm from Europe, so not only would he need a visa, which requires a lot of money and could take several years to be approved, his English skills were also practically non-existent. He stood in front of my door, looking up at my window, smiling and waving. I told him to piss off or I was calling the cops, after which he went on a long rant about what a whore I was and how no one trusts him and really a lot of nonsense. 
I blocked the new profile, and when I dared to take another look at the window 30 minutes later, he was gone. I really don't want to know what would have happened if I'd gone outside that day. That was three years ago, and I honestly thought that would be it. After all, our breakup happened almost six years ago now. A few months ago though. Alright, backstory needed. I fell in love with someone online. He lives in America. We got married, and I moved to America. I decided to clean up my block list on Facebook. It had been such a long time. I didn't think much of it when I unblocked him. After all, I was married and lived halfway across the planet now. Not one month after I unblocked him, he messaged me in the dead of night, which would have been the same time in the morning for him. Hey, I was just about to stop by when I remembered that you live 5,000 miles away now. How's it going? I straight up have no idea how he knows I moved to America. Profile on Facebook is set to private. I had a mild anxiety attack, even though I knew he literally couldn't touch me. I don't want to talk to you, was my response. Are you sure? I'd like to know how it's going with your husband, and how is America? I replied, yes, I'm sure. I don't want to tell you about me, or my husband, or my life in America. I'm done with you. I've been done with you. Just leave me alone. His response was a one minute long voice message. I didn't listen to it because I didn't want to hear his voice. Instead, I forwarded it to a friend who listened to it for me. According to her, there was a lot of rambling. He apologized for the voice message, saying his cab driver had punched him, which leads me to believe that he was either drunk or high, again, and how he still likes me, and that he would love to stay in contact, and if I wanted someone to talk to, he'd be there. The rest was unintelligible, as there were sirens in the background. I never replied. Instead, I blocked him, again. Every time something like this happens, I think it's the last time, but at this point, it feels like I'll never fully get rid of him. My best friend and I, both female, and 16 and 17 at the time, went to the mall near her house and were walking around the normal stores we would check out. We saw this cute guy, 18 to 19, but I didn't know how to approach him since we were social outcasts. He must have noticed because he came to talk to us. After a month or so, I started dating him for about five months or so, and I'm introduced to pot and mushrooms. A few weeks to a month into the relationship, he tells me about a girlfriend he had back in Tennessee that cheated on him when he moved down south. He told me that he knew the Mexican Mafia and, in great detail, how he wanted to kidnap both his ex and the guy she cheated on him with and their families and slowly torture and kill them. I thought he was joking until he got into lengthy details of injecting acid into veins, violent beatings, and body disposal. My parents picked me up after that. Not telling them what I learned, I just silently cried in the back of the car. He shows me his sword and knife collection shortly before I joined a D&D &D group that hosts at a store in the mall I live next to. After I join, he becomes very upset and jealous and went as far as showing up during a session I was not present for and threatened him with some of his knives. I of course apologized to my group since I knew every one of them from my friend group at school. Not much later, he thinks that I'm pregnant and shows me a case from the FBI that included black gloves and weighted knuckles just in case he needed to force a miscarriage by beating me. I went to my best friend's house since she lived down the street. Her entire household of maybe 12 or so was waiting for me outside and her stepbrothers had the guns ready. We talked him down and he just took me to get the morning after pill. I don't remember what caused this but at some point I sent him a lengthy message of I'm sorry and he made me bow to him the next time I saw him and say it as many times as I wrote it. He also threw something I gave him in the street and kept running after it, picking it up, running back to me just to throw it. I used to take the light rail every weekend to see him since it was right next to my school and it had right down the street from him. He once fell asleep when I was riding it and wouldn't answer his home phone or cell phone. 
I had to walk like two or three miles in the Arizona sun during midsummer to get to him since he was closer than my friend. After that, I started going to his house less and hanging out with my friends closer to home. He called me one day when I was hanging out with someone who shared the name with one of my D&D mates and he blew up. We basically ended our relationship over the phone and I hung up on him. I refused to answer his calls as well. He wound up apologizing and attempted to win me back. I refused and he started threatening driving into my house. I don't remember having any physical or visual interactions with him since. I don't think I would have been able to leave him if we didn't have that fight over the phone. I'm terrified of what would have happened if I managed to try to break up with him in person. Or worse, if we had gotten married. Which he mentioned while trying to win me back that he was going to ask me to marry him. I had another piece of shit boyfriend a few years later for about a year and it caused additional mental trauma. I don't want to go into too much detail really, but he would make me watch him punch himself in the middle of the head or bang his head against the wall. It was as if he was punishing someone else with how much he put into it. Both of these men could have easily done something terribly worse if their relationships had not ended. I refused to date anyone five years after that relationship. I wanted someone to connect with me and didn't change after we started getting physical. My boyfriend of the last two and a half years is aware of some of these details and is very understanding as to why I shut down during certain situations. He's been trying to help me open up to him since I only ever had one other normal relationship and hadn't had another person care for my feelings and opinions for a long time. He can tell when something's wrong and will keep asking me until I tell him since he knows I'll still shut down but I want to open up to him. In the time I've been with him, I found myself crying with him beside me because I can't believe I found someone so sweet to me. It happened quite often at first. The crying that is, but it's since slowed down. Still happens though. He's been with me through so much. I had this boyfriend who would get really mean during sex. He would choke me harder sometimes out of nowhere and give me this weird look. He explained it to me as having multiple personalities and one of them was a woman in his head who he was dating who is jealous of me and wants to kill me and she comes out during sex and he's always arguing with her. I honestly tried to be there for him but I was like 16 and now that I'm an adult looking back this doesn't sound right. I remember after a small argument he would sit in the corner holding his legs shaking back and forth catatonic for literally hours but he really wasn't catatonic because if someone else would step into the room he would suddenly snap out of it. He was as normal and charming as he could be in public and around his friends. This stuff would only happen when we were home alone. He would even write me letters in different handwriting and they'd either be nice or mean wanting to get rid of me. He's happily married now. I never heard of anyone else seeing him do this shit. This happened about nine years ago. I was living with a roommate at the time in a townhouse in a suburb of Denver. My boyfriend at the time had always been kind of abusive with the occasional slap or pinning me down on the floor. But after a family member that he was close with committed suicide, he really lost it. My ex, Pierce, just lost it in the middle of an argument one day about a week after the funeral and threw me on the ground punching my arm over and over. There was a giant bruise on one of my shoulders and a handprint shaped bruise on the other. My face ended up being swollen and I had a bloody lip. My roommate called the police and he ended up being arrested. A no contact order put in place. He was also ordered to go to counseling and maybe even drug and alcohol meetings even though at the time he didn't use. Fast forward a few months. I'm living with this roommate because I was completely financially dependent on peers. My roommate took it upon herself to pay for me to get my GED. That woman was a saint. I just needed to throw that out there. A lot of my time was spent studying for the subjects. 
After everything, I was very agoraphobic, but I managed to forge some online friendships, and maybe even something more with a generally kind guy. One day, Pierce's grandmother stopped by to take me to pay my phone bill. She lived close by in the same townhouse complex, and was more or less right behind where I lived. I remember it being the first beautiful and slightly warm day after a long winter, so I opened up all the blinds to let the sunlight in, and left them open when I left. After paying my bill, Pierce started calling her. I wasn't too concerned, because I knew he was supposed to be at his court-mandated counseling shortly. I couldn't hear what he was saying, but his grandmother told him that we just had to stop by a McDonald's. Again, not an issue at this point. I eat my Big Mac or whatever until maybe three minutes later, Pierce calls again. His grandmother tells him that she's probably going to be home in about 10 minutes. The call ends. I finish my food and we leave. Again in the car, about two minutes away from where I live, Pierce calls again. I still can't hear his side of the conversation, but his grandma tells him the intersection we just passed and suddenly, I have this terrible sinking feeling in my stomach. I know something's wrong, but I can't identify what, but I know in my heart of hearts that something was very wrong. I consider asking his grandmother for help, but for context, his grandmother on multiple occasions watched Pierce hit me or try to strangle me and openly expressed disgust at how I can't help but piss him off. The same lady that knew her daughter, Pierce's mother, broke Pierce's nose when he was six because he saw his mother flip off someone and copied her and did nothing to intervene or let her know that that wasn't okay. The family member Pierce was mourning for often told him that he was a fuck up and was probably the most verbally and emotionally abusive person I've ever witnessed in real life or movie, book, whatever. So this family is just super fucked and abusive to other people, to each other. So I'm completely alone in the situation. Anyway, his grandmother pulls up in front of where I live and I notice that all the blinds I had opened are now closed. We go inside and once she leaves, I walk upstairs to my room and see a random word document open on my computer. Pierce had written a whole page worth of shit, but I only pay attention to the words that are written on the top. I read your emails. Immediately, I know that he had seen the emails between me and the guy I met. Even though they weren't outright sexual or flirty, you could kind of tell there was something there. My brain stopped reading at this point, and I figured out that he's still in the building. Because there's a no contact order, I know he would have came in through the back door, so no one would see him. So my mind latches onto the idea that if the back door is locked, he's probably gone. I run downstairs to the door, and I see that it's locked. But as soon as I reach the door, I hear the closet sliding open from the room I was just in. Loud angry footsteps, and he's yelling my name. I know this may sound weird, but I can't recall exact details. I remember his face in mind before I could understand what was happening. I remember being back in that room again. I think they go through all my emails with him. I remember him slapping me hard in the face, over and over until I got dizzy. I remember somehow convincing him to let me use my phone to respond to one of my roommate's texts. I don't remember what I said, but I remember that she called right away. Pierce was standing two feet away from me and looking at me, believing that he was going to kill me and my roommate asking me, Are you safe? I said, No. She told me that she was on her way and that she would be there as fast as she could. Eventually, Pierce became convinced that I had called the police and with a knife in his hand, told me that if they were coming anyway, that he might as well give me what I deserve. I managed to convince him that I hadn't called the police, and then he started crying about how terrible of a person he was, and threatened to kill himself with the knife. So with a handprint on my swollen face, I reasoned with him, telling him that he wasn't terrible, and to please not hurt himself, all the time until my roommate came home. Insane ex-boyfriend, I've moved states, had my name changed and only feel safe in buildings in big cities where I'm at least three stories up. Let's not meet ever again. Just want to start off by saying that the story occurs over a couple of years. It's been a long time and it's really hard for me to type this out because it makes me feel very anxious to this day. Some of the time frames are a bit cloudy for me. When I was 15 or so, my mother reconnected with an old crush of hers from her junior high school days. 
Wayne. Soon after, they started dating. At the time, I thought it was pretty cool because I actually went to school with his son, same grade as I was, Brandon. He had two other kids as well, both younger, James and Allie. I didn't actually see Wayne very much in the beginning as he and my mom would often go out or hang out at his place. One night, I got a call from him sometime close to Christmas asking what I would like for a gift, which I thought was strange because I barely knew the guy, but I just assumed that he was trying to get on my mom's good side, so whatever. He started coming around more and I remember just something about him sent alarm bells off in my head like you wouldn't believe. He just gave me the freaking heebie-jeebies. Wayne moved in very soon into the relationship and I just chalked up my uneasy feelings about him to him and my mom moving too fast in their relationship. Fast forward some time. My mom was working at a liquor store and I was home alone with Wayne. I can't remember what this was over, but we got into a heated argument. I was young and full of teenage angst, so who knows. Next thing I know, he headbutts me. And I was so shocked, I didn't know how to deal. I told my mom, but nothing happened. Eventually, he managed to convince my mom to quit her job because he could financially support us. She also had back and knee issues, so she agreed. Then shit started to get fucking weird. I suddenly got a peeping Tom who would peer into my windows late at night in the summer. I would notice because I saw someone or my neighbor would see someone. At one point, someone saw him taking pictures outside my bedroom. Not sure if I was home or not. The police were called, but of course, they can't do anything if they can't actually catch the guy. I was terrified. I'm so uneasy sleeping if windows are low. Wayne took action and convinced that he could take care of the family. Such a hero. He convinced my mom to get a security system, which cost a fortune, and that had to be paid monthly. He convinced my mom to get a dog, Coda, to keep us safe. Turns out, Wayne had hired people to look into my window. In the winter, I could see footsteps all the time that led to my window. I didn't learn that it was him until much, much later. I'm not even sure how we found out. He started getting physically abusive with my mom, me, and worst of all, poor little Coda. I would just hold her and cry because I felt so bad for her. We felt totally trapped financially and felt scared of whoever this dude was peering into the windows at night. We were scared. We were absolutely fucking terrified. One night, Wayne didn't come home. My mom called him over and over and over and he wouldn't answer his phone. When he did arrive home in the wee hours of the morning, his clothes were ripped. He was dirty as hell covered in blood. Wayne claimed that he was mugged. Not long after this incident, homicide detectives show up at my house when they did he pushed me away and tells me that he will speak to them in private when he returned he comes up with a story about how it had to do with a neighbor of ours going missing and that they were just going door to door looking for any information and that they wouldn't be returning so there's no need to worry a couple weeks after this a truck was found abandoned and they found a body there was a murder the accused was a neighbor of mine Honestly, it's never been proven, but there's no doubt in my mind that Wayne had something to do with it. Ah, and here's where we learn that Wayne has a crack addiction. He was a huge dude. You'd never guess by looking at him that he had an addiction to drugs. Hence, why it took us so long to figure out. It all came to a head one night. He and my mother started to argue. I heard banging come from the bedroom, and I went in running to save my mom. I found my mother huddled in the corner in their tiny ass bathroom and him on top of her beating her. I screamed and grabbed at him, begging him to stop. He then turned on me, grabbing me by the neck, pushing me up against the wall by my neck and punched the wall directly beside my face. He let me go and I went running. He had purchased an old timey battle axe that happened to be sharpened and it hung on our wall. He grabbed it and started chasing us with the axe. I thought we were going to fucking die. Now just a note, my mother tried calling the police when they first started arguing, but they didn't come. As he was chasing us with the axe, I had dialed 911 on my phone. I was screaming, begging for them to come. In this whole mess, I don't know how he stopped or why, but he just left. 
Once the cops got there, he was already gone. He did eventually get caught and charged. We, of course, were summoned to testify in court. My poor mom was too scared to testify, so she refused. We still had to go to court, though. We saw him in the courthouse, and he gave my mom the most sinister fucking grin I've ever seen. He was pleased with himself. He felt no remorse. So, honestly, Wayne, I hope I am never so unlucky that I have to see you again. This story is about my dad's ex-girlfriend. My dad has horrible luck with women. He's like a crazy magnet. Every woman he has dated, except for his current girlfriend, have been abusive both mentally and physically. This list includes my mother. But this story is about his last girlfriend, Mary. She has gone from stalking not only him, but me, my husband, and our daughter too. They met at a Christmas party and hit it off. He had just gotten out of a bad relationship with a different woman that he had been on and off with for three years. She was the classic narcissist type. Well, Mary seemed different. She claimed she was also just getting out of an abusive relationship. They went out for a few months, but she never let my dad over to her place. He didn't find it weird at all until he received a call from a man who said Mary was his wife and wanted to know how my dad knew her. At first, my dad thought the guy was her ex, still trying to control her, but things started to add up. He finally confronted Mary, and she gave him a sob story about how her ex refused to sign the papers, but they were separated. My dad did a bit of digging, and even talked to Mary's parents at one point. He found out that not only was Mary definitely still married, but she wasn't separated from her husband. As far as everyone in her life knew, she was happily married. Needless to say, he broke up with her. She lost it, started showing up at his work, calling in the middle of the night, texting him 50 times a day, all that good stuff. My dad moved states twice and changed his number several times to try to get away from her, but she always found him. Love letters would arrive in the mail or she would call him and say that she was coming to see him. Then she found my phone number. Probably sometime after my dad moved in with me, she started texting me almost as much as him. Once I married my husband and had my daughter, she really went all out, sending me presents for her new granddaughter, always wanting updates, and even sent back the packages unopened or donated the items that she had sent directly to me from the shops. Everything finally came to a head when she arrived at my dad's doorstep while he was at work with a casserole for him. She gave it to his roommate and told him that it was because she noticed my dad was losing weight. He told my roommate to toss it. He didn't want to risk poison since he had just applied for a restraining order. One night, she showed up at my apartment while my husband worked the overnight shift. It was after 1am and she started knocking on my door. I was glad that I sent my toddler to my aunt and uncle's for the night. She left banana bread on my doorstep and we threw it out as soon as my husband got home. The next night, I again left my toddler with my aunt and uncle in case she came back. She did. I started getting texts from her as she pounded on my door. She wanted to see her grandbaby and have some girl time with me. It slowly turned into demands for me to open the door. I called the cops. While I was on the phone with dispatch, my neighbor came out, ready to take her on. He told her that cops were on their way, since his wife was already calling them. She disappeared real quick into the park across the street. The cops didn't catch her, but my dad's restraining order did get granted. We have since moved across the state, but she still texts me from time to time, wanting to know how my dad is, or what my daughter is up to. I have never answered but I do save all their texts just in case I need to get my own restraining order as well. This event requires a bit of backstory. In early 2014, my best friend Lily met a guy named Nathan at a club through one of her friends from her college. She and Nathan instantly hit it off and were officially dating within a few weeks. It only took a few months for Lily to fall head over heels for this guy. 
Before long, she was even telling me that she thought he was the one. I was happy for her, experiencing some good old college romance. It eventually led to her losing her virginity to this guy. I really had no opinions of this guy, aside from what I heard from Lily. From what I heard at first, he sounded like a nice guy who just had a lot of bad stuff happen to him. This guy had some serious baggage. He had a poor background and lived with his grandmother. I can't remember if he ever told Lily about his parents or not. He had a three-year-old son named Isaac, whose mother was a drug addict. Lily was in love with Nathan so much that she was willing to stick with him and help him with some of the drama. In spite of hearing so much about him, I only met him twice. Once when he picked up Lily from work, we work at the same place, and the second when, I'll get to that. However, things first went downhill when Nathan broke up with Lily in September. He had recently become a rookie police officer and was moving to another city for more training. He said he would come back for her. Still, Lily was devastated by this. But unexpectedly, he was back in town within a month. This whole episode fell off to me. Lily and Nathan tried to start things up again, and things were starting to look up for the couple. That is until Christmas rolled around. In something straight out of a soap opera, Lily broke up with Nathan on Christmas after finding some damning information about him. After he broke up with Lily in September, he apparently went and slept with one of his cousins and got her pregnant. His cousin later had a miscarriage. And to add to that, Nathan revealed that he had both chlamydia and genital herpes. He knew he had both of these yet purposely didn't tell Lily in order to have lots of unprotected sex with her. Lily got herself tested. While she didn't contact chlamydia, she tested positive for genital herpes. As expected, she was devastated by this and went through a brief period of depression. It quickly became apparent that Nathan was not the type of person Lily thought he was. He was sexist, a womanizer, a cheat, and a liar. He had sex with multiple women and, just like Lily, he kept the information about his STDs a secret. He even tried to turn all his friends against Lily, saying that she broke up with him, and even tried to drive apart Lily and Yasmina, the fiancé of one of Nathan's cousins who was now close friends with Lily. Lily didn't stand for this and made sure the truth was known. She talked to Yasmina and her fiancé about it, and they eventually kicked Nathan out of their place. Word began spreading around Nathan's community about his wrongdoings, and even his backup girlfriend broke up with him. It wasn't long before Lily was taking self-defense and gun classes. Nathan knew where she lived and obviously had some weapons training due to being a rookie police officer, a job he soon lost. She often told me that she was somewhat afraid of him. Mostly she was furious. If he ever tried to hurt her, I'm sure she would have blown his brains out. Anyway, my second and final encounter with Nathan was at the tail end of this drama earlier this year. My first encounter with Nathan had been brief, but afterwards, Lily had told me that Nathan had been initially jealous of me due to the fact that I was a close guy friend. We were friends since toddlers. While our first encounter was brief and under friendly terms, our second encounter was far from that. I had a morning shift at work that day and had just ended my shift. It was early in the afternoon, so I was hurrying up to my car to get out of the heat. As I walked to my car, I quickly noticed Nathan leaning against the car a few rows away. As you expect, I was furious upon seeing him, given all the crap he had caused my friend. I assumed that he was waiting for Lily or something. I only chuckled because Lily was on family vacation in Montana at the time. I decided not to confront him. I was always keen on listening to Lily and gave him my two cents but, for the most part, I had been successful at staying away from the drama. Suddenly, Nathan turned in my direction and immediately stood up completely. He tapped on his car and, who I assumed was a friend of his, stepped out. They began to power walk in my direction. Wasting no time, I jumped in my car, start the ignition, and pulled out of my parking spot. As I did, I heard a loud knock on the back of my car. I looked in the rearview mirror to see Nathan punching the back window in some attempt to stop me. I kept going. I was almost out of the parking lot when I looked in my rearview mirror again 
to see his car speeding in my direction. I sped out of the parking lot with him right on my tail. He continued to follow me for several streets. There was no way I was heading home with him following. I ended up taking the craziest detour in my life. Pulling on and off feeders, driving through parking lots, driving circles in neighborhoods, I did it all. Eventually, after about 25 minutes of me driving, I lost him. I drove around a little while afterwards in order to make sure I had officially lost him. When I got home, I called Lily and told her everything. She thought about calling the police, but before we could decide on whether or not to do that, Lily got a call from Yasmina, who had been spying on Nathan for Lily for quite some time. We learned that Nathan had apparently packed up all his stuff from where he was living and had taken off. He was gone. To where, I don't know. I heard rumors of him wanting to go to New York City and Mexico, but those are the only possibilities I remember. All that matters is that he's now officially out of Lily's life. I'm not sure what would have happened if he caught me that day. Lily's guess is that Nathan might have been trying to hurt me in order to get back at her. I'm glad I was a good enough driver to lose him. Otherwise, I don't want to think about what he could have done to me. This is going to be a bit long, so I had this best friend in high school named Lena. We were friends for about a year and a half and we would spend almost every weekend at our house listening to music, watching scary movies, and gossiping. She was just a little bit crazy, the type of girl to beat up her boyfriend's exes, unprovoked. She actually did that once, and catfish people. I say we were best friends, but actually it was more like I looked up to her, and she liked that she could boss me around and hang out with me whenever she pleased. She was extremely manipulative and two-faced. She had a hobby of being nice to girls at school, then going on their social medias and making fun of everything they posted. She would befriend people just to get information from them. When we were friends, Lena was dating this guy named Nolan. They dated for about a year and a half and had lots of troubles for the last six months or so. He would go out drinking most weekends and she would cry in the middle of the night and blow up his phone, yelling at him and making him feel guilty. She was borderline psychotic when it came to his exes, or girls that he was friends with, and they just weren't really working out, but they stayed together anyway. At some point, Nolan got Lena pregnant. At the same time, one of Lena's friends, whose name was Autumn, became pregnant from the guy I was in love with. Naturally, I wanted nothing to do with Autumn, but because they were both pregnant together, Lena started hanging out with Autumn most weekends and neglected our friendship. After about a month, I became fed up with it and started ghosting her. At first, she tried to apologize, but I was not having it. Since the other girl was dating the guy I had been in love with for two years, and I was jealous and childish. So eventually, Lena got pissed at me and stopped trying. A few months went by and Lena had the baby. Nolan and Lena stayed together to take care of their son, but their relationship was absolutely horrendous at this point. She cheated on Nolan, and he decided he wanted out of the relationship, but continued to see his son and buy things for him. However, Lena and Lena's mother made things very difficult for him by constantly changing the days he could see his son and refusing to let him take his son anywhere besides Lena's house. Lena's mother would also throw out Christmas presents from Nolan, ignore his phone calls, and eventually told him he wasn't allowed at her house. Nolan begged for months to see his son, but it was clear that Lena and her mother didn't want him in the picture. He offered to pay child support, but they didn't want that either. They just wanted him gone, so he stopped trying. Apparently, even that wasn't what they wanted. Lena took to social media to talk about how Nolan was a deadbeat. She told everyone that she knew that being a single mother was really hard and that the baby daddy refused to take care of his kid. A year after they broke up, I met Nolan in person. We had been talking online for a couple months about Lena. We had shared stories about her crazy meltdowns and her manipulative tendencies. And we talked about the time that he came to her house while I was there and attempted to scare her by jumping out when she went out the front door, but instead accidentally jumped out at me. He thought that was the funniest thing ever, that my face stayed stone cold and I just said, sup. We had a similar sense of humor and at the time I had no one. 
I had just come out of one of the worst depressive episodes of my life. It had lasted for a good year and I had dropped out of high school, been doing drugs, isolating myself for weeks at a time, and considering suicide. He was the one to help bring me back from the brink. He was kind and he was my support system. We were just friends at first. When Lena caught wind of our friendship, she reached out to me. At this point, we hadn't been friends for a year and a half. We caught up and talked about what had been happening in our lives. She asked me what was going on with Nolan, and I told her that we were just friends. Everything seemed fine. That's when her erratic behavior started. She randomly blocked me on social media, then unblocked me a month or two later. Sometimes we would talk, like, how are you? Everything good? And the next day, I'm blocked. At one point, I asked one of her friends to get her to tell me why she was doing it because I was so confused. So she unblocked me and told me that she was salty about the situation with Nolan and the fact that I was friendly with him. I asked her why she keeps making up with me and then suddenly gets pissed off again and cuts me off. I told her that I'm tired of thinking things were good only to turn around and pretend like we never said anything to each other. That's when she said she could block me again or keep me unblocked. Whatever I wanted was fine. But she felt I had done her wrong by abandoning her during her pregnancy and befriending her ex-boyfriend. I tried to explain to her that Nolan was my friend. I tried to tell her that Nolan was all I had in my darkest time of my life. I tried to tell her why her neglecting me for Autumn hurt my feelings, but she wasn't having it. I understand where she was coming from, I do, and I acknowledge the fact that I acted childishly and in a cruel way. But I tried to make up with her multiple times. I tried really hard and she couldn't even stick with whether she forgave me or not. So I told her to block me again and I was done with it. She told me she wouldn't block me again and that she gave me her blessing with Nolan. She said it was fine if we wanted a date and that she hoped that I had a good life. And I said the same to her and I really meant it. We had a bad end but I was glad we could at least wish each other well. It was a few months after I last spoke to her that Nolan and I started dating. I had waited so long because I was worried about Lena, even though we weren't friends anymore. But she had given me her blessing, and she was dating someone else new, so I went with it. It was around this time that I received a friend request from a girl on Facebook named Casey. Casey said she lived in the big city in my state, and since we had mutual friends, and I had gone to school in that city, I assumed that we had gone to school together and I just didn't remember her. She seemed like a real person. She claimed to work at Hooters, had made posts about how her workday went, had several pictures of the same girl, made frequent posts about her ex-boyfriend. I accepted the friend request and she messaged me telling me how pretty she thought I was. I thanked her and told her to message me anytime she wanted to chat. For the next few months, I was clueless. I went about my regular life, posting about the things Nolan and I did, getting my GED, hanging out with friends, visiting my mother, etc. Occasionally, I would see strange posts on my timeline from Casey, but didn't think much of it because I had over 1,000 friends on Facebook and I rarely saw them. They were mostly posts about how much she hated her baby daddy and how her line of work sucked, but there were two posts in particular that caught my eye. One was a post that seemed to be referencing something I had posted the day before. Another one was of her saying, We all know a dirty whore named, with my first name in the blank. So I went through her profile, then clicked through months and months of posts. Some were about her line of work. Everything else was related to me and Nolan. Everything. There were posts of her complaining about her deadbeat baby daddy buying things for everyone but his kid. Post about how sad she felt about the breakup. Post about how she missed me and thought of me as a sister, which is bullshit and I'll explain why later. Post about how I stole her boyfriend, also bullshit. She made fun of my hobbies, had directly referenced some of my posts, talked about how much she hated me, said I was a dirty hoe. She even had people in the comments egging her on and talking shit too, even though no one knew who she was talking about, but I did. She mentioned things that only the two of us knew. She referenced our past experiences. It was undoubtedly Lena. 
I messaged Casey and told her I knew she was Lena. She played dumb and told me that the initials were of another girl she knew. When I looked up the name she gave me, not a single person on Facebook had that name. When I told her that, she brushed it off and tried to get me to talk shit about Lena. So I played along and talked hardcore shit. I lied about a lot of things in an attempt to get her out of herself, but in the end, all she did was send screenshots of her conversation to Lena's account in an attempt to make it look like Casey was real and was trying to help Lena out by showing her what kind of person I was. Casey then immediately deleted her account. She didn't block me, she deleted it. I had a friend in my dad check and neither of them could find Casey's profile. So another month went by and I found out that she had reactivated the account and because I couldn't block a deleted account, she was in my friends list again and had access to my file for who knows how many days. So I blocked her. She then sent me a friend and follow request on three different websites under Casey's name, which I also blocked. It was around this time that Nolan and I began to get a lot of friend requests from obviously fake accounts. We would often report them and block them and try to pretend that she wasn't going insane. One of these fake accounts was extremely obvious because it poked both me and Nolan on the same day at the same time. She was taunting us, I guess. I blocked that account too. Please be aware that at this time, Lena was now married. She was doing this while married to someone else. A year later, I thought this all had stopped and one day I went to the Casey account on my friend's Facebook because I wanted to see if she was still posting about me. And when I scrolled down, I realized I had missed a post last time. This post was Lena mocking the fact that my mother, yes, my birth mother, called her frequently to talk shit about me and give her information about me and Nolan. Turns out, my mother and Lena went to the same college, and my mother thought what better way to make friends than helping someone stalk her daughter. She'd ask me about mine and Nolan's relationship often. She'd talk shit about Lena and would act like the perfect mother to my face. She didn't raise me, so I didn't trust her 100%. For that reason, I never gave her my phone number or address or any other information that I felt was private. When my dog went missing, she tried to convince me to post my address on Facebook. She kept saying how important it was that people knew exactly where he went missing from. What horse shit. Thank God I didn't, because I might have woken up to Lena punching me in the head, or worse. For a while there, I was legitimately paranoid. Every time I went to the store or outside, I was watching my surroundings closely. If Lena was willing to beat the shit out of a girl Nolan had dated for three weeks, unprovoked, what would she do to me now if she saw me in public? Would she kill me? I never met someone so obsessed. Let me just say that Lena was a horrible friend. She was bossy, judgmental, rude, erratic, narcissistic, and two-faced. When I felt my first heartbreak, she spent all night talking shit about the guy, saying I deserved better. Eventually, I talked shit with her to make myself feel better. And what does she do? She messages him on Facebook and tells him everything I said about him. She guilt tripped me about having other friends. She convinced me to abandon one of my friends just because she didn't approve of her. She would ignore me when there were other people around. If I complained about anyone, she would go tell that person what I said even if she said something worse about them. She would go through people's Facebook and laugh at them and talk about how dorky they are. She would make me feel ridiculous for liking the things I did and I never felt like I could be myself around her. It amazes me how many people Lena has manipulated. Even her poor husband probably doesn't know that she's a stalker. So yeah, there you have it. Lena cyberstalked me for two years And if I had given my mother my address, it might have become actual stalking. She hasn't been trying to stalk me for a while now. I cut my mother off and deleted about 40 people off my Facebook and made all my social media accounts private to keep this from happening again. I'm hoping I won't ever hear from Lena again. The last obvious sign I had gotten of her still trying to stalk me is a fake account she requested me on about three months ago. An account that was actually a few months old had the same last name as my friend and only like two Facebook pages of which was a grocery store and the other was my page. Anyways, if you finished this, sorry for such a long story. I was young when all this stuff happened and I made some really dumb choices, so go easy on me please. I know I'm not 100% faultless in this, 
And yes, me and Nolan are still together and we'll be celebrating our fourth year anniversary in a couple months. When I was 23, I was running my first place when my ex-girlfriend reached out to me. We had dated for a few months in high school. It just went bad because I was a douche and started talking to another girl. It had been 10 years since high school. Anyway, my ex said she was over what happened when we were teenagers and was willing to give it another shot. So we have a date and then several dates and things were going very well. So about a month into our relationship, I'm at work on the late shift and she calls me saying she had gotten into an argument with her mom that had turned into domestic violence. Saying something about how she got slapped and needed to cool off at my place. I get home and turns out she was moving in. I'm pretty laid back and wanted help with the rent anyways, so I'm somewhat okay with it. I mean, I knew I was walking into a snake pit but I didn't know it was going to be a viper pit. So we lived together for a whopping two months when things take a turn. She starts telling me that she's insecure about me talking to girls, then changes to watching porn as well. We start fighting a lot, sometimes even all night long. She then starts cutting herself, saying it was my fault, and ends up getting tetanus. Late night phone calls asking where I am at work and who I'm with. I work late night hours at an ambulance service. Things come to a head one night when my crazy ex tries to tell me that looking at porn is the same thing as beating her. She starts screaming at me for bringing up the cutting and the doctor's visits claiming it's all my fault. I get fed up and tell her to move out. This pushes her off the deep end. She grabs my handgun that I keep for self defense, tells me that she's going to kill me then herself. I call the police and she leaves shortly afterwards, throwing my loaded handgun outside. I think, yay, it's over, but it wasn't yet. So a few days go by without incident, then my crazy ex texts me something, saying that she needed to give me her house key. I tell her no, to throw it away, but she drives by my house anyway, leaving the key and tapes a note on my door, saying I'm mentally ill and that I need help and she forgives me, blah blah blah. I stopped reading after the I need help part. She keeps texting me and texting me, asking if I read it, even going as far as blaming her behavior on a pregnancy, saying that the baby was mine, but she lost it due to stress. So here I am years down the road, married with a wonderful two year old, with no regrets of leaving that crazy ex. Let's not meet ever again. I have never really posted here before, but let me state that this happened to me years ago. My mom and I are both far away from this creepazoid and we'll never ever see him again. It happened back in 2011, maybe 2012. My mom had recently broken up with this guy who I thought was someone that could be a better father than my actual one was, but he broke it off for my mom and moved away. At the time, it was heartbreaking but my grandmother had the genius idea of hooking my mom up with this guy when the relationship with the last one ended. The man named Bobby was, well, a redneck. And don't get me wrong, rednecks, hillbillies, and the like can actually be really kind and hardworking people. Bobby was not. Bobby was cruel, stupid, lazy, an alcoholic, and an all-around creep. I could not trust him no matter how many times my mom tried to get me to see the good in this asshole. He was racist towards a man who was just trying to make a living as a delivery driver. The poor guy is of Middle Eastern descent and Bobby berated and yelled at this guy, shouting, Go back to your own country. And how did this upstanding man defend his racist behavior? By stating that his cousin was killed whilst in the military and that's why he acted like a prick. In the words of one of my close friends, your cousin died protecting the Middle Eastern man's rights as a U.S. citizen as well. Another thing that Bobby had done was during my 19th birthday party, he overheard me talking to my friends about my sexuality. I'm panned for the record, and after, he demanded I kiss one of my friends to prove it. He went on and on about how sinful I am, and that the Bible says this, that, and the other thing. On top of that, earlier... 
One of my friends who was 15 at the time had dealt with Bobby leering at her while dancing as if she were a stripper at a strip club. It took my mom a while to be rid of him and it took them fighting and him calling her a whore because she was a teen mom. My mom was 14 when she had me to finally kick this creep out of the house. This guy made me angry and afraid and even caused a rift between my mom and I. We have repaired our relationship somewhat, but Bobby did his damage. The last time I heard from him is when an ex of my uncle had a run in with Bobby and he asked about his daughter's location. Confused, my uncle's ex inquired who he was talking about and he replied with my name. She flat out said, she's not your daughter. To Bobby, if there's an off chance that you're reading this, you are computer illiterate anyway. I doubt you would. I'm not your daughter. You are a racist, disgusting pig who took advantage of my mother's loneliness. And let's not meet ever again. Since this happened several years ago, I might get some parts mixed up or some events I may have forgotten. So I'll try to retell my experience the best I can. Bit of a backstory. When I was a little kid, my mom and I would visit my grandparents and all go to church together. I had a friend at church who I was super excited to visit every time I went. We would talk a lot about Pokemon and stuff we liked in general. Around this time, I started puberty and he seemed to be attracted to me. He would hug me and ruffle my hair. He was a big guy and always wore the same yellow shirt. It seemed innocent for a while, and we sort of had a relationship for a few months. Everything was good up until we were dating. I was probably around 16, and he was several years older than me. He one day confided in me that he could see angels, and that he was given a sword from Jesus to fight the demons. Yes, he really said that. As stupid as I was, I believed him. I don't know why, but I did. The times where I wasn't visiting, we would talk over stream where we played TF2. He would tell me all these stories of fighting demons and would talk to me through his angel and it got so much weirder. He would tell me how I would be his princess in heaven and that we would rule together. That's around the time I started getting uncomfortable and weirded out whenever he would go to hug me and try to go further with me. At one point, I tried to cut ties with him and break up. He would not have it one bit. He would constantly send me messages on email begging me to come back and how I was making a bad choice by leaving him. The last time I ever came in contact with him was also the last time I went to that church. My mom, little brother, and I all had to go to church for a small get-together for my grandma's birthday party. Knowing that my ex's family caters church events, I knew in my gut that he was probably going to be there. My mom told me not to worry about it when I knew something was going to happen. When we arrived, I told my mom that I was going to go to the room where the little kids played and where I knew it would be safe while we waited for the cake. I had brought my DS to distract myself and sat down to play. All of a sudden, I felt like someone was looming over me, a big presence. I knew it was him. I instantly went into flight mode and ran and hid around the church until he stopped following and looking for me. My mom and my brother instantly took me back to the house after I came out of hiding and I never went back to that church. When we visit my grandparents now, I stay back at the house while everyone else goes to church. My mom occasionally goes to church with them and sometimes encounters him. He sometimes tells her weird cryptic shit. Sometimes I just want to go back and just tell him to never talk to my family ever again. When we first met, you told me that you did not have any like-minded person with you as a friend. We were all in a new place, and I was away from my parents for the first time, and yet I was consoling you, a much older woman, who had been away from her parents for three or so years, you started hanging out with me when your so-called friends ditched you. We quickly became best friends. Then you started showing me your true colors. You started screaming, shouting, and insulting me to the core if I disagreed with something that you said. 
you always wanted me to talk about you and sing your praises all the time. If I was sick, you never turned to look at me, and yet you were a good friend, and me being the only person who helped you with each and everything when you broke your leg was a bad friend? While taking you to the doctors when you were sick, you hurt me with the words repeatedly pricking me and tearing me apart. You were the only person to know about my panic attacks and the only person to call me attention seeker because of it. You thought I was flirting with a guy who you thought had a crush on you and you called me a whore for it when he was just helping me during a tough spot, something that you refused to do all the time. You told me to stay away from your friends. You insulted my mom on her parenting. Every assignment of yours, no matter how tired I was, I had to do them. Everyone saw it. Everyone called me your slave, but all you cared about was you. You took it out on me when your crush started dating someone else, and I took it. When you got a boyfriend allegedly, I was the last one to know, and you didn't even show me his picture. And when I got a boyfriend, you went around and told others how I am too young to be committed. You even told me not to talk to you about my relationship. You isolated me from literally everyone, badmouthed me, called me a flirt, all while laughing and joking with me. You literally put me in all sorts of uncomfortable situations, including making me beg for you to talk to me when you gave me the cold shoulder for something you had done in front of people that I hate. You enjoyed this. And at last, when I cut you out of my life, you were surprised how it was you who was alone. You claimed how I don't have friends, but darling, you're the one that went home without anyone bidding you a goodbye. It's been a year already, and I still have friends whom I ignored once upon a time, for you. To the people who asked me why I was with you, and also if you happen to read this, I know you won't, but if you do, and you wonder why I was with you for a year, it was because I thought of you as a sister, and I generally loved you regardless of what you did. I trusted your words, ignoring your actions, and as silly as it sounds, somewhere in my heart I still love you, but I can't forget how you turned me into a completely different person. Lack of trust, paranoid of people, lack of self-love, and self-confidence. I'm only a shadow of what I used to be. To the ex-best friend who manipulated me, brought out the worst in me, and gave me issues that I have to deal with for the rest of my life, I love you but please let's not meet again. This story I'm about to tell you happened over a course of roughly five or six years. Names have, of course, been changed. When I was in college, I met this dude named Steve. He was good looking, well-spoken, and confident. He was instantly well-liked by most of the people that he met but was a bit intimidating to me at first due to the fact that he was pretty jacked and didn't speak to me a whole lot in the beginning. Here I was, an 18 going on 19 fat kid with an inferiority complex that made me act out to get attention. I would wear women's clothes to class to get a laugh or interrupt the professor with a witticism here and a joke there. Again, for a laugh. I was that kid. The one that people didn't exactly dislike, but weren't too eager to hang out with, because I could be a bit much at times. This did nothing to help me with my feelings of inadequacy, but I didn't make the connection there until a couple years later. Steve and I didn't exactly become fast and hard friends, because I got pretty drunk at a party once, and he decided instantly that I was annoying. Still, we were civil to each other as we were in the same department and had a couple classes together. We kind of hung out with different crowds too, even inside the department. Steve had recently been kicked out of boot camp in the military. He told everyone that it was because he injured himself badly enough that he had been discharged, but that wasn't true. However, we'll get to that part later. Cut to about three or four months after my first meeting with Steve, and I had been invited by a mutual friend, Corey, to a small get-together at his place, where he incidentally was roommates with Steve. I told Corey that I was kind of weary of Steve, and felt like he didn't like me, to which he replied that I was right, and that's why he wanted me to come over. He wanted me and Steve to get to know each other better, 
because he was positive that we would become friends if we just gave each other a chance. After some more prodding, I finally agreed. When I arrived at Corey's house, there were maybe three other people from our department there. It seemed like a pretty chill setting. There was some alcohol being passed around, and I drank a little bit, but I kept my distance from Steve. After a couple hours and quite a few beers, I started to feel pretty good. Someone brought out a couple of joints, and those started getting passed around the room. When one of them made its way to me, Steve spoke up. Don't bother passing it to him. He's a goody good. I'm not exactly sure why he said that, or even thought that. It might have been because I mentioned in passing that I'd never smoked weed before. Regardless of why he said it, it made me mad that he was making fun of me. So I did what any 19 year old drunk dude would do. I grabbed the joint and took the biggest hit I could possibly take. This, as anyone who has smoked weed knows, is a huge mistake for a marijuana virgin when quality kush is handed to them. After my coughing fit and all the laughter at my expense has subsided, I looked at Steve challengingly and he kind of nodded in my direction before resuming his conversation. Now, no one told me that you shouldn't mix alcohol and weed. Had I stopped there, I would have been fine. However, I continued to drink, which exacerbated all the stuff that comes along with being high. By the time I knew I was high, I started getting paranoid. Dry mouth felt like my tongue was swelling up, and my throat started to close. The feeling of almost weightlessness that sometimes accompanies being high made me feel like I wasn't anchored to the floor anymore. The time dilation that you would experience from weed made me feel like I was literally frozen in time. I started to panic. By this point, everyone else had gone home, and it was just me, Steve, and Corey. I explained to Corey that I thought I was allergic to the weed, because I wasn't feeling right. And oddly enough, Steve asked me to explain what I was feeling. When I did, he walked me through all of it, and calmed me down. Once I was calm, he put a controller in my hands, and we played video games until I sobered up enough to drive. It was honestly really cool of him, and it was the start of one of the best relationships I've ever had, until it became the worst, most abusive relationship. Over the next year or so, Steve and I became really close. I considered him one of my best friends. Being around him was almost like a drug. He just had this way of making you feel like you mattered. I know now that he was a complete psychopath but you don't really see those signs until it's too late. He harassed me until I started working out with him, which meant I had the energy and confidence in myself. I got into pretty decent shape. I wasn't ripped. I wasn't even what most people would call fit, but I wasn't the fat kid anymore either. He would come to my house and force me to go out and do stuff. Before I had became friends with him, I was kind of a loner and a hermit. We would go to the lake and just dick around or go hiking in the woods or any number of outdoorsy type of activities. For the first time in years, I had confidence in myself and I was actually quite happy. Enter Lisa. Lisa was the love of my life, the one that got away, or rather the one that I stupidly dumped twice over a five year relationship because I was scared. She's not a huge part of this battle to Steve, but she played a role. She had came to my hometown to go to school, and she had a boyfriend back home, but we clicked immediately. I know if you're wondering, and no, we didn't hook up or anything when she was with him. She made her attentions towards me clear, and I made it clear that nothing would happen while she was dating someone else. She told me that she had been considering breaking things off with him, as he was a bit controlling and dickish. And the next day she walked up to me and kissed me full on the mouth. And when I started pushing her away, she laughed and said, I broke up with Jason last night. You're mine now. I smiled back and our relationship began. I apologize for getting into details that have nothing to do with Steve. It was just an immensely happy time of my life. And I would have never had the confidence to flirt with Lisa in the first place if it weren't for Steve. The next year after Lisa and I got together was rather uneventful. I will admit that there were some red flags with Steve that either I didn't see or just outright ignored. 
Looking back on it now, one of the most obvious was the one day I was hanging out with Lisa when Steve showed up. She had always gotten a bad vibe from him, rightly so. And so when he showed up, she left to go to class 45 minutes early. Watching her walk away, Steve said, I could take her away from you if I wanted. I gave him an incredulous look, slightly panicking that the man who called himself my friend might actually want to and be able to sway Lisa to date him instead. He laughed at my expression and added, Don't worry, I don't want her. She's a six at best. She's perfect for you, but I like my bitches a little thinner and much hotter. Just thought you should know that if I wanted, I could take her away from you. It should be noted that Lisa was thin, if curvaceous, and absolutely gorgeous in a very classical way. I am now convinced that Steve was actually attracted to her, but he saw himself as an alpha and needed to assert his dominance over me, one of his perceived betas. I'm ashamed to admit that it worked. I did get angry and told him not to talk to or about my girlfriend in such a gross manner. But once he gave me a half-hearted apology, I kind of shrugged it off. The next year, there were even more red flags that I chose to ignore. I know this story is moving rather quickly now, but those first couple of years weren't really that bad. Yes, Steve started showing his true colors, but the really horrible shit was still to come. Also, if you're keeping track, I was at a two-year college for three years. That's just how long it took me to get my associate's degree. That's neither here nor there. Steve started dating one of the freshmen in our department. I heard from others that the relationship was incredibly psychologically abusive on his end, but I kept brushing it off because the girl he was dating hadn't spoken up and Steve was a good guy, right? I mean, I hadn't witnessed it. Other people must just be misinterpreting Steve's unusual sense of humor in a way that painted him in a bad light in their minds. I was unaware at the time that, of course, she wouldn't speak out against him because that's what psychological abuse is. It's gaslighting and insults and ensuring that the victim believes themselves to be absolutely worthless and deserving of treatment that they receive. During the end of year department party, I proposed to Lisa and she said yes. When Lisa and I graduated from college with an associate's degree, we decided to move to a new school together. Despite the fact that our relationship grew stronger than ever without Steve in our lives, a dot that I did not connect due to still being firmly in his psychotic grasp, the college we decided to transfer to was absolute garbage and after the year was over, we decided to transfer again to a better and cheaper school, this time about an hour away. Coincidentally, it was the same school that Steve was now attending. That summer, Lisa moved back to her hometown while transitioning between schools and I ended things with her for the first time over the phone. Shitty, I know. But we were like five hours apart since I stayed behind to live on campus and work, and neither of us could find the time to visit each other. The only reason I can logically come up with is that I was scared of the commitment. I always said that when I marry, I want to be in it for life. I got in my own head and started worrying about whether or not Lisa was the person I really wanted to spend the rest of my life with. When I moved to the new city, Steve helped me get an apartment in the same complex where he and Corey the friend from earlier both lived. We were in separate buildings, but the apartments were set up in a way that the courtyard between the two buildings was only like 40 feet across. I could actually see into Steve's basement apartment window from the second floor when both of our blinds were open. There were many times that I would glance out the window while playing video games or something, and Steve would catch my eye and wave me over. So I would obediently turn off my game and head over to his place to smoke a little weed and watch one of his four DVDs for the billionth time. During this time of my life, I became a major alcoholic. I'm fairly certain that Steve realized this was happening but said nothing because he wanted to be able to hold it over me later. He may have contributed to my alcoholism a little bit. He began to use the same bully tactics he had once employed to get me to work out and go do things. This time, he was using them to get me to go out drinking. If I told him that I had class early the next day, 
or homework that needed to be done, he would just wave it off and tell me that we would be back in plenty of time for me to get my homework done or plenty of time to sleep. We would often stay out until 2 in the morning when the bars closed or later if we met someone cool and decided that we were going to hang out at their house for a little bit afterwards. If I said I didn't have the money, he would promise to pay for me. At the end of the night, I would get a bill I could barely afford and then he would explain that he clearly meant that he would pay for the first couple of rounds and if I drink more than that, it was my fault. Several times I had to borrow money from him to pay the rent, which further put me in his control. I would like to take a brief break and address the elephant in the room. I realized that every single one of my previous mentioned problems stemmed from me. I could have moderated my drinking. I could have told him no when he asked me to go out. I could have realized sooner that he was never truly going to pay for my bar tab or that we weren't going to be home early. I take responsibility for all these things. That being said, something you have to understand about Steve is that he would gaslight and make me feel like I was being a bad friend if I ever told him no, despite having a very valid reason for the refusal. What I'm trying to do by telling you this part is to point out that he was never the good friend I thought he was, or he would have pointed out that I was drinking too much. Would it have stopped me? As I know from my numerous attempts by another, really true friend. No, I wouldn't have. But at least in hindsight, I would be able to say, you know, Steve tried to get me to stop drinking. He was a good friend. Anyways, back to the story. Some few months after moving to the new city, Steve introduced me to a friend of his from out of town, Jennifer. She was a very pretty woman with dyed red hair, styled into a pixie cut. She was thin, athletic build, and a gorgeous face. She was honestly every straight man's dream. Not only that, but she was intelligent, funny, quick-witted, compassionate, and kind. I honestly developed a crush on her, but I was sure that she was out of my league. I asked Steve if she was seeing anyone though, because at this point, I still had some confidence. He told me that she wasn't and asked if I liked her. I said yes, and he assured me that he would try to get a feel of what she thought about me. Cut to a few days later, and Steve is now dating her. This confused the shit out of me, because when he introduced us, they kept making jokes about how neither of them was really interested in the other, and that they would never work as a couple. I think even back then, I knew he had done his psychological fuckery to get her to date him so he could, once again, assert his dominance over me. I shrugged it off. Happy that my friend finally found a girl to make him forget that freshman he had been dating a couple years ago. He had constantly moaned about missing her when she finally got the courage to tell him to fuck off one night after he called her fat. She was maybe 95 pounds. Over the next few weeks, I started to notice that Jen was looking more and more exhausted and haggard. When I asked her if she was okay, she would just smile and assure me that her workout was just getting to her. We had started to become friends, so I asked her not to hesitate in coming to me if there was anything I could do to help her out. She thanked me for my kind gesture, but again, she said she would be fine. I would later find out that Steve was treating her the same way that he had treated his previous girlfriend. She apparently told Steve about my offer to help, thinking it was sweet that I wanted to help her. And as you might guess, Steve flew off the fucking handle. I had never seen him so angry. He came into my apartment banging on the door, fit to break it down, and screaming at me to get my two-faced ass out in the hallway so he could kill me. I didn't know this at the time, but Steve had just started taking steroids, which explained part of his unfounded rage. After nearly an hour of him pacing my living room, threatening me, and yelling loud enough to wake the whole damn neighborhood, I was finally able to convince him that my intentions were nothing but friendly towards Jen. Bro code dictated that even if the two of them broke it off, I wasn't going to pursue her since she had dated one of my best friends. Once he finally believed that I wasn't going to stuff his girl like a Thanksgiving turkey, as he put it, it was like a switch was flipped. Suddenly we were best friends again and his earlier rage seemed to have been forgotten as if it never happened. He dumped Jen shortly after, 
My guess is he realized I had no romantic interest in her anymore and therefore couldn't use his relationship with her to needle me and control me. I only saw her a handful of times after that, but the last time I saw her, she looked so much happier. Yet another sign about Steve I either didn't see or chose to ignore. About a month after the yelling incident, Lisa and I got back together. She was incredibly distrustful and weary of me at this point, and rightly so. I had broken her heart for no other reason that I was an idiot. Over time, she began to trust me more with her emotions again. This was a mistake on her part, and I don't mean to sound cruel. Perhaps I had picked up some things from Steve. I know that I was fairly manipulative. I am more ashamed of that than I can even betray with words. I hate myself to this day for some of the ways I've treated her. During our second stint as a couple, Lisa was still uncomfortable around Steve and she would often leave if we were hanging out and Steve showed up. He never seemed to catch on that she didn't want to be around him. Things were made far worse when we went to a house party one night and Steve groped her. Again, I'm incredibly ashamed to admit what I did when she came to me in tears of rage and disgust and told me what happened. I'm ashamed because the first thing out of my mouth was, Steve wouldn't do that. Maybe you misunderstood what was going on. He smacked my ass and grabbed my chest. Alright, I'll go talk to him. I should have just cut him out right then and there. I should have taken Lisa home. I should have went and knocked Steve the fuck out. I should have done a lot of things, but I've always been a people pleaser, and Steve brought this out of me in the worst way. When I asked Steve about the situation, he told me that he had grabbed her waist to get around her in the kitchen, which was crowded, and that he accidentally brushed against her breast while reaching for the bottle of rum. I fucking believed him. I went back to Lisa and conveyed what he had told me. After a lot more enraged tears and yelling, she laughed. Why she didn't just dump my stupid, harassment apologist, victim blaming ass right then, I still don't know. When Steve appeared a few minutes later, I explained what happened. He put on a sympathetic face and said with a chuckle, Man, fuck that bitch. Let's find you a hot, drunk bitch who wants to give you a blowjob. Even back then I knew that that was a huge red flag and I did not have sex with a drunk woman, but I still ignored the signs. Lisa didn't speak to me for a week, and she was right to do so. She should have never spoken to me again. For the next few months, things with Steve were a bit strained, and we didn't hang out much. Things with Lisa improved again, now that Steve wasn't around as much. We were even talking about moving in together. This would not ever happen, because I was going to break up with her before long. I didn't know why I was going to do it at this time, but I know it was going to happen. When it did happen, there were no tears like last time. There was no pleading that we could make it work. Lisa simply fixed me with an emotionless, almost dead gaze and said, My sister told me not to trust you again. I should have listened. Get your shit and get out of my apartment. Now, I really wish she would have left it at that. But over the next couple of years, we would go on to have a few stints as friends with benefits. As we both knew what the other wanted in bed, and it was just easier for both of us, I think. Being highly sexual beings, to find comfort with each other when we wanted sex. I obviously obliged. There were no feelings in it for her. It was just sex. We never got back together, but we did become sort of facsimile of friends again for a while. Shortly after our breakup, I became immensely depressed. I didn't realize that it was because I was still in love with Lisa. Why would I be? I had broken things off with her. Regardless, I started drinking even more and stopped working out. I started regaining all the weight I had lost my freshman year of college and Steve noticed, often remarking that I was a fat fuck. I never really minded it because I was used to my weight being the butt of every other joke. Besides, he always said it with a laugh to let me know that he was only joking. The way good friends always insult each other right? At the same time, I started hanging out with him again. One day, he came to me, asking if I wanted to move into a house with him. I politely declined because I liked living alone, and my rent was relatively cheap for where I lived. He called me a pussy and got unreasonably angry, saying that I owed him everything. He proceeded to scream at me for an hour and a half. 
He didn't speak to me for three days, but eventually calmed down. He never apologized for his ridiculous outburst though. When he moved out, another mutual friend took his apartment after having just gone through a breakup of his own. And I started hanging out with this new friend, Mark, quite a bit since he was just across the courtyard and Steve was a couple miles away. During this time, I met a man through Mark who would go on to become one of my two best friends that I've ever had and one of the most amazing people I've ever known. Enter Nick. Remember the friend I mentioned earlier who I said regularly tried to get me to stop drinking? That's Nick. He was and is the man who, for some reason, I never want to disappoint. Even today, being mostly sober, a huge part of what keeps me from drinking is the idea that if Nick found out, I'd be more ashamed of myself than if I publicly shit my pants in front of the woman of my dreams. Personally, that to me is a mark of a true friend, mostly because Nick never asked for or expected me to feel this way. In fact, I think he was a little uncomfortable with it, but it's not something that I could just turn off. Nick and I hit it off fairly quickly and started hanging out regularly. It was with Nick and a circle of friends, all of whom I proudly now call my own friends, that a Dungeons and Dragons group was started and lasted for nearly four years. Nick plays a bigger, if not huge, part in the story later. Things continue this way for maybe half a year before I finally decided to take Steve up on his offer and move into his house with him. Mostly because money was tight and my bills would go down. His current roommates had moved away for whatever reason and he had a couple of vacancies. I took one room and a friend of his from when he was in boot camp, Greg, took the other. For a while, things were awesome. Steve had apparently become Catholic. He was off the Jews. It seemed like I had my old friend back from the days when we first had started becoming chummy. Steve, Greg, and I would often go on road trips, or out to bars, or just to some outdoor attractions around the city and walk around. Now remember when I said that Steve had been discharged from the military and claimed that it was due to an injury? Turns out that was not true at all. One night while Steve was at work, Greg and I were hanging out with some beers and the topic came up. You know he was crazy, yeah? Greg asked. What do you mean? He got kicked out before he finished boot camp. Really? He told me that he suffered some kind of injury and they had to let him go. After I said this, an incredulous look came over Greg's face and he turned slowly to look at me. He then proceeded to tell me what Steve had told me was an utter lie. He told me that Steve had had a reason to suspect that his then wife was cheating on him and had been overheard by a commanding officer saying that when he was going to finish boot camp, he was going to murder them both and the daughter that he and his wife had. He had been given an in-depth psychological evaluation and been discharged essentially for being too insane for the military. I later confirmed this with some of Steve's childhood friends. At this point, I was starting to realize who Steve really was, thinking back on some of the interactions I had with him. Unfortunately, I was stupid loyal to someone I perceived to be a good friend. At some point, I had invited Nick to come over and hang out, to play video games and whatnot. And when Steve met Nick, he immediately called him fat. Now, Nick was at the time a large man. He has since made some enormous strides in his fitness journey. Shout out to Nick for your hard work if you're reading this. You look great regardless. I remember the look of utter disbelief on Nick's face. But I defended Steve by saying that that's just how he made friends. If he wasn't calling you names, then it meant that he didn't like you. By the way, can we stop that shit? Treating people like shit as a way to break the ice is fucking terrible. I'm guilty of that in the past, and I hate that I used to do it. Anyway, not relevant. I could tell that Nick was skeptical, but he just kind of went with it. I think he kind of resented me for not defending him, but he never said so. I don't blame him if he did. A few weeks after the conversation with Greg, Steve had a friend of his from out of town stay with us for the weekend. Greg was out of town for work or something. I forget the details. Before this friend of Steve's arrived, he told me that she was fat, but pretty, and if I wanted to bone down with her, I had his blessing. This did not sit well with me, not only because of how he described her, which I learned wasn't true when she arrived, 
but because he felt the need to give his permission for two of his friends to have sex with each other. I kept my mouth shut though. I forget the woman's name, but she was a very pretty woman. She was curvaceous, but in no way fat. I was confused as why Steve would describe her as such. She and I got along really well from the start. That night, she and Steve slept together. Again, I'm fairly certain he slept with her because he could tell I was taking a liking to her. I wasn't falling over myself to get in a relationship with her, but I did like her quite a bit. Steve had once again asserted his dominance over me. The next day, we all had lunch at a local restaurant, and Steve had essentially left his friend and myself to drive his car back to the house while he wandered off to do God knows what. I was infuriated that he would do that, not necessarily the leave us part, but the fact that his friend had came to town specifically to visit him, and he had just built on her for no real reason. She and I spent the day watching movies and playing video games. We talked quite a bit about Steve, as he was our common link, and a lot of things came to light about Steve that I won't mention here, simply because I don't want to be typing this for the next two weeks. I texted Steve multiple times throughout the day, asking where he was. He didn't respond to me until about midnight, when I sent a text telling him it was kind of shitty of him to just leave his friend with me when she had came to see him. The text I got back just read, Mind your fucking business, fatty. I'll be home when I get home. He finally rolled up around 10 the next morning, and as his friend was getting ready to leave, he was driving a motorcycle that I had never seen before. He barely said goodbye to the woman as she was leaving, and when the door shut, I rounded on him. Where the fuck were you, dude? Feeling myself get angrier by the word at what he had done. Not that it's any of your fucking business, but I was helping a friend bury a body. He shot back as he walked into his room. I knew instantly that that was a lie. I had this intuition when it came to Steve, I could almost always tell when he was lying, and this one was just so outlandish that I didn't even need to consider it to know that it was absolute bullshit. No you fucking weren't, I said under my breath. What was that, fatty? He said, coming back into the room shirtless and getting into my face. I gently pushed him away from me, and he looked utterly dumbfounded. He couldn't believe that I would ever stand up to him like this. I said, you're lying, I retorted quickly, enunciating, but if you want to treat your friend like shit when they travel for four hours just to hang out with you for a couple days, then be my guest. We stood there glaring at each other for a few seconds before he deflated and looked slightly ashamed, which shocked the hell out of me. I was with a girl I'd been dating, he said softly. So you invited your friend to stay with us? I said, my anger rising again. Cheated on your girlfriend with her. Bailed on us. And then fucking lied to me about it? Fuck you. You're a fucking douchebag. I turned on my heel and stormed into my room. I'm fairly certain Steve threw something at me, but he missed. Because I heard a loud thump on the wall, just to the left of the doorway as I walked through. I didn't stop to find out. I didn't see or speak to Steve for a couple of days after that. It wasn't until Greg came home from his trip that I noticed that we weren't spending time together and were acting coldly towards one another that our friendship started to repair a bit. Most of it was due to Greg yelling at us that he wasn't going to live with a couple of bitches who couldn't get their shit together and act like adults. Despite our relationship repairing slightly, things were never really the same after that. Over the next few months, Steve started selling drugs and always kept a loaded gun in the house. I specifically remember him telling me one day that some guy was going to be coming over to give him some money that he was owed. And if he showed up when Steve was at work, I was supposed to take the money, count it, and put it on his bedroom desk. I didn't know he was dealing at the time, so I assumed that it was just a guy that owed him money. I agreed and went back to playing video games as he left for work. Steve got home from work before the guy showed up, and then there was a knock on the door. Steve came out of his bedroom with the gun in hand and held his finger to his lips. He opened the door to reveal a man standing on the porch with a wad of cash in hand. Steve immediately pointed the gun at his face, cocked the hammer back, and started screaming at him to drop the fucking money on the ground and get the fuck off his porch. 
As the dude was fleeing in terror, Steve yelled after him that if he ever saw him again, he would kill him. Of course, I was immediately distressed by what I had just witnessed, but I was equally terrified when he turned to me with a huge grin after collecting the money from the porch and closing the door. I just gave him a weak smile and ignored the whole thing. I learned later that he was back on steroids when it happened. During this time, Steve would regularly come home late at night, three sheets to the wind ranting about one ethnic group or another. The one that sticks out in my mind the most was when he stumbled in so drunk that he could barely string together a coherent thought. He was yelling about globalism and how the Chinese were trying to take over the world. He mumbled a string of words that I couldn't make out then and shouted clear as day, Ping Ling, followed by another string of unintelligible bullshit. And finally, fucking our daughters. As the last word left his lips, he immediately fell on the floor and began to sob. I had no idea what to do. If I tried to help him, I know that he would get violent towards me. In the end, I did nothing. I just went to my room. A few weeks after that particularly lovely incident, Steve and I got into an argument about something I can't remember. He stormed off into his room, and I thought it was over. I knew from experience that given time and distance, he would calm down. He would never apologize, but at least the situation would de-escalate. I was wrong this time. Ten minutes later, he comes crashing back into the living room, gun in hand, and pointed it in my face, yelling that if I wasn't going to respect him, that he might as well just kill me. You're not going to shoot me. I said far more calmly than I felt. Inside, I was shitting my pants, despite the fact that I did honestly believe he wasn't going to shoot me. I had been around guns before, but never had one pointed at me. Yeah? Why do you think that? I know you're not going to shoot me, because I'm one of the few real friends you have left. He seemed to consider this for a moment, and finally lowered his gun. His face was still murder incarnate, but at least the gun wasn't pointed at me. Can you move, man? I asked. I'm trying to watch Netflix. He continued to stare at me for a long while seeming to be internally fighting with himself before finally stomping back into his room. I didn't see him again for the rest of the night. A few days later, Steve and Greg asked me to sit down when I had come home from my third double in a row at the restaurant where I worked. I asked why and they said we needed a talk about me living there. I told them that there was no need. I was moving out. They seemed satisfied with this and I went into my room to get some much needed sleep. A side note, as I was moving out, I accidentally broke the handle off of the storm door and Steve lost his mind, screaming at me, calling me all kinds of names, including the N-word. I assured him that I would replace it, but he just kept calling me names. Nick was helping me move out at the time, and once we were away from the house, he gave me a look that spoke volumes. I know, I said, I know, part of the reason why I'm moving out. I didn't say anything. He replied, you didn't have to. This was the point that I finally snapped and realized that Steve was nothing but a toxic piece of shit. It took someone I hadn't known for very long, giving me a single fucking look for a puzzle piece to finally fall into place and make me go, fuck this bag of dicks. After I moved out, I only saw Steve once more. I was coming out of class on the university campus and he drove up on his motorcycle and started trying to make conversation, but I just made some sort of lame excuse about needing to get to work or home or something and walked away. After about a year, I blocked Steve completely on all social media when he commented on a Facebook post calling my mom the C word. I don't know why I didn't do it sooner. About a year after that, Nick and I were at the mall. Being on a bit of a time crunch and needing things from different stores, we decided to head in different directions and meet up at the food court. I finished what I needed to do first and was standing in front of the Dairy Queen waiting for Nick to come meet me when I get a phone call from him. What's up? I just saw Steve. He was going into the store that I was coming out of. He didn't need to tell me which Steve. He knew most of the worst of what I put in the story by this point. Although I'm sure some of these antidotes would surprise even him. My heart seemed to seize and I felt like I couldn't breathe. I hadn't spoken to Steve in over two years 
and the thought of coming face to face with him now filled me with dread. Hello? You there? Yeah, I said, finally finding my voice. I'll meet you at the car. That's why I told you. I'll be out in a bit. I practically sprang into my car and just kept praying to whatever gods might exist that Nick would be out soon. I went over and over in my mind what I would say or do if Steve showed up. Luckily, I never had to find out what I would have done or said because Nick appeared pretty quick and we left. That was the last time I heard of Steve. The incidents that are portrayed in the story are not everything that happened, of course. In my relationship with Steve, there were more, including more death threats, a physical altercation, more name calling, and insurance fraud that Steve decided to rope me into without my knowledge. Now, I know at this point you're wondering to yourself why I didn't just leave Steve in the dust a long time ago. Why didn't I just walk away from that friendship after the first sign of trouble? Well, there are a few reasons. First and foremost, as I said, Steve was a psychopath. Psychopaths are extremely versed in making people trust them, even if they treat them like trash. Not to mention that he gaslit me and made me feel as though a lot of the smaller incidents were my fault. That in turn led me in believing that the bigger problems were my fault. This is how psychological abusers keep control. Secondly, I'm a loyal friend to fall. I will see the best in people I care about, even if they stab me in the back and beat me down. This is a fault of mine that I'm working on. I only saw the terrible in Steve when he treated another friend I was loyal to like shit. Third, a part of me was terrified to walk away. There was a piece of me that was scared and sometimes still is, since I blocked him, that he would get it into his head to kill me because I rejected him. This again is part of the conditioning that abusers do. Regardless, I am much happier now and glad that I got the whole ordeal behind me. I would like to end this on a final note. If you are in a relationship of any kind where you are starting to see red flags, don't ignore them like I did. I explained away a lot of the red flags that Steve was waving proudly, and I regret it to this day. I was lucky and got out of the most toxic friendship I've ever known with only some psychological trauma and having my confidence shattered. But it could have ended so much fucking worse. If you need help getting out, seek it immediately. Leave everything behind you if you have to. Things can be replaced. You can't. Anyway, thanks for reading this, and Steve, please stay wherever you move to. I don't ever want to see or hear from you again. In 2016, my cousin Anna met a man named Jonathan. They were extremely happy together, to the point that in 2018, they got engaged. Anna, however, cheated on Jonathan shortly after with a man named Link. This was poorly solved by the idea to have a polyamorous relationship with Link. As time went on, Link turned into a horrific housemate and boyfriend, so Anna and Jonathan decided that it was time to remove him. This proved extremely difficult. Anna started by asking him to leave, and it didn't work. He refused to go. The landlord also refused to evict him due to him doing nothing wrong. They decided he needed a reason to leave and I was tasked with removing him. I'm a complete pacifist, but I'm also six foot four and scared the fuck out of him. I told him to leave and after I had a short conversation with the landlord, who he had just called, he was forced to leave via an eviction notice. After he was kicked out, he revealed that he was only there for Anna. Who would have fucking guessed? And that he would revive the relationship. This was accomplished in a weird way. He was stalking her constantly, following her home from work, standing at her car when she went into the store, just being all around creepy. This was not only a bond to her though. He followed everyone else in the house. He would even keep tabs on me. I saw him watching me in the school parking lot and we decided things had to change. One night, I visited them and told them about that event. Anna decided enough was enough. She called Link and told him to fuck off and that she would call the cops if she saw him again. 
We all went to sleep and thought that that would be the end of it. Oh boy, we were wrong. It was exactly 7 in the morning. I was woken up to what sounded like thunder over and over again. The entire house was shaking. He was at the front door punching it, trying to get in. Because he was so crazy, I had carried a gun to their house the night before, just in case of this. I yelled, I'm ready to fucking kill you if you're ready to fucking die. He took this notice seriously. The cops were angry about me threatening him, but due to the circumstances, they let me go. I was there a month later and was having a good time with them, playing video games, beating Jonathan's ass at Mortal Kombat, as I do. And then I saw him looking at me through the window. I freaked the fuck out. It was like a spider crawling up your arm. He bolted the moment I saw him and I couldn't sleep that night. A few nights ago, I came over again and I woke up in the middle of the night. I wanted a glass of chocolate milk and an ibuprofen as my head hurt and I needed to sleep. I went to the kitchen and he was there. He had a big fucking knife in his right hand. I remember freezing and looking at him. His pupils were dilated and he really freaked me the fuck out. He said, it's not what it looks like. I'm just here to stab Jonathan in his face. I love her so much and everything was fine before she intervened. I ended up attacking him and got the knife away from him before he ran. When the police finally caught him, he informed us that they would hold him for a bit and give him a warning. Because technically, since he was fighting in a court, it was still his house and the eviction had not fully gone through. They told us that we needed a restraining order to keep him away. You might ask, why am I writing this? Well, the only way I could sleep is to write about my experiences. However, he will slip up again and get arrested or something. But as long as he's around, I'm going to have trouble sleeping. And I'm scared for everyone I care about's life. When I was 13, I had not long broken up with this girl who supposedly had a psycho family. One of this girl's family was a very close friend who was supposedly obsessed with her. I was invited out with my friends after school one day and this boy latched on. Everyone told me to come out and that he wanted to make amends and that he understood why I did what I did. Being the pushover I am, I went out and hung out in the parks and smoked and drank. As it started to get dark, I decided to go home. I felt uneasy being around him and he started acting all weird talking about fights he had been in. He was bragging about bashing some guy's face in with his fist in school. Because of this, I left. I didn't feel safe whatsoever. The next day, my best friend and all the other kids that were out that night came to school and told me it got worse after I left. Apparently, after they had drank some more, he started waving this huge kitchen knife around and telling everyone that he was going to stab me in the stomach for breaking that girl's heart. My dad made us move since he knew where I lived. I continued getting death threats on social media though. Until about a year or two later when it was in the paper and was spread all around town. He had broken to someone's house and stabbed a man to death and then slit his wrist in the man's bathtub. They found high amounts of cocaine and cannabis in the system along with a lot of alcohol. The elderly neighbor phoned the police when they heard some commotion and when they hadn't seen the man leave for work. They found the attacker barely conscious and he's now in a psych ward. Again, this was supposedly over a girl. I think I dodged a bullet there. My father had been dating this girl for a while and things were going great. She met us a few times and got along together with my sister and I. Eventually, my father asked her to move in with us. She drove seven hours to move in and brought her two cats. Things were great for the first two months until she couldn't find a job. They had agreed that she was to apply for jobs and have one secured for interview before she moved in. She moved in July 2nd, and she didn't have a job until late January. I, being fresh out of high school, with no job experience, was able to get a job before her. This caused my father to have to cover her car payments and insurance, 
and it set us back financially, but we were okay. Then October came with the discovery of a full year's worth of text messages between her and a friend of hers named Jared, all taking place after my father and her were dating and while she was still living in her hometown. The text messages were laced with him coming over to give her nighttime lovin's and inappropriate pictures. My father confronted her about it and she denied it, saying we just didn't understand her friendship. My father lets it go and they haven't messaged each other in weeks. Small arguments pop up and she starts sneaking money out of my dad's wallet at night to go buy cigarettes. This may only sound like small stuff, but it was a nightly occurrence. This set us back financially as well. The arguments mainly consisted of her lying about something and not admitting to it, or doing something stupid and not apologizing. Things got worse when Christmas came. My father expressed that he didn't love her anymore, he didn't have feelings towards her, and that she needed to work to fix the relationship if she wanted it to continue. This meant really trying to get a job and not lying about stupid shit. She agreed that she would. I advised him against giving her that option. I was tired of her shit and wanted her out. She started lying more and more and causing more problems. We believe she started taking some sort of drugs as she would come back from a drive all shaky and spazzing out, spouting nonsense. She came after myself and a friend of mine during one of their arguments, to which my father responded, Pack your shit and get the fuck out. How dare you go after my kids, you bitch. Telling her to get out and leave was a regular occurrence in their fights, but she never took the hint. She was abusive emotionally to everyone in the household, especially my father. Reducing my father to tears when he found out that she had been receiving a thousand dollars a month from her mother which would have had us staying up to date on her rent payments. We have no idea what she did with the money. No matter the situation, she would always try to twist it so that she would be the victim. Nothing is ever her fault, and it's always a misunderstanding. Then she started smoking in the garage. The door from the garage into the house is right across from my bedroom door, which is always open because our cats like sleeping on my bed with me. I have asthma. I woke up coughing and smelling cigarettes multiple times in one night because of her. She drove recklessly with my little sister and I in the car before, and I told my dad what happened. When he confronted her, she said I was over-exaggerating, that driving in the dark freaks her out, that my sister and I were stressing her out. A minor thing, but she endangered my sister and my cats. We have two strictly indoor cats, and her two were outdoor cats until they moved here. Her cats taught my cats how to sneak out of the house when the front door is unlatched. She leaves the front door open constantly when she comes back from smoking and lets the cats out. We live right across the street from a huge lot of desert and we have coyotes here every night. After she finally got a job, she didn't want to contribute to her fair share of the bills. My father asked her for half her paychecks every two weeks. She claimed it should only be 25% because there were four people in the house. My sister and I were only there on the weekends as we go to school outside of town, about an hour away, and stay with other family during that time. She apparently wasn't paying her car payments after she got this job as she got a repossession notice which she hid from my father. Finally, after financially wrecking us, abusing my father emotionally and financially, endangering myself and my sister, doing drugs, taking money, stealing things from my room, endangering my cats, and many other things, my dad finally gave her two weeks to move out. She moved out yesterday, and all I have to say to her is, let's not meet again, because I will not be nice to you like I had to be before. Lots of hate, the daughter of the man you broke. I would like to make something abundantly clear in the beginning of this. I was very naive in my youth, very naive. While my ex was emotionally, sexually, and mentally abusive, he was smart enough to never lay a hand on me physically. He used gaslighting, manipulation, and carefully hidden sadism to control me for eight years. I forgave him for every slight against me, every instance of cruelty, 
every mental assault and every sexual attack. I forgave him because I thought he loved me and that I was his property because we had been together for so long and I wore his promise ring. In my mind, I was dealing with actions that would eventually go away with age. I was 17 when I finally got the courage to leave him, and since then, he has left messages on Facebook, my phone, my email, called me from texting apps. It was always the same message he leaves. I'm still here. Every month like clockwork. Same time, same day, same message. He has done this for six years, and I could do nothing about it. He wasn't breaking any laws, so I couldn't really report him, and nobody cared about it anyway. I blocked each account and continued on with my life, but two months ago, the messages stopped completely, and I know why. I got engaged to another man on the same day he messaged me for the last time, and posted about it on Facebook, and magically, the messages stopped. He stopped because I was going to marry someone else, and in his mind, I am no longer his property. This is the only thing that makes sense to me, that he believes I belong with a new man and not him, but I have a feeling I have not seen the last of him. So to my ex-boyfriend of 8 years, let's not meet again. Reading through some of the stories here reminded me of a fun one I heard with one of my ex-girlfriends. I don't really remember exactly how it came up, but I think it had something to do with her grabbing some stuff from under the bed one night. Basically, she wouldn't do it and was terrified of it. I never understood why until she told me. Her cousin, who she adored, came home one night to find the house unlocked. They were really confused and frightened about why, so they checked the house, but they couldn't find anything missing. They just assumed they had left the place unlocked. The next night, my ex's cousin was laying on her bed, doing whatever young girls do, when her cat would just not shut up. It was laying on the floor of her room, hissing. Despite her appeals, the cat kept going, being very aggressive towards the underside of the bed she was lying on. She decided to see what the fuss was about. She got down on her hands and knees and looked. There was a guy laying there, on his side, staring right into her eyes, holding up a mean-looking knife. The girl obviously screamed like crazy and bolted out of her room, taking her cat with her. Her parents came running. She hysterically told them that there was a man under her fucking bed with a knife. Her dad grabbed her door and threw it shut, locking the guy in there while the police were called. As much as he tried to hold this guy inside the room, the guy ended up overpowering him and getting the door open and running as fast as he could out of the house. Thankfully, no one was hurt but the guy was never found. Thankfully, my bed is very low and couldn't fit anyone under it. 